members, Darawa Nuna Darawa Nanawal, Yangu Narawari, Duni Manyan, Nanawal Weri Darawa Weri, Naginda Dindi Darawa Nanawabun, Injimara Lijinyin. Members, the words I've just spoken are in the language of the traditional custodians and translate to, this is Nanawal country. Today we are gathering on Nanawal country. We always pay respects to elders, female and male in Nanawal country. I ask that we now stand in silence and pray or reflect on our responsibilities to the people of the Australian Capital Territory. Thank you, members. Members, before we move to ministerial statements, I would just like to acknowledge in the gallery, we are joined, and you are most welcome to be here, Ainsley Primary School, years five and six students. So welcome, Ainsley Primary. With that, Mr Rattenbury, I'll give you the call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. By way of ministerial statement, I am pleased to inform the Assembly and community on the work done under the ACT Healthy Waterways Program, as I know this is an issue of great interest to all parties in the Assembly. Uh, for years now, okay. blue-green algal blooms have affected okay. our urban yep. lakes. Lake Tuggeranong is regularly closed in summer due to outbreaks of blue-green algae, and last summer was one of the worst for blue-green algae in Lake Burley Griffin in years. Our other urban ponds are not immune from this either. Blue-green algal blooms are a symptom of urban water pollution, which means that there are likely to be other, less apparent pollutants in our waterways as well. Our urban lakes and ponds were designed to trap pollution bound for the Murrumbidgee River and downstream communities, and they are doing this job extremely well. However, today's community expectations are broader than just this purpose. The community also values our lakes and ponds for recreation, amenity, and for the commercial values they provide. They can be equally great places to hold a picnic or a triathlon. Residents and businesses alike are attracted to lakeshore views. Think of Kingston Foreshore. But these values are diminished every time there is an algal bloom. The ACT government has just wrapped up a $94 million co-investment with the Australian government to improve water quality in the region, the ACT Healthy Waterways Project. 19 water quality assets, rain gardens, wetlands, ponds and channel restorations were constructed. They were designed as green infrastructure. Over 460,000 water plant seedlings were planted in 17 of the water quality assets, and these grew to cover a combined treatment area of almost nine hectares. In addition, the riparian zone of the Molonglo River upstream of Lake Billy Griffin was restored to arrest channel erosion. The area around these projects was landscaped and over 160,000 herbs, shrubs and trees were planted from a plant list of local native species. Together, these 20 investments are now reducing the yearly load of pollutants in our waterways by an estimated average of 1,900 tonnes. Around 20% of the pollution that was destined for Lake Tuggeranong is now being intercepted by the seven water quality assets built there. Feedback from residents around the water quality assets is very positive, with many locals appreciating the amenity and opportunities for exercise these afford. Bird watchers have enjoyed visits to the assets and drawn attention to some rare migratory visitors to the wetlands. The estimated benefits of these water quality assets are based on water quality models. Healthy Waterways monitored water quality across Canberra and the performance of several existing assets to improve the accuracy of the models. Research was conducted by the University of Canberra to understand the links between pollution in stormwater and Lake Tuggeranong sediments and the occurrence of algal blooms in the lake. What we learned from this work is that more water quality improvements are needed. Stormwater coming from Canberra suburbs is more polluted than is desirable. Research by the University of Canberra suggests that it is possible to suppress an algal bloom in the lakes via the use of phoslock, which is a clay product developed by the CSIRO, which binds phosphorus in water with sediments and reduces unwanted algal growth. Unfortunately, it was also determined that four to five times the amount of phosphorus required to sustain a bloom 
was still entering the lake from its catchment, and this would very quickly negate the benefits of any such suppressant. Until we can manage this, there is no point in spending resources locking up the phosphorus in the lake sediments, as the algae will amply be fed by phosphorus pollution entering from the catchment. The work also shows that it will be a major challenge for water quality assets to filter out all of this pollution before it reaches our urban lakes, where it can cause problems like blue-green algal blooms. So water quality assets are an essential tool to improve water quality, but there are challenges to relying on these alone to solve the problem. To stop these algal blooms, we also need to reduce catchment pollution at its source. Every lake and pond is different. But these findings are relevant outside of the Tuggeranong catchment, which is the catchment most intensively studied. We know, for example, that Lake Burley Griffin is on the cusp of either good or poor water quality. Last summer, it tipped towards poor water quality after improvements made over the last decade. We know we need to do more to prevent pollution from entering the lake in wet years like last summer. We need to reduce inputs of pollution from suburbs that drain into Lake Burley Griffin and be careful that any future developments in the catchment do not tip the lake towards more regular episodes of poor water quality and blue-green algae blooms. What steps can we take to further improve water quality? The ACT government continues to invest in innovative ways to manage water quality problems. The ACT's first large-scale floating wetland has just been deployed in the Village Creek Bay of Lake Togranong. The aim of this wetland together with modifications to the gross pollutant trap just upstream, is to discourage blue-green algal growth in the bay, where it might spread into the broader lake. This wetland is undergoing a two-year trial, after which it will either be left in place or relocated to a stormwater pond. I had the privilege of inspecting this great industry-supported innovation when I launched the floating wetland in early March this year. This autumn, the ACT, NRM, NRM and Healthy Waterways joined forces to trial a new H2OK public education program in five suburbs across Canberra that focused on preventing autumn leaves from entering drains. Nutrients rapidly leach out of leaves on the ground, so leaves that accumulate in roadside drains contribute to the nutrient pollution in stormwater. The H2OK program encouraged householders to keep drains adjacent to their blocks clear of leaves. The results of this trial are now being evaluated by Griffith University. The Environment Planning and Sustainable Development Directorate has begun planning for a new program of work, Stage 2 of Healthy Waterways. In Stage 1, the focus of infrastructure was on water quality assets that filter pollutants from stormwater. But as we have just heard, water research and monitoring suggest that this approach is not going to solve the problem alone. Therefore, in Stage 2, the Healthy Waterways team is exploring new ways to prevent stormwater pollution from occurring in the first place. Pollution is generated in urban areas because runoff is cut off from catchment soils and vegetation, which act to cleanse it before it makes its way into waterways. So the team is investigating infrastructure to make use of green corridors and spaces within our catchments to cleanse stormwater. They are also looking into ways to store and slowly release stormwater so that it does not overload the water quality assets in the system. Plans are being drawn up in parts of the Tuggeranong catchment and in selected locations across Canberra, including the Yerribee Pond catchment. It is anticipated that Stage 2 of Healthy Waterways will rely on much more than just infrastructure to improve water quality. An extensive public education campaign is planned that will focus on what households can do to prevent leaves and grass from entering drains, building on lessons from the trial this past autumn. EPSDD will also work with Transport Canberra and City Services Directorate to understand life cycle costs of assets and how to better manage green spaces and continue its work with the Suburban Land Agency to reduce the amount of pollution escaping from new suburbs under development. Plans for Stage 2 research and water monitoring are focused on narrowing down the sources and quantum of pollution so that infrastructure can be cited where it is the most cost effective. Water quality models will be upgraded to be more accurate and to take into account the measured performance of recently constructed water quality assets. This will allow for comprehensive catchment plans to be developed for urban lakes and ponds, as well as some rural catchments. The plans will detail various options, actions 
assets and their locations available to government to manage Canberra's water pollution problems and their associated costs and benefits. Therefore, the government is working to build on the achievements of stage one of healthy waterways, both for the benefit of the environment and the wellbeing of Canberra's residents and businesses that make use of waterways. Because, as the recent and comprehensive Das Gupta review of the economics of biodiversity emphasises, environmental health is not an alternative to economic health, but a contributor to it. The Das Gupta review is an independent global review on the economics of biodiversity, led by Professor Sipartha Das Gupta, who is the Frank Ramsey Professor Emeritus of Economics at the University of Cambridge. The review was commissioned in 2019 by the British Treasury and has been supported by an advisory panel drawn from public policy, science, economics, finance and business interests. Healthy catchments produce clean water that not only benefits aquatic flora and fauna, but all those who rely on our lakes and ponds, including businesses and the community. This information highlights the strong correlation the Healthy Waterways Initiative has with the wellbeing domains, namely environment and climate, social connection and living standards, respectively. The cost-benefit analysis of the original Healthy Waterways Initiative shows the program has present value benefits of $127 million and present value costs of $76 million. Sensitivity analyses indicate that the net present value ranges from $24 million to $126 million, and the benefit cost ratio ranges from 1.3 to 2.6. These results indicate that the program was economically viable, as the benefits of the program outweigh the costs. Now, Madam Speaker, can I commend to the Assembly the achievements of the Healthy Waterways Initiative and congratulate the small, dedicated team at EPSDD who delivered this work. I present a copy of the statement and move that the Assembly take note of the paper. The question is that that motion be agreed. Ms Cassidy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm pleased to respond to the Minister's statement. Do I have leave? Yes, please Thank go you. ahead. It's uh, important to ensuring that our Canberra waterways are healthy, which we know it currently is, is not the case in some areas. We can do better and we must. And I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge the hard work and effort of the team leading this important work at the Environment, Planning and Sustainable Development Directorate. Madam Speaker, the Canberra Liberals believe nature must be respected and protected, and that is why we support efforts to improve our waterways to achieve better lakes and ponds. This matters to Canberrans because we like to be outdoors, we enjoy being in nature, and so much of our leisure time is spent on or near water. Madam Speaker, it is pleasing to learn that the Healthy Waterways Project, the construction of the 19 rain gardens, wetlands, ponds and channel restorations, plus work to arrest channel erosion along the Molonglo River, are reducing the yearly load of pollutants in our waterways by about 1,900 tonnes. But as the research shows, we need to do more. The stormwater coming from our suburbs is too polluted, and the focus must be to reduce catchment pollution at its source. The Canberra Liberals support initiatives to manage our water quality problems, including the public education program in five suburbs, to prevent the autumn leaves from entering our drains. Madam Speaker, Canberrans are passionate about improving their environment and want to do the right thing, but people need to know in simple language what the right thing is. The Canberra Liberals believe education is important in terms of helping Canberrans understand why our waterways are not healthy and what we can all do to help improve them. That is why I'm pleased to hear the Minister stating that an extensive public education campaign is planned for stage two of the Healthy Waterways project to focus on what households can do to prevent leaves and grass from entering the drains. While stage one of the scheme has focused on filtering pollutants from stormwater, the Canberra Liberals strongly support the shift in focus in stage two to preventing the stormwater pollution from happening in the first place. On that note, Madam Speaker, I would like to ask the Minister to organise a briefing for me with the Healthy Waterways team so I can get a good understanding of the work that they have planned for stage two. I'm particularly keen to learn about plans to store and slowly release stormwater in parts of the Tuggeranong catchment and the Yarrabee Pond catchment. Madam Speaker, the Canberra community highly values our lakes and ponds, and hence the need for concerted action to take problems plaguing our enjoyment of them. The question is the motion is agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. 
To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Staying with ministerial statements, calling Ms Fazerotti. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm pleased to update the Assembly on the measures taken as part of this government's plan for supporting the testing, assessment and rectification of potentially combustible cladding on privately owned buildings in the ACT. The government is committed to reducing the risk of potentially combustible cladding on residential apartment buildings in the ACT. The issue of potentially combustible cladding extends beyond the ACT into other states and across the world. I wish first to provide the Assembly with some background as to how this issue has evolved. As a result of fires involving combustible cladding in Melbourne and most notably London, the National Construction Code was amended between 2000 and the 2016 edition and the 2019 edition to provide absolute clarity that in type A or B construction, construction, apartments over three storeys are type A, the external walls and common walls, including facade covering, the framing and the insulation must be non-combustible. Previously, the NCC did not specifically mention these elements of the facade with regards to non-combustibility, which led to the general interpretation across Australia that the requirements for non-combustibility did not apply to the facade cladding. This change came into effect in the ACT in March 2018. Buildings in the ACT are certified through a private certification scheme to comply with the National Construction Code at the time that they are constructed. Newer editions of the NCC does not mandate retrospective modification to buildings certified under earlier editions of the Code. The decision to rectify potentially combustible cladding on existing buildings is being driven by emerging information about safety concerns and the rectification work that may be required varies from building to building, based on a range of risk factors such as the height of a building and the loca location of any combustible cladding. For this it is for this reason that the government is assisting apartment owners with testing and assessing their buildings. Each jurisdiction is tackling this issue in a way in which, it, which is relevant to its own unique circumstances. The ACT has learned from approaches of other jurisdictions in developing a scheme to support the replacement of potentially combustible cladding in high risk, privately owned residential buildings. We recognise that this may be a relatively new issue for many apartment owners to deal with. I've listened to the stakeholder advice provided by peak organisations, including the Owners Corporation Network, Stratus Communities Australia and the, the Master Builders Association, the Housing Industry Association, the Insurance Council of Australia, the Real Estate Institute of the ACT, the ACT Law Society and Legal Aid ACT. I thank these groups for their ongoing engagement of these issues. The government's private building cladding scheme has been designed specifically for our circumstances here in the ACT. I recognise that owners' corporations of apartment buildings face challenges in dealing with the issue of potentially combustible cladding. It requires cooperation and decisions to be made by affected owners. It can be a challenge to understand the technical aspects of building cladding materials and the risks that it may pose to a building. It, may, it can be a challenge to source appropriate professional advice and assistance to guide an owner's corporation through the process of cladding, testing, assessment and rectification. It can also be a challenge to understand what remedial work may be appropriate to undertake. There can also be financial challenges associated with undertaking this work. I'm pleased to advise that the government has designed the private cladding bu building's cladding scheme to provide three avenues of assistance for eligible private building owners in the ACT. The first is education and information on combustible cladding. Secondly, practical assistance in sourcing suitable professional service providers in the ACT and financial assistance by offering financial support for testing and assessment of the building cladding fire risk through a rebate scheme and, if necessary, undertaking rectification works through concessional loans. 
The government believes that this is an appropriate approach that supports the critical needs of private building owners while balancing the responsibilities of private building owners. There are three key eligibility criteria of the private building cladding scheme. Firstly, the building must be located in the ACT. Second, the scheme is open to owner corporations of class two or mixed use apartment buildings that are three storeys in rise or higher. And third, the owner's corporation must have a reasonable suspicion that the building does have cladding that may be combustible. In addition, private residential buildings that otherwise may be in a tight cluster and therefore pose a higher risk of fire spread may also be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. I'm pleased to announce that phase one of the scheme commenced on the 21st of July 2021 and covers testing and assessment of building claddings to determine whether it's combustible. In conjunction with other important information, such as the location and amount of cladding, and the presence of fire safety systems, such as sprinkler systems and fire doors, a risk assessment of the building is prepared for an owner's corporation. The owner's corporation can then understand the level of risk, if any, that is posed by cladding on their building, the interim steps that they can take to better manage fire safety in the building, and what rectification works, if, there are recommended, if they are any recommended, to reduce the fire risk to a low level. It's important to note that not all cladding is combustible, and not all combustible cladding poses an unacceptable level of risk. The government's private building's cladding scheme enables a building-specific assessment. The Professional Fire Risk Report can also be used by owners' corporations to hold informed discussions with their insurers around important issues affecting many property owners, that is, insurance covering, coverage and the cost of insurance. The government is pleased to be able to assist owners' corporations by offering a 50 per cent rebate on the costs of undertaking the testing and assessment of each building to a maximum rebate of $20,000, excluding GST. To assist owners' corporations in locating service providers who have qualifications, experience and insurances to undertake specialised cladding rectification assessment work in the ACT, Major Projects Canberra is maintaining a register of potential suppliers on its website. Owners' corporations can find professionals such as fire engineers, architects, facade engineers and project managers on the register, but are also able to select their own providers outside of those on the register as long as they are qualified, experienced and insured for cladding rectification work in the ACT. I'm confident that many owners' corporations will find this a timely incentive to undertake phase one of their cladding rectification process so that they may understand the nature of any fire risk that their building may have and what may be required to address any unacceptable risk. Phase two of the scheme covers actual rectification works being undertaken on buildings. The government is committed to offering concessional loans to owners' corporations to assist financially with undertaking the required works. The details of the concessional loans arrangements will be finalised once testing and assessment results from phase one are known. I'll make further announcements in this respect in due course. Owners' corporations can participate in the private building cladding scheme knowing that they can access the 50 per cent rebate up to a $20,000 threshold to cover testing and assessment of their building and that a concessional loan will be available if cladding replacement is, is subsequently required. I'm pleased to I'd be able to offer this support to make our community safer, and I strongly encourage eligible owner corporations to join the private building cladding scheme and begin the process of addressing potentially combustible cladding on their building. I note I present a copy of the statement and move that the Assembly take note of the paper. The question is that that motion be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. And I'll call the clerk. Executive business, notice number one. Mr Steele. 
I present a, the Road Transport Legislation Amendment Bill 2021 together with its explanatory statement, including its Human Rights Act, Act compa compatibility statement. Clark. A bill for an act to amend legislation about road transport and for other purposes. Mr Steele. I move that this bill be agreed to in principle. The question is the bill is agreed to in principle. Mr Steele. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm pleased to introduce the Road Transport Legislation Amendment Bill 2021 to the Assembly today. Nearly all of us interact with the road network every day, whether as a driver, a cyclist or as a pedestrian. While most of us take great care in doing so, we must recognise that roads can be dangerous places. One of the great tragedies of road safety is that the consequences of negligent or culpable driving are often felt by people who are not at fault. Road safety is a shared responsibility and it's up to all of us to ensure that Canberrans can get safely home to their families at night. That's why the ACT government is introducing legislation today that will increase the protection for all road users. We are establishing a new offence for negligent driving that injures another road user, as well as increasing the penalties for negligent and culpable driving in a range of other cases. We want everyone to be safe on Canberra's roads, and this bill will help to close a current gap in the protections that are available. Unsafe behaviours on our road network threaten the lives and well-being of all members of our community. Unsafe driving can take many forms, including negligent, culpable, furious, reckless and dangerous driving. As transport options evolve, and there is a wider range of users on our roads, it is vital that the Territory's laws reflect community expectations while supporting effective enforcement and compliance activities. The bill I am introducing today enhances the existing penalty framework by strengthening the hierarchy of offences for negligent driving so that these better address the spectrum of harm that Canberrans can experience on our roads. This is consistent with the ACT Road Safety Strategy 2020 to 2025 and the ACT Road Safety Action Plan 2020 to 2023. The bill achieves this by introducing a new offence to address negligent driving that occasions actual bodily harm, increasing the infringement notice penalty for negligent driving that does not occasion death, grievous bodily harm or actual bodily harm, Increasing the minimum automatic licence disqualification periods for culpable driving and negligent driving occasioning death and grievous bodily harm, and introducing two new strict liability offences to address unsafe use of other vehicles, including personal mobility devices such as e-scooters. Madam Speaker, it is an offence to drive a motor vehicle on a road or road-related area in a negligent manner. Current penalties are based on negligent conduct occasioning death, grievous bodily harm, or in any other case. Negligent driving that causes someone harm, but not to the standard of grievous bodily harm, is not adequately addressed. This can mean drivers can receive a relatively minor penalty for injuring another road user if that injury is not to the level of grievous bodily harm. We think that this gap needs to be closed, and that is what this bill will achieve. The bill establishes a new offence in the Road Transport Safety and Traffic Management Act 1999 of negligent driving that occasions actual bodily harm. The offence will have a maximum penalty of 50 penalty units or six months imprisonment or both. It creates a mid-tier offence for negligent driving that causes harm to other road users. The nature of the harm that will be covered by the new offence is described by the common law. That is, harm that need not be permanent but must be more than merely transient or trifling, as per the Crown and Donovan. This may include major bruising, black eyes and lacerations. More serious harms, such as permanent or serious disfigurement and severe he head injuries, will continue to be covered by the existing negligent driving occasion occasioning grievous bodily harm offence. These are the types of harm that are most commonly experienced by vulnerable road users like cyclists and pedestrians. Because they do not have the protection of a vehicle, vulnerable road users make up a significant share of those who are injured on Canberra's roads. Initial analysis of 2020 crash statistics indicates that two fatalities and 190 injuries involve vulnerable road users. This represents 29% of fatalities and 31% of injuries on our roads in 2020. 
Nearly 25% of all casualties admitted to hospital following a road accident in 2020 were cyclists or pedestrians. We suspect that there are many more injuries that happen across Canberra each year and do not get reported or result in drivers being penalised. We want all road users to understand and take seriously their obligations to be safe on the road and behave in ways that minimise risk to others. That includes looking out for cyclists and pedestrians, observing appropriate passing distances, and slowing down in pedestrian areas, as well as always driving to the road and weather conditions. The new offence proposed in this bill will ensure that where road users cause harm to someone else because they do not take appropriate care, there are serious consequences with this. This will benefit vulnerable road users while also strengthening protections for any other Canberran who was injured on Canberra's roads. The new offence of negligent driving occasioning actual bodily harm will complement the existing negligent and dangerous driving offences in the Road Transport Safety and Traffic Management Act 1999. The offence has been developed following consultation with a range of stakeholders who have indicated that we can make our roads safer for cyclists and pedestrians, along with all other road users, by introducing this new tier of harm into the negligent and dangerous driving framework. The new offence will come with a maximum penalty of 50 penalty units, representing a fine of $8,000, six months of imprisonment or both. These are serious penalties which reflect the serious harm that negligent driving can cause. The specific penalty applying in each case will be determined by the courts in light of the individual circumstances of each road incident that causes harm to another road user. The new offence will not attract an automatic driver licence disqualification period. However, a court will have the option to apply its existing discretion to disqualify a person found guilty or convicted of an offence against the road transport legislation from holding or obtaining a driver licence. New offence builds on the existing tiered offence structure for negligent driving, which makes enforcement options clear and reflects serious consequences that can arise from negligent driving. In doing so, it draws on the established case law on negligent driving and the fault element of negligence. However, the introduction of a negligent driving offence occasioning actually actual bodily harm changes the operation of the existing offence hierarchy and narrows the scope of the offence of negligent driving in any other case. The infringement notice offence negligent driving in any other case will only apply where the negligent driving does not occasion death, grievous bodily harm or actual bodily harm. The bill also increases the infringement notice offence for negligent driving in any other case from $398 to $598. This increase will encourage Canberrans to drive more safely whenever they are on the road by appropriately penalising drivers who do not maintain the standard of care that is, that is expected of them. Madam Speaker, to ensure that road transport penalties are commensurate with the road safety risk associated with the unsafe behaviour they are addressing, the bill also increases existing minimum automatic licence disqualification periods for a range of serious driving offences. The minimum automatic disqualification periods proposed to be increased are culpable driving causing death and grievous bodily harm. This will increase for first offenders from six months to 12 months. Negligent driving occasioning death. This will increase for first offenders from three months to nine months and from 12 months to 18 months for repeat offenders. And negligent driving occasioning grievous bodily harm. This will increase for first offenders from three months to six months. The minimum automatic disqualification periods for a repeat offender for culpable driving occasioning death or grievous bodily harm will remain at 24 months. And the minimum automatic disqualification period for a repeat offender for negligent driving occasioning grievous bodily harm will also remain at 12 months. These additional amendments create a clear hierarchy of penalties that are proportionate to the consequences of negligent driving in different cases. I would be remiss at this point if I didn't make mention of the work that Joe Clay, MLA, has been undertaking in this place in recent months. As members will be aware, Ms Clay introduced a bill of her own during the June sittings that also seeks to increase protections for vulnerable road users for, from negligent driving. Ms Clay's bill seeks to introduce a significant infringement notice offence for negligent driving that harms a vulnerable road user. 
This would be in addition to and operate alongside of the existing negligent driving penalties framework if passed. Ms Clay and I have had a number of very dis constructive discussions about our respective bills. We agree that there is a gap which needs to be closed in the existing penalties framework of negligent driving occasioning harm that does not amount to grievous bodily harm. The bill I'm introducing today would strengthen protection for all road users, not just pedestrians and cyclists. This approach focuses on the problematic offending behaviour, not the class of persons that are harmed. We fundamentally believe that all Canberrans should enjoy the same level of protections on our roads. My bill as drafted would likely apply most commonly in cases of negligent driving involving cyclists or pedestrians, but it would not exclusively apply to them. This bill also goes further in limiting the application of penalties to court ordered penalties where there is actual bodily harm, recognising that an infringement notice may be inconsistent with the seriousness of the offence. This approach recognises that more serious offences with proof of fault elements should be dealt with by the courts, especially where there is a high degree of subject, subjective judgement in determining whether the elements of the offence are made out or where the evidence of the commission of offence is not readily apparent without further inquiry. While there are some key differences between these bills, I certainly applaud the intent of Ms Clay's bill. We will continue to work together to see if there are ways that we can align the two to deliver the end outcome we all care about, better protecting Canber Canberrans on our roads, including cyclists and pedestrians. Madam Speaker, it's not just drivers who must be mindful of their impact on other users of our road network. Ensuring our roads and footpaths are safe requires everyone who uses them to take proper care. Within the ACT and throughout Australia, we are seeing an increase in the use of personal mobility devices such as e-scooters as people embrace active travel. Active travel has a number of great health, wellbeing and environmental impacts, but these devices can still cause harm if used irresponsibly. Since the introduction of the shared e-scooter scheme last year, these have proven to be very popular and there is a growing number of people choosing to use their own private e-scooters as well as the shared scheme. So it's important that we make clear in our law that users of these devices must do so responsibly for their own safety and the safety of others. This bill would introduce a requirement for users of personal mobility devices such as e-scooters, e-skateboarders, skateboards and Segway-like devices to remain in proper control at all times. This mirrors the existing provisions requiring a cyclist to have proper control of their bicycle and a driver to have proper control of their motor vehicle. The use of personal mobility devices is already regulated in the ACT through requirements to wear helmets and maximum speeds. The requirement for personal mobility device users to maintain proper control recognises that the, the risk of unsafe behaviours using this transport mode can have on others. Serious injuries can result to the rider and other road users where they are not used responsibly. The bill also gives police officers new powers to address the unsafe use of various transport modes such as personal mobility devices and bicycles by a person under the influence of alcohol or drugs. E-scooters and bikes should not be seen as an alternative for people who are intoxicated or under the influence of drugs. But this behaviour presents a significant safety risk. These new powers support an early intervention and education process in which a police officer can direct a person not to get on or to get off one of these devices. If they ignore that direction, they, then they could be subject to enforcement action. This will mirror similar powers granted to police officers under Section 66C of the Road Transport Public Passenger Services Regulation 2002, which concerns directions to get off or not to get on buses, light rail vehicles and light rail stops. Madam Speaker, this bill closely aligns with the strategic objectives and commitments in the ACT Road Safety Strategy 2020 to 2025 and our Road Safety Action Plan. 2020 to 2023. It will continue to deliver on the ACT Government's commitment to Vision Zero, achieving zero road fatalities and serious injuries. The amendment proposed in this bill builds on our existing regulatory frameworks to help steer our community towards a culture of safe and responsible driving. We want to see more people choosing active travel 
and alternatives to the car in the future because this will be essential for cutting Canberra's transport emissions and reducing congestion as our city grows. But supporting Canberrans to make this choice means ensuring that everyone feels safe on our roads, no matter how they are moving around. This bill will help to achieve this by encouraging drivers to take more care or they may face strong penalties if they don't. Members will note that this is not the first piece of legislation I've introduced this year to improve road safety, and it also won't be the last. Canberra, Canberra's road environment is constantly evolving, and our laws equally need to continue to adapt to ensure that they provide the best coverage and protections possible. I value the constructive conversations that we've been able to have in this place between all parties about road safety to date. I know everyone here shares a strong commitment to reducing deaths and serious, serious injuries on Canberra's roads, and I look forward to continuing that spirit of collaboration as we move forward with the debate on this bill and future tranches of road safety legislation. I commend the bill to the Assembly. Mr Parton? Be adjourned. The question is the debate be adjourned. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question now is the resumption of debate be made on order of the day for the next sitting. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Thank you, members. Before I call the clerk for assembly business, members, we have a second group of students in the gallery from Ainsley Primary. We gave your earlier group a warm welcome. We will give you, boys and girls, a warm welcome to the assembly as well. Well done for being here. I'll call the clerk. Assembly business, notice number one. Ms Clay. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move the motion standing in my name on the notice paper relating to the reporting date for the inquiry by the Standing Committee on Planning, Transport and City Services into the Road Transport Safety and Traffic Management Amendment Bill 2021. Question is the motion be agreed? Ms Clay. Uh, Madam Speaker, this is a very straightforward motion. We are seeking a one-month extension, which will give our committee time to consider the significant number of submissions that we've received and will allow us to hold hearings if we choose to do so. The question is that that motion for an extension be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Members, I present report number six of the Standing Committee on Administration and Procedure entitled The Report on the Conduct of Mr Parton, MLA, together with a copy of extracts of the relevant minutes of proceedings. Mr Braddock. I move that the report be, oh, sorry, I seek leave to move that the report be adopted. Is leave granted, Mr Braddock? I move that the report be adopted. Question is the report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Mr. Parton. Um, Madam Speaker, do I need to seek leave to, to No, you've, the report indicates that yes. you will stand. Okay. Yes. Excellent. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As, as it is the wish of um, the Speaker and the Admin and Procedure Committee that I apologise here in the chamber, that's what I'm doing right now. I apologise for being found to have breached the standards and, as a consequence, the code of conduct. Um, it is an unconditional apology from me. I would note that the Commissioner has indicated that there was no intent on my behalf in regards to those breaches, and I'm certainly supportive of that opinion. The commi Commissioner indicated that my breach was based on a lack of understanding of the broadcast guidelines. Now, I do see that the report table today notes that the Speaker has written to another, a number of other non-liberal MLAs regarding breaches of the broadcasting guidelines and requested that offending social media posts be removed. I would also note that those instances involving non-liberal MLAs did not lead to any referral to the Standards Commissioner. At various points during this process, the Commissioner has also alluded to the fact that there may well be grounds to refer some other MLAs on this issue. And Madam Speaker, I would say at this stage, we won't be referring those other MLAs because we think that they have much more important things to spend their time on, but we certainly reserve the right to refer them at a later date. I would also note that the Commissioner effectively dismissed both of the grounds of Mazur's original complaint and that his ruling is based around the specific broadcast guideline, 
which state that the only purpose for MLAs to reproduce assembly on demand footage is as a fair and accurate representation of proceedings. The Commissioner has not asserted that my video is indeed inaccurate in any way as a, repre as a representation of proceedings, but rather that there was an additional motive or intent to publish such video other than to provide a fair and accurate representation of proceedings. So apologies from me. I genuinely welcome this report because I think it marks potentially a turning point regarding, well certainly as, as we have a review coming based on this report of our broadcasting guidelines and although it's certainly not for me in any way to preempt any of the findings of that review, I live in the hope that at the end of it we as MLAs will be able to share with more Canberrans actual footage of what we do because I think that would be beneficial. I believe that a review of those broadcast guidelines is, is well overdue, noting that A, the foundations of the guidelines were constructed at a much earlier point in our fast-moving social media journey as a community, and B, if the MLA who worked 33 years in mainstream media and ran a social media business is ruled to have misunderstood the guidelines, then I wish the best of luck to everyone else. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr Hanson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I present report two of the Committee on Justice and Community Safety entitled Inquiry into the 2020 ACT Election and Electoral Act, together with a copy of the extract of the relevant uh, minutes of proceedings. And I move that the report be noted. Question is that the report be noted. Ms. Clay, uh, Mr Hanson. She's very keen. She is, Adam but she'll Speaker. get the call next. Uh, and I look forward to hearing what she's got to say. But this is the second report of the Standing Committee on Justice and Community Safety for the 10th Assembly. Uh, the Assembly referred the inquiry on the 2nd of December 2020. The Committee received 29 submissions and held two public hearings. Six questions were taken on notice. The Committee made a number of recommendations, which reflects the depth of engagement in the inquiry and the rich and detailed suggestions for improvement put forward by participants. The 52 recommendations address topics including early voting, electronic voting, campaigning rules, roadside signs, donations and reporting, voter participation and lowering the voting age. On behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank the Electoral Commission in particular for their extraordinary efforts in conducting a free, fair and safe election in the dramatic and evolving circumstances of a pandemic. We also thank the people who took time to write submissions and appear at the hearings for their significant contribution to this inquiry. The committee looks forward to monitoring the important area of electoral law and policy throughout the term of the Assembly. I'd like to thank the members of the committee, uh, Dr Patterson and Ms Clay. Uh, when you've got three members from three different parties looking into electoral matters, uh, that is, you know, a recipe for acrimony and uh, a difficult inquiry, and it wasn't. Uh, I really appreciated the efforts of Dr. Patterson and uh, Ms. Clay. We certainly didn't agree on everything, uh, but I think by virtue of the fact that there are 52 recommendations, uh, there is a dissenting report from Ms. Clay that no doubt she'll speak to. Uh, but I think, in the main, it was uh, conducted in good spirit with the, I think, the very tripartisan view. If we want to make sure we've got the best electoral laws. Uh, in Australia. Uh, and I'd like to particularly thank again Secretary Brianna McGill. Uh, it was a very complex <coughs> and difficult area. Electoral law is a evolving space. There are lots of differing views and I think that the advice provided, the, the, uh, the support provided by Brianna McGill was again of the highest possible uh, quality and I thank her for uh, the work that she has done supporting the committee, and I commend the report to the Assembly. Question is the report be noted. Ms Clay. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to note my appreciation for the cooperative and constructive work of the Justice and Community Safety Committee into the 2020 election, and there are some really valuable recommendations in here about how we should conduct elections. For instance, the committee recommended that we abolish roadside banners, explore options to reinstate the $10,000 cap on political donations and explore options to ban donations from foreign sources and from gambling entities. But I've lodged a dissenting report because I think there are two areas that need further explora exploration where my committee colleagues disagreed. 
The first is about lowering the age of voting. The committee received three submissions in favour of lowering the voting age to 16 or 17 and three submissions against it. Those in favour of lowering the voting age noted that young people already prove themselves capable of making complex decisions with big consequences, like driving and working full time and paying tax. One submission also referred to climate change. It noted that no one under 40 years old has even lived in a year with global average temperatures below those of last century. This is a compelling argument given the political activism we see from School Strike for Climate and from the Youth Climate Justice Movement. It is particularly significant here in the ACT because of the Assembly's 2019 declaration that we are in a climate emergency. That recognition of the climate emergency should inform all our policy and decisions, all of the decisions made by this Assembly and by its committees. Those opposed to lowering the voting age referred to operational challenges in enforcement, education and resourcing. They also noted legislative barriers and claimed that it would not increase political participation. These are all really valid implementation issues and they would need to be worked through, but they're not good reasons to avoid considering the fundamental question. Should young people be allowed to vote? The right to vote is fundamentally tied to whether a person is capable of making significant and long-term decisions and if so, whether they should be empowered to do so. It is time for government to consider that fundamental question for 16 and 17 year olds in the ACT. That's why I dissented from that particular committee recommendation. I would like to see the government explore that question further. The committee also made recommendations that public electoral funding given to political parties should be linked to actual expenditure. But the committee made no recommendation about public administrative funding. I find this inconsistent. Administrative funding is allocated per MLA per year. During the 2016 to 2020 Assembly, ACT Labor and the Canberra Liberals each received over a million dollars in administrative funding, and the ACT Greens received around 172000 It's a significant amount of public money. Many of the bookkeeping systems that need to be set up for one MLA can be efficiently expanded to cover multiple MLAs. Most businesses and government organisations understand economies of scale. A system which covers more people becomes cheaper to operate per person. On this basis, there is surely room to consider reducing administrative funding either to an absolute cap, such as capping it to a maximum of five MLAs, or by linking it directly with administrative expenditure. So I recommend that if the government is considering linking public funding with expenditure, it should also cap administrative funding or link administrative funding with expenditure too. I think our inquiry missed these opportunities for further thoughtful reform, and so I've lodged a dissenting report. But I thank my colleagues for a useful and a thoughtful investigation. The question is the motion be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those of that opinion say no. The ayes have it. Thank you, members. Mr Hanson again. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And pursuant to Standing Order 246A, I wish to make a statement on behalf of the Standing Committee on Justice and Community Safety relating to statutory appointments in accordance with Continuing Resolution 5A. During the reporting period, 1 January 2021 to 30 June 2021, the Committee considered a total of 14 appointments and reappointments to the following bodies. The Gambling and Racing Commission Board, the official visitors for the Disability Service Act 1991, the Racing Appeals Tribunal, the Public Trustee and Guardian Investment Board, the ACT Civil and Administrative Tribunal, the Official Visitors for the Mental Health Act 2015, and the Professional Standard Council. I now table a schedule of the statutory appointments considered during this period. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. Thank you. Ms. Casterly. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Pursuant to Standing Order 246A, I wish to make a statement on behalf of the Standing Committee on Economy and Gender and Economic Equality relating to statutory appointments in accordance with the Continuing Resolution 5A. Continuing Resolution 5A was agreed by the Legislative Assembly on the 23rd of August 2012. The schedule is required to include the statutory appointments considered, and for each appointment, the date the request from the responsible minister for consultation was received and the date the committee's feedback was provided. 
For the reporting period, 1st of January 2021 to 30th of June 2021, the committee considered one statutory appointment. I therefore table a schedule of the statutory appointments for the period 1 January 2021 to 30 June 2021, as considered by the 10th Assembly's Standing Committee on Economy and Gender and Econ Economic Equality in accordance with continuing resolution 5A. Thank you, Ms. Castley. We'll move to executive business members and I'll call the clerk. Executive business, order the day number one, Work Health and Safety Amendment Bill 2021, resumption of debate on the question that this bill will be agreed to in principle. Mr. Kane. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm sure that for all members here, workplace health and safety is a very serious matter. Every worker should return home and unharmed at the end of the workday. Canberra Liberals will be supporting the Work Health and Safety Amendment Bill 2021, which will relocate the offence of industrial manslaughter from the Crimes Act to the Work Health and Safety Act, and provide more nuanced enforcement options to the regulator. The bill will also broaden the circumstances where industrial manslaughter charges may be brought. In practice, of course, it will need to be closely monitored to ensure the intent is being met. Obviously, we would expect to see improved workplace practices, Madam Speaker, given the strong deterrent of these measures. I would urge the government, however, to liaise closely with the Canberra business community to ensure an understanding of these changes and the efficient adoption of any amended regulatory burdens. This consultation is particularly important with respect to the small and medium-sized employers in the Territory. Such employers typically have fewer resources available to manage changes in governance. Of course, Madam Speaker, a small business advisory council, as proposed by Ms Cassley, would be able to advise on the repercussions of this change in legislation and it's disappointing that this government continues to refuse to establish such a body. It's pleasing to note, Madam Speaker, that stakeholders have been listed in the explanatory statement of this bill, something which I recommended to the Assembly on, the 20, on 20 April this year, when I spoke during debate on the Courts and Other Justice Legislation Amendment Bill 2021. The Canberra Liberals will be supporting this bill and I strongly urge the government to ensure that the changes operate as intended without having a disproportionate effect on Canberra's small employers. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The question is um, that the bill be agreed in principle. Mr Patterson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Everyone deserves to come home safe from work and no one deserves to pay with their life for the negligence, mistake or oversight of their workplace. That's why I believe creating an industrial manslaughter offence is so important. This will prevent future accidents, injuries and deaths. This bill will save lives by holding people to account. In 2018, Safe Work Australia received an independent expert report from Marie Boland on work health and safety regulation in Australia. The report recognised that workplace injuries and deaths ruin lives and shatter families. But we in this place, and those who work in dangerous industries like construction and transport, they don't need a report to tell us what we already know. All too often, workers, subcontractors, worksite visitors, bystanders are injured in workplace accidents, and tragically, this can and does result in their deaths. Sadly, our current legislation doesn't allow the conduct of everyone including corporations and senior officers, to be considered in the event of a worker's death. And it doesn't hold employers accountable for injuries and deaths to people who are not their direct employees. The 2018 report to Safe Work Australia called for an industrial manslaughter offence to be added to the national template law. However, frustratingly so, the federal government has not been keen on this recommendation. But just because the federal government refuses to do the right thing doesn't mean the ACT can't do the right thing. The ACT, as well as a few other jurisdictions, are determined to do the right thing. That's why it will create the offence of industrial manslaughter. 
This bill is a demonstration of this government's commitment to promoting safe and ethical work practices. The ACT government has continually expressed support for an industrial manslaughter offence that has wider application than the current ACT Crimes Act offence. This will accommodate complex modern work arrangements and provide a more effective deterrent to poor work safety standards that endanger lives. We know that in workplaces today, the use of subcontractors and other similar work arrangements are unfortunately becoming more and more common. This legislation will hold all parties accountable for the safety and practices on their work sites, not just the safety of their direct employees. The Work Health and Safety Amendment Bill before us today is reflective of and resp responsive to the ACT government's long-standing policy position and would expand the circumstances where industrial manslaughter charges may be laid. This feature of the bill is particularly important when considered in light of National Safe Work Australia data about work-related fatalities. The most recent Safe Work Australia annual report on work-related trauma injury fatalities show a significant number of bystanders were killed because of work activities, for example, being hit by a moving object from work sites. The data also shows that some of the bystanders killed by the action of a business or undertaking were vulnerable people, including children. The existing offence of industrial manslaughter within the Crimes Act may not be applicable in those circumstances because, put simply, it is limited to conduct by an employer that causes the death of their employee. Placing the offence within the Work Health and Safety Act allows it to be applied to the death of any person to whom the offending person or business owed a duty of care, such as a bystander or subcontractor. This is what our community expects of a Labor government. They expect that all workers on a site, not just those who are directly employed, will be protected by our legislation. They expect justice to be served when dodgy bosses cut corners and cost their workers their lives. This change is in keeping with the expectations of the ACT community and will better empower the safety regulator to use the offence as a deterrent to all forms of poor safety practice. Madam Speaker, I'm proud to speak in support of this bill, which will better protect our workers and our community from workplace injuries and death. Thank you, Mr Pedersen. Before I put the question, can I just uh, recognise in the gallery a number of union reps that support workers and particularly in relation to this bill? With that, I'll move that the bill be agreed to in principle. Mr Braddock. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I speak today in support of the Work Health and Safety Amendment Bill, which will introduce an offence of industrial manslaughter in the ACT's Work Health and Safety Act. Other speakers to have today emphasise the importance of holding companies responsible for negligent or reckless acts that cause a person's death. This is the strong expectation of the Canberra community, and the bill is responsive to those expectations. On reviewing the draft legislation, two key questions came to my mind. Firstly, was its application to the gig economy? This part of the economy is rapidly expanding, drawing in more and more vulnerable workers, being employed in precarious situations with accompanied increased workplace health and safety risks. It gives me comfort where a PCBU has a duty of care under this Act that it will apply. There still remains regul regulatory challenges Ensuring the gig economy is a safe and sustainable one, but this piece of legislation contributes towards achieving this goal. The second was whether this legislation would apply to psycho psychosocial hazards. Workplace bullying and harassment has no place in the modern workplace, but unfortunately it does happen and in rare but disturbing cases can become so severe so as to devastate lives and cause some to commit suicide. I, like many in the community, expect employers to provide a safe and inclusive workplace. And where they have failed in a demonstrated duty of care, they should be accountable under this law for their failing. I have received some feedback from employee organisations with questions about the implementation of this legislation, and therefore look to the government to work closely with those organisations during its implementation. Another important contribution that an industrial manslaughter offence will help deter dangerous workplace incidents and practices. Once embedded in the Act, 
Industrial manslaughter would become the fourth and most severe category of offence. This offence is outcome-based, reflecting the seriousness of work safety breaches that causes deaths in the workplace. WorkSafe ACT, the regulator for work health and safety, is primarily focused on encouraging and assisting industry to prevent work injuries from occurring. And it is in this respect that the deterrent effect of an industrial manslaughter offence is so valuable. Contemporary work regulators like WorkSafe ACT rely on layers of enforcement options and responses to ensure compliance. From voluntary compliance in the form of guidance, deterrence tools such as compliance notices, injunctions and infringement notice penalties, through to sanctions in the forms of prosecutions and sanctions and authorisations. The sanctions for industrial manslaughter also act as an effective deterrent to focus efforts on safety compliance and compliance oriented behaviour that mitigates the risk of prosecution and also of injury and death. Under our work health and safety laws, the strong penalties commensurate with the gravity of a workplace death provide a strong incentive to ensure a business or undertaking is meeting its WHS duties and obligations. Poor workplace safety practices continue to be prevalent with risk to the safety of workers and others at the worksite. Therefore, I am pleased to speak in support of this bill and the improvements it will make to the range of enforcement responses available to WorkSafe ACT. Thank you. Ms. Stephen Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Assistant Speaker. I hadn't originally been intending to speak on this bill, but I think it is really important um, as a continuation of the work that the ACT Labor government has done and reflecting back on some of the words that Rosemary Follett has used to talk about the first ACT Labor government and one of the proudest things that she achieved in that government was the introduction of workplace health and safety laws for the ACT. The ACT government was, of course, also the first government to introduce an industrial manslaughter offence in 2004. In speaking today, I want to acknowledge not only the union representatives that are in the uh, chamber in the gallery today, but also Kay Catanzariti, who has experienced firsthand the loss of a family member in a workplace industrial accident. And Kay's incredible um, energy and tenacity in fighting for better workplace safety laws, and particularly in industrial manslaughter, I think deserves to be recognised here in the chamber today. I've had the opportunity of discussing these issues with Kay on a number of occasions, including seeing her annually, often as minister, at the International Workers' Memorial Day uh, commemorations uh, that are hosted by the unions every year, and an incredibly moving ceremony that it is. Uh, so I just wanted to stand and acknowledge that contribution uh, and acknowledge the continuation of an ACT Labor government's work um, to strengthen workplace safety laws and moving the industrial manslaughter offence from the Crimes Act into the Work Health and Safety Act uh, is something that we should all be uh, really proud of. Uh, and it does come from not only our own work here in the ACT, but national work. Um, including a Senate inquiry that ACT government officials uh, and I gave evidence to um, and work in other jurisdictions as well who have learnt from us and then we continue uh, to learn from them. In introducing the bill, Minister Gentleman said that it was introduced in memory of those who never came home from work, who left empty chairs at dinner tables and a gaping hole in the hearts of their families, their colleagues and their mates. I join with Minister Gentleman in um, those thoughts for all of those families, all of those friends, all of those workmates who have lost loved ones in a workplace accident. I pay tribute to them and this bill is a tribute to them. Thank you. Barry. Uh, thank you, um, Mr Assistant Speaker. I too rise today to um, pass on my condolences to um, people who have died at work and uh, in preventable deaths 182 in Australia in 2020, 183 in 2019, and to date uh, there have been 60 Australian workers who have died in 2021 as a result of death on a workplace, uh, all preventable deaths. Uh, and I know that this bill will go a long way to making sure that those people can go to work safely and return home to their loved ones safely. And I too want to um, uh, 
recognise Kay Catanzareddy and her work. Um, uh, ben Catanzareddy's death here in the ACT was felt by the whole Canberra community, and I acknowledge the hard work that um, Kay and her family put into making sure that this legislation and that employers were held to account uh, when somebody passes away on a work site. Um, and I know that this will be a day um, that will be remembered by all in the ACT community who felt deeply and despairingly uh, when Ben passed away on that work site so many years ago now. Other, um, other people who have died in the ACT that come to my mind is um, Wayne Vickery as well, was uh, a death on an ACT work site that was preventable. Uh, Rihanna Thompson at a racetrack accident who died uh, more recently as well, and also the um, most recent death in Denman Prospect, all avoidable and preventable deaths, and that's what this legislation brought forward by um, the ACT Labor government with the support of the Greens political party to make sure that uh, workers are safe at work and that they get to return home to their loved ones. So more than just a law, this is about people's lives and about making sure that um, people in our community are safe um, and that they are able to return home to their families. And I do also want to um, acknowledge the unions in this place that have fought for decades to ensure that workers uh, are safe at work and that um, their advocacy and agitation on behalf of their union members on work sites all across the ACT um, to have this kind of legislation brought into, into the ACT to make sure that future um, workplaces are safe and that um, workers uh, are not killed and if, they, and if accidents do occur, that employers are held accountable to that. And so I um, commend the bill to the Assembly and I um, thank the Assembly for the chance to talk to this today. Mr. Gentleman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Assistant Speaker. And can I thank colleagues for their comments today and their passion for looking after workers across the ACT. Uh, Mr. Assistant Speaker, this bill is fundamental to the government's commitment to protecting workers. The ACT community rightly expects every worker to return home uh, to their family safe and well at the end of every working day. Workplace safety is a right that must be protected at all costs. The work should be fulfilling, enriching, secure and safe. Every workplace death is preventable. Every workplace death is a tragedy. I introduced this bill to the Assembly in the memory of those who have never come home from work and for the devastated families, colleagues and communities that they have left behind. And today we do remember them. We know that workplace deaths shatter families. Mr. Speak, Mr. Assistant Speaker, with us today, uh, we have such a family. Kay, thank you for being here today. And I'm sorry that you are. Thank you for sharing Ben's story with me and with so many others. Also here today are the colleagues, friends and representatives of working people. To my union colleagues in the chamber today, I say thank you. Thank you for your tireless advocacy. This legislation would not have come about without the strength of our movement. Together, we will continue to fight for working people in this city. Mr. Assistant Speaker, we need the strongest possible deterrence for dangerous workplace practices in order to prevent deaths and serious injuries. The changes in this bill leverage the strengths of the work health and safety legislative framework to allow this most serious of workplace safety failings to have a proportionate and serious consequence and to hold responsible parties accountable. The bill replaces the current industrial manslaughter offence under the Crimes Act and provides a fourth category of offence for work safety non-compliance. Under the bill, the new and improved industrial manslaughter offence expands the coverage of the offence provisions in two important respects. It would firstly apply to all persons conducting a business or undertaking, and secondly, it will allow action in respect of the death of any person. This contrasts with the current arrangements which can apply only where there is an employment relationship between the negligent employer or the officer and the person who has died. Specifically, under the new arrangements, a charge of industrial manslaughter could be brought where work conduct that is reckless or negligent 
causes the death of a person. A charge could be made against a company or another entity whose business undertaking committed the reckless or negligent conduct. Workplace safety is everyone's responsibility. This offence reflects that shared responsibility while also making clear the, rep the relationship between workers and employer under the work health and safety framework. The new offence also makes available statutory alternative offences should a prosecution for the offence of industrial manslaughter fail. This adds to the efficacy of prosecuting offences for non-compliance and is consistent with the existing Category 1 and Category 2 work health and safety offences which rely on recklessness and intention in relation to breaching a health and safety duty. The maximum penalties that could apply are 20 years imprisonment for an individual or $16.5 million penalty for a company. The maximum penalty under the new offence is higher in comparison with the Crimes Act offence that it replaces. This highlights the government and the community's expectation that a gross failure of duty to an employee that results in death is manslaughter. The law must properly reflect the severity of that offence. The bill provides for a larger scope of sentencing so that courts can ensure appropriate sentences for the most serious cases. Mr Assistant Speaker, the proposed industrial manslaughter offence aims to prevent serious injury and death in the workplace, provide a more powerful deterrent for people to comply with their health and safety obligations and sends a strong message that putting lives at risk in the workplace will not be tolerated by the ACT government. The changes do not create additional duties. Rather, they introduce more severe penalties on already existing duties under the Work Health and Safety Act. Unfortunately, Mr Assistant Speaker, too often ACT workplaces are not safe workplaces. And I'm sad to report that last financial year more than 1,000 people were so badly injured on Canberra work sites that they had to take a day or more off work because of those injuries. Added to this, the Work Health and Safety Commissioner has reported a concerning disregard for safety standards. For example, in April this year, the Work Health and Safety Commissioner described a series of inspections on 25 residential construction sites. Only one of the 25 sites inspected was found to be compliant with the relevant safety standards. This was despite WorkSafe having visited the area twice previously. Issues identified in that series of inspections alone included inadequate fall protection, unsafe scaffolding and an apprentice performing electrical work without supervision. One only needs to look uh, a, little, a little bit closer for examples of workers that have been killed from these exact types of safety failings. The most recent Safe Work Australia nationwide report on work related to traumatic fatality indicates that in 2019 there were 21 people killed at work because of falls from height and an additional eight died from coming into contact with electricity. This is unacceptable and it's devastating. We must do better and we must have the strongest possible safety regulations and deterrents. Mr Assistant Speaker, this legislation has been a long time coming. In 2018, a Senate inquiry heard from the families of those killed at work. The inquiry made several recommendations based on the heart-wrenching testimony of these families, including the introduction of an industrial manslaughter offence under the federal model workplace safety laws. In 2019, Marie Boland also recommended that this offence be included in the work health and safety framework in her review of the model laws. Despite this, there has been a clear unwillingness from successful federal Liberal governments to take action on the matter. A majority of states and territories have now established their own legislation, and I'm very proud that today the ACT will be joining them. The ACT government is committed to reducing the human cost of poor work safety and this is why we've been implementing a range of initiatives designed to make work in the ACT safer 
and more secure. The bill before us today is one important component of those initiatives. We have also introduced Labor Hire Licensing Scheme to verify that Labor Hire employers understand and comply with their workplace obligations and in doing so improve safety standards for some of our most vulnerable workers. We have made changes to the way that ACT government uh, procedures and procures contracts for labour by introducing a certificate scheme that requires tenderers and contractors to demonstrate that they must understand and comply with their work safety obligations. We have invested in additional work safety inspectorate staff, systems and infrastructure to ensure that WorkSafe is properly resourced and fully focused on assisting industry to improve safety standards. We have legislated changes to the Work Health and Safety Council to improve tripartite consultation on work safety matters and to monitor and make more informed recommendations about how to work uh, to the future to improve work safety. The parliamentary and governing agreement for this Legislative Assembly outlines other work safety initiatives that we'll be pursuing in this term of government. These include legislating to reduce the risk of silicosis caused by exposure to respirable crystalline silica, and making other legislative changes to ensure that the ACT's work safety laws are contemporary and respond to changing workplaces and work hazards. I expect these changes will particularly focus on making sure that our work safety laws have a strong focus on preventing risks and to psychosocial health and safety. This is our commitment to working people in the Territory. Everyone has a right to be safe at work. This government will always and at every opportunity protect this right. The Work Health and Safety Amendment Bill before us today is responsive to this commitment. It will establish an industrial manslaughter offence under our work health and safety laws. Mr Assistant Speaker, it's an honour to bring this legislation forward to the Assembly. I've spent my life and my career in this Assembly fighting on behalf of working Canberrans and their families, and I'm very proud today to commend this bill to the Assembly. So, members, the question is that the bill be agreed to in principle. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. Oh. Yes, yeah, sorry, uh, Mr Davis, uh, the debate has concluded. Um, I might just start that bit again, sorry. <laughs> the question is that this bill be agreed to in principle. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Is it the wish of the Assembly to dispense with the detail stage? The question then is that this bill be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. On the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. Executive business, order of the day number two, minimum age of criminal responsibility, ministerial statement, resumption of debate on the motion of Mr Rattenbury that the paper be noted. And the question is that the motion be agreed to, Mr Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. I'm pleased to speak today in support of the Attorney General's statement on raising the minimum age of uh, criminal responsibility and the government's overall commitment to improving the safety and wellbeing uh, of the ACT community. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we're meeting on, the Ngunnawal people, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and acknowledge their continuing culture and the contribution they make to life in this city and the region. And, the region. and I'd also like to acknowledge other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be present or listening to the Assembly broadcast today. This is particularly important uh, and an acknowledgement given the overrepresentation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, in interacting with the ACT justice system. Raising the age of uh, criminal responsibility can help us reduce the contact that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people have with the justice system. 
In my role as Minister for Police, Emergency Service and Corrections, the safety of the community is my priority. However, diverting children and young people away from the criminal justice system, especially from detention, by addressing the causes of harmful behaviours through targeted interventions and supporting at-risk community is also a priority. Raising the minimum age of criminal responsibility is a step in the right direction. Working towards this reform provides an opportunity to confront the challenges facing children and young people at risk, reducing their chances of engaging in harmful behaviours, as well as the impacts of harmful behaviours on the wider community. It also provides an opportunity to strengthen preventative programs to keep children and young people from engaging with the criminal justice system, which we know can result in lifelong patterns of reoffending. The ACT Government is working closely with government and non-government partners to ensure this reform results in a positive, holistic outcome for community safety in the Territory. This includes consultation with ACT Policing to ensure that police have the necessary powers of intervention to keep children, young people and the community safe at all times. We want to see young people not only diverted away from the criminal justice system, but also provided with the right social and health supports to improve their overall wellbeing and break the cycle of crime. The discussion paper has been released for public consultation and will be available for comment until the 5th of August. Amongst uh, a number of issues, this considers what support services are needed for children and young people who are at risk of harming themselves or others, including health care and emergency accommodation options? What additional powers should police have to deal with children under the revised minimum age of criminal responsibility? What measures might be needed to protect our community and prevent harm? When removing criminal justice interventions as an avenue to address the harmful behaviour of children and young people, it's important that the new arrangements continue to give uh, and keep the community safe particularly where serious, violent or repetitive harmful behaviours are involved. Alternative mechanisms that allow for appropriate consequences are important for the safety of the community, the wellbeing of the child in question and the potential victims involved. Restorative mechanisms will be important for the success of this initiative as they support accountability. Restorative justice approaches provide opportunities for people to understand the impacts of their harmful behaviours, for victims to have their experience acknowledged, and for at-risk youth to be reconnected to the community in a positive way. Mr Assistant Speaker, I am pleased that the Government has engaged an independent review team, led by Emeritus Professor Morag MacArthur, to conduct a needs and gaps analysis of the implementation requirements of raising the age. I know that the community will want to ensure that they are appropriate services to address the needs of children and young people engaging in harmful behaviour under a raised minimum age. We must carefully consider what youth, mental health, drug and alcohol and education services and supports will meet the needs of children and young people under this reform. I'm pleased to note that the trials of specialised family therapy programs are already underway. As a government, we're already thinking about the ways that we can tailor wraparound services for children and young people involved in harmful activities, ensuring that they are timely and culturally appropriate. While the number of those subject to youth justice supervision orders is small, the reality is ACT policing officers are working with a much larger group of children and young people who engage in harmful behaviours. However, this is not an issue that policing alone can solve. ACT Policing works very closely with their partners in the social and health support sectors to provide a holistic response to criminal offending by young people, ensuring that often complex underlying issues are addressed. Increasing the minimum age will provide an opportunity to strengthen preventative programs to keep children and young people from engaging with the criminal justice system, which we know can result in lifelong patterns 
of RIA funding. In the 2019-20 budget, the ACT government provided ACT policing with $33.9 million to undertake its transition to a community-focused police force under the police service model. Police are on the front foot when it comes to ensuring a proactive approach to crime prevention, disruption and response. This includes working closely with the community that it serves. Initiatives such as the Police Ambulance and Clinical Early Response, or PACER model, have shown that harnessing the expertise and capabilities of multiple agencies in response to complex issues is the best way for vulnerable members of the community to receive the support they need. The ACT Government is alive to the success of PACER and has begun to consider a similar multidisciplinary model could be used to better meet the needs of children and young people. Raising the age of the uh, minimum age of criminal responsibility will require a collaborative and considered approach across government and non-government supporting services. Police will continue to play an incredibly important role in protecting the community from harm alongside rehabilitation services to best improve the outcomes of children and young people using harmful behaviours. And I'm pleased to support the Attorney-General's statement today. Together, we will put the ACT on the path to raising the criminal age of criminal responsibility, the minimum age. Given the ACT is leading the way on this reform in Australia, it's important that this is implemented effectively. And we'll continue to work collaboratively with government colleagues across Australia and encourage them to follow our lead in raising the age. Now, just before I close, Mr Assistant Speaker, I draw your attention as to why we're debating this to today. The Attorney made this statement last sitting week, and after considered remarks from him, Minister Davidson and Minister Stephen Smith, a debate was adjourned to enable the Opposition time to consider the statement and make a contribution in this place. This is an important matter for Canberrans, and I will be disappointed if the Canberra Liberals do not put their position on the record today. Supporting the needs of children and young people and ensuring the safety of the community are not mutually exclusive. Better addressing children and young people's needs will lead to better outcomes for the community safety as a whole. As such, I look forward to continuing to support the government to raise the minimum age of criminal responsibility in the ACT. Mr Davis. Thank you very much, Mr Assistant Speaker. I rise to support in the strongest possible terms the policy position of raising the age of criminal responsibility from 10 to the age of 14. As a local member, I've been engaging with many of my constituents over the past few months since the Attorney General released the ACT government's discussion paper on the issue. And it is fair to say that there is a diversity of views across our community. One particular view that I have been struck by is the view of victim survivors who have been the victims of crime and hesitations or reservations they might have around legal changes uh, that may not protect victims. And I sympathise with that. I speak to this because I want to implore those of the more conservative disposition in our community who may have reservations around such a move to think in more detail about what justice can truly look like in a community that, as Minister Davidson so rightly points out on regular occasions, should display radical love. Justice need not look like prison bars, Mr Assistant Speaker. Justice need not look like having your liberty stripped from you. Justice need not look like putting children into places that all evidence would suggest only can further entrench a, uh, the learnt criminality. That in fact, Mr Assistant Speaker, justice can look like caring, justice can look like love, justice can look like investing in young people in our community who have made errors in judgment. And I would ask all Canberrans to reflect on instances in their youth when they may have had an error in judgment. I put it to all Canberrans, Mr Assistant Speaker, that if you can't come up with at least a few, you're probably lying to yourself. That's the nature of youth. 
you make mistakes. Those in a community that express love and kindness towards one another have a responsibility to use those opportunities for growth uh, and for learning and to ensure those young people can and should become uh, fully engaged members of their community and their society as they get older. So I take this opportunity to encourage all Canberrans to read the, the discussion paper, to consider those experts in the field who work with children and young people in the ACT every day and who en masse, Mr Assistant Speaker, it is worth noting, support this legislative reform. I'd like to quote Dr Justin Barker, the CEO of the Youth Coalition of the ACT, who says, quote, all of us want to live in safe and healthy communities. That means investing in housing, healthcare, services and family supports that children and young people need to learn and grow, not ripping them out of our community and locking them away. Raising the age of criminal responsibility is one step in the right direction to building the type of therapeutic and importantly evidence-based service landscape that we need to keep kids and our community safe. They welcome this opportunity to share expertise with the ACT government about the type of services, programs and whole of government response needed to give every child the chance to thrive." End quote. If you'll indulge me for a little bit longer, Mr Assistant Speaker, Dr Emma Campbell, the CEO of the ACT Council of Social Services, a peak representative body for many, many different groups in Canberra who support children and young people, said, and I quote, we need leadership on this crucial issue, which is causing immense harm to the health, well-being and future of children. If diverted from the youth justice system, the needs of children under 14 can be addressed by appropriate services in youth homelessness, child protection and mental health. Providing early and alternative supports to children and their families is likely to have better outcomes for the individual, their family and the wider community than engagement with the criminal justice system. ATCOS is proud to be based in the only jurisdiction in Australia that has recognised that children simply do not belong in prison. We applaud the work done by the ACT government and Attorney General Shane Rattenbury to progress this crucial issue and call on other jurisdictions to follow suit and take decisive positive action." End quote. I quote these two community leaders, Mr Assistant Speaker, because uh, how the ACT Greens have historically and will continue to develop policy in this space uh, and in all spaces is always informed by evidence and the experts. I don't think Canberrans look to their politicians on all instances to be the authority on all things. Rather, we are entrusted with the responsibility of sourcing the right answers from those who know in the community and implementing those policies and making them law. And when so many leaders in our community who work with young people every day support this legislative reform, I encourage all Canberrans to take heed of their word. I'm particularly struck by some of the words in Dr Emma Campbell's quote around national leadership. This is one example in a long list of many examples where the nation's most progressive government is leading this country to policy and legislative reform that is long overdue, that protects the most vulnerable, and I'm incredibly proud to be a member of a government that is willing to have difficult conversations, nuanced conversations with our community, is willing to engage them thoroughly and consistently throughout the process, uh, and is unafraid to be the first to do something that needs to get done. Uh, this is the most progressive government in the country. This is also a government that has been uh, had strong Greens influence in the Cabinet for more than a decade. And I don't think those two things are unrelated, Mr Assistant Speaker. People all around the country who have been advocating for this law reform for a long time can see the virtue of progressive political parties working together to achieve strong legislative reform. Australians all around the country who support raising the age of criminal responsibility 
can consider how the ACT government has conducted these deliberations, the makeup of the government in coming to this position, and if it is an issue that is so impactful to them, perhaps reflect on that the next time they're asked to cast a ballot. Mr Assistant Speaker, as the youngest member of this place uh, and somebody who has uh, outed myself on a few occasions in this place as being a bit of a mischief maker in my youth, uh, perhaps my support for such a motion might be a little bit self-indulgent. But Mr Assistant Speaker, I have seen throughout the course of my young life so many instances where young people have been engaged in criminal activity, where it became so obvious if you scratch just a little bit below the surface that that criminality could be best taken care with, taken care of in a therapeutic environment, in an environment that protects and respects the young person's liberty and starts from a basis that there is reform but they, they are open to reform and open to changed behaviour. Mr Assistant Speaker, the evidence is clear. The experts have told us what to do, and I would be incredibly disappointed if at some point in the future such legislative reform was not unanimously supported by this whole assembly. Mr Radbury. Uh, thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. And just briefly to close the discussion, I thank members for their contribution to the debate, both on the previous date that this was discussed and in today's remarks. Uh, coincidentally, today is the day that the consultation closes on the public discussion paper, uh, and I look forward to seeing the submissions uh, when they're briefed up to me. Uh, that's, I should be very clear, though, that is not the end of the conversation. There is still a lot of work to be done in this space as the discussion paper alludes to, and in my remarks to this chamber uh, several weeks ago now, there is quite a lot of complex policy work to do in this space to ensure that we have a robust system that supports young people and helps them in a therapeutic way uh, address the challenging behaviours in their life and put their lives on a better trajectory. I think Mr Davis very eloquently uh, alluded to the really human side of this discussion. Whilst it is a legal reform, it is a very important social reform as well in terms of giving our young people uh, the best chance at having great lives in this city and making sure that we don't leave children behind. Uh, we don't simply place them in the, in the custodial system that in fact we seek to work much harder uh, to give them the best possible future. I am very grateful for the statement released today from a coalition of over 20 service delivery, human rights, legal and representative organisations in the ACT, underlining their support for this reform. Uh, the nature of those organisations, from uh, the Youth Coalition, the Council on Social Service, uh, through to uh, the, the Law Society, uh, as well as some of the organisations that would, uh, would provide the kind of services we might expect, such as Coogan Golan Youth Aboriginal Corporation uh, and the Northside Community Service, underlines uh, the community's understanding of the importance of this issue. I think particularly with the remarks from Kim Davison from Guggen Golan, who notes the particular impact of, uh, and the potential impact for these reforms on a young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in our community. Uh, so I look forward to the continuing discussion both in this place and in the community on this reform. As I said, we have a lot of work still to do, particularly to get our service responses uh, right. Uh, to enable this reform to take place, uh, and I look forward to updating the Assembly as we make further progress on this matter. Uh, members, the question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. Executive Business Order of the Day number three, update on the ACT Government's work to create sustainable Canberra jobs, ministerial statement, Resumption on the debate, debate on the motion of Mr Rattenbury that the paper be noted. The question is that the motion be agreed to. <coughs> Ms Jane. Uh, thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. And I think I'll just note as well, there is an error on the daily program. Uh, I think that's just been a copy-paste um, from number two to number three. I adjourned this 
uh, statement, um, and that is why I'm uh, taking my right to speak next. Um, so I am pleased to, to follow on from the Chief Minister um, regarding the ACT government's work to create sustainable Canberra jobs. Canberra jobs for Canberrans. As he noted, the ACT leads the nation on climate action. But what's also essential is that we're creating secure, sustainable jobs that come from this essential transition that we're not leaving every, anybody behind, but equally that we're using the opportunities that this uh, enormous challenge presents us uh, to be able to drive growth and to create even more jobs. In this vein, the government has been a strong supporter of emerging technologies and renewables and climate action, driving early stage commercialisation in startups and in growth companies. The ACT government has used levers like our own funding to support sustainable businesses in the innovation ecosystem through the Innovation Connect or ICON early stage commercialisation grant program and through programs and services delivered by the Canberra Innovation Network. And I thought that uh, uh, a good example um, to draw the Assembly's attention to is GoTerra, uh, which received $30,000 of ICON funding in 2015-16. With this, it developed its black soldier fly larvae proof of technology. In doing this, it's created three revenue streams, waste management, pellets and meal and social supplements made from insects. It's now raised $6.9 million in investment over two rounds to expand its business. And we're congratulated in winning the 2021 Liftoff Award for Ag Tech Startup or Scale Up of the Year. GoTerra has partnered with local organisations, Capital Brewing Co, and the Coimbia and Palarang Regional Council, as well as national companies such as Lend Lease and Woolworths. It processes food waste into protein and soil enhancers, diverting food from landfill, reducing emissions and pursuing a circular economy. Examples of sustainable startups that have received ICON grants also include Reposit Power, which received $50,000 in 2012-13 to deploy a commercial scale prototype hardware and software solution that manages distributed electricity storage. It's now involved in the Ausgrid program, trialling the viability of energy storage and demand services to the grid. The joyful fashionista, who uh, is otherwise known as Serena Bird, someone who I've known for a long time, who received $17,500 in April 2021 to develop a peer-to-peer -peer shopping website for second-hand and sustainable clothing. A specialised electric vehicle received $23,300 in April 2021 to develop its high-performance modular vehicle electrific electrification for the most challenging applications that demand zero emissions. In the same month, Rex Energy received $23,300 to develop a tool that helps small businesses to reduce their energy bills by making sure that they are always on their best energy plan. As part of Seabrin's Kiln incubation program, several sustainable businesses are also currently receiving an incredible amount of support. Sway Aquaculture is a company that sustainably cultivates and farms seafood for wholesale. It is currently raising capital investment and beginning their first harvest of 50,000 sea cucumbers in Singapore. Evaluate Sustainability is a software platform that allows organisations to monitor their total carbon footprint and provide explainability to minimise their carbon output. It has recently closed several new deals. Seabrin also partners with the Millhouse Ventures to deliver the Social Enterprise Accelerator program that supports social innovators to explore viable and sustainable ways to create, measure and sustain impact to address systemic disadvantage. In collaboration with the CIT, Seabrin delivered the Zero CO2 Hackathon in August 2020. The hackathon's focus was accelerating Canberra's transition to net zero carbon emissions by 2045. 
The virtual event had 39 participants who formed teams to create solutions and compete for a prize pool of over $10,000. Seabrin has commenced work with CIT on Zero CO2 and Sustainability Collaborative Innovation Lab to be held later in this year. Canberra-based Mineral Carbonation International, MCI, uh, is a, an organisation or a business that I've spoken about many times uh, in this place, which uses carbon engineering processes to transform captured carbon dioxide into solid materials that can be used to manufacture low carbon building and construction projects. In June 2021, MCI was successful in receiving a Commonwealth grant of $14.6 million to construct a world first mineral carbonation mobile demonstration plant in Newcastle, and many people in this place would recognise its Chief Operating Officer, Sophia Hamblin-Wong, who regularly appears uh, on ABC TV on Q&A and is a fantastic ambassador uh, for sustainable jobs and sustainable growth industries. The ACT's ambitious renewable electricity target has attracted over $2 billion worth of investment in large-scale renewables and demonstrated the Territory's national and international leadership as a renewable energy and climate action capital. The ACT government's award-winning reverse auctions also leveraged significant local investment outcomes worth $500 million over 20 years. The Next Generation Energy, Storing Pro Energy Storage Program and the Renewable Energy Innovation Fund were established as a result of these reverse auctions. The $25 million Next Energy Storage Program has supported the installation of over 1,700 energy storage systems, or 7.6 megawatts of sustained peak output to date. 15 local installers are now, in credit, are now accredited to the program and delivering those services to Canberra Homes and Business. These installers will also all be accredited to the new Sustainable Household Scheme, which already has more than 35 accredited installers and growing. Since its inauguration in 2016, the ACT Renewables Innovation Hub, supported by the Renewable Energy Innovation Fund, a collaborative co-working space in the Canberra's Renewables in Precinct has hosted more than 60 businesses and 150 events, with more than 3,000 attendees. The $12 million Renewable Energy Innovation Fund is providing $2.2 million in flexible early stage funding through its direct, direct grants program to help support a diversity of new and emerging technologies and ventures. Local startups have been successfully supported to date, and there are future rounds to come. Innovative projects that have been completed to date with this funding include Reposit, receiving direct grants in round one in 2017, which helped them develop their most recent iteration of the Reposit box. When Reposit started in 2013, they comprised of just two staff and have since grown to a team of over 20 staff. PV Labs received funding through the direct grants rounds one and two. They've pioneered solar panel testing and quality assurance programs in Australia. They now consult for many utility scale solar farms and are in the process of fitting out a purpose built testing facility in Mitchell. Solcast are a renewable energy software company who have been part of the Canberra Renewables Innovation Hub. They received $287,000 under the round one funding and they're developing a world leading service for forecasting power output at large solar farms with this grant funding. ITP Thermal received funding under round two to commercialise large scale storage solutions for hydrogen. They recently established a new company called Ardent Underground and they raised $1 million in capital to begin a pilot project. And the ANU's battery storage and grid integration project is now recognised as a leading source of policy and technical advice on battery integration. This project began with $4 million of ACT government funding, but has now grown, and it's attracted an additional $7 million through its demonstrated expertise, and it comprises over 30 staff and students. 
Finally, Mr Assistant Speaker, the Renewable Energy Skills Centre of Excellence was established at, at CIT in late 2015 to lead trades training and development of practical technical skills for work-ready graduates across a range of renewable industries across Australia and internationally. Mr Assistant Speaker, there's a lot to talk about. We have many success stories here in the ACT where we've used our funding in a targeted way to help leverage these businesses to ensure their growth, to take advantage of the opportunities that the challenge of climate change presents us. And as a result, these businesses have grown. We have been able to create more jobs, employing more Canberrans. We are developing a very strong national and international reputation as a renewable energy innovation cluster. We do have world leading capabilities, as I've demonstrated in renewable energy asset management, wind and solar resource analysis and forecasting, innovative policy and project design, smart and data driven energy storage integration and clean fuels. There is always more work to be done, but we come from a very good place. Thank you. Any other member wish to speak, Ms. Orr? I seek to adjourn the statement because I believe we do have more people, but it's the wish of the Assembly to break for lunch. Okay, so is the wish of the Assembly to adjourn the debate? Those in favour? Those in favour? Aye. Uh, against? The ayes have it. So I understand it is the wish of the Assembly to suspend for lunch. Uh, the chair will be resumed at 2 p.m. Thank you, members. Questions without notice. Call the leader of the opposition, Ms. Lay. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Transport and City Services. Minister, in relation to light rail stage 2A construction, you were recently quoted as saying that, and I quote, it's going to mean a significant amount of congestion that our city probably hasn't seen before in its history, end quote. You went on to say commuters' options could include using public transport. Minister, under the massive levels of traffic congestion and disruption you have warned us about, how will public transport perform any better than a private motor vehicle? Mr Steele. Well, I thank the member for her question, Madam Speaker. And of course, our government is getting on with our city's largest ever infrastructure build, which is focused on providing better public transport for our city, building a more vibrant, sustainable and connected city in the future as our population grows. And as we do that, we've been upfront with the community that this is going to have a significant disruptive effect while we construct the project. And that's why we've established the Disruption Task Force, a task force that will be looking at how we can minimise the extent of that disruption to the community, not just those businesses and people that live, uh, work and uh, go for recreation around the western side of London Circuit, but also in the broader community as well. And that's why the Disruption Task Force is looking at better public transport options. They're looking at a range of different things, which I've said and been very clear that we will announce over the coming months. In addition to that, they'll be looking at behaviour change, encouraging uh, shifts in the way that people uh, work. People will have to rethink their routes, rethink their routines during the period, and we'll be clearly communicating with the community and business every step of the way, as early as possible, about the options that will be available so that they can uh, reduce the impact on themselves and help to keep our city moving as well. And our government will be putting in place the infrastructure investments that we can in the short term on our road network to reduce the extent of disruption. So that work is ongoing and the, the group has been meeting uh, for some time as we undertake significant preparation and planning ahead of work starting later on this year. Supplementary, Ms Lee. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, you're going to create additional bus lanes on Kings Avenue, Parksway and Mooreshead Drive to allow public transport to operate better on these routes? Mr. Thank Steele. the member for her question. And we are considering a range of different options to provide uh, public transport as an option, as a way that people can 
help make their commute into the city and into the parliamentary triangle easier and help minimise the disruptive effect that the construction will have as we seek to build a, an infrastructure um, system with, with public transport that will gener which, which will benefit Canberrans for generations to come. So all options around public transport are being considered and I've already announced that we're looking at things like park and ride, uh, we'll look at bus priority of course. We'll also work with groups like Pedal Power on how we can uh, encourage people to use active travel if it's appropriate. We also understand that for many groups in our community, many people, um, particularly families, some of these options may not be appropriate. Uh, but if we can encourage enough people to, to use these options, then it will help to keep our whole city moving, as well as, of course, shortening the commute, uh, making it easier to get into work and to where people need to, need to go, such as schools. Mr Parton. Thank you, Minister. Is it your intention to ban private motor vehicles altogether from certain congested routes? And if so, which routes? Mr Steele. No, Madam Speaker. Our focus is on minimising the extent of disruption during this infrastructure build as we seek to build uh, light rail and get on with what we said we would do, creating over 6,000 jobs, connecting light rail um, from uh, Civic to, to Woden. And we're going to deliver a much better uh, public transport system for the future. That's the best way to encourage people to use um, public transport. Of course, as we do that, there will be some road closures that are required, and we've been up front with the community, and the maps are available on uh, the Light Rail Project website. The clover leaves uh, in the south uh, west will be closed uh, to traffic, and that is going to have a disruptive effect. Uh, on, on traffic, and that's why uh, there'll be other routes that people will need to consider to get into work if they need to use those uh, exits. Uh, and we'll be making that very clear, often on a daily basis to the community, about where we're up to in the construction program, which roads are closed, uh, which one, roads are open uh, to use. And that's going to change as the project continues, Madam Speaker. The early works will begin very soon on utilities removal, and that will only have localised uh, disruptive effects. But as we move into quarter two of next year with the raising of London Circuit and the demolition of the bridges in a staged fashion uh, over London Circuit on Commonwealth Avenue, that is going to have a major disruptive effect. But it's also the effect of the work that the NCA is doing on the uh, bridge augmentation on Commonwealth Avenue as well, as they seek to extend the life of that bridge for, for another 50 years and also widen the uh, pedestrian and cycling um, uh, bridges as well to provide better active travel opportunities. So we'll be working hand in hand uh, with the NCA, but these are not the only other major infrastructure projects happening around Canberra. We're planning for, uh, to make sure we can minimise disruption around all of those as well as the private developments uh, that are occurring around our city. Mrs Jones. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Transport and City Services. Minister, Canberrans residing on the south side of the city have been advised to consider using the Monaro Highway as an alternate route once light rail traffic disruptions occur elsewhere. Around the same time, construction will start on the Monaro Highway upgrade with major activity in 2022. To make matters worse, your traffic disruption modelling indicates light rail works will generate a 46 per cent increase in traffic loads on the Monaro Highway. Minister, why are you telling people to use the already congested Monaro Highway at the same time as you will start disruptive works on the same road? Mr Steele. Well, we're not, Madam Speaker. Um, we're getting on with building uh, major infrastructure projects that are needed to meet the needs of our growing city. And we are getting on with works, uh, of course, on light rail uh, very soon, but also getting on with the necessary, necessary infrastructure projects on major arterial routes like the Monero Highway, like William Hubble Drive. We're also building a hospital in Woden. We're getting, building a new interchange and gas depot in Woden, a new CIT campus. There's a huge amount of private development occurring right across the city, and it is going to be a disruptive period, Madam Speaker, and that's why we're doing the preparation and planning necessary so that we can provide closer to the time uh, advice to Canberrans about uh, what routes they might want to take to minimise the extent of that disruption. We haven't provided that advice yet, um, Madam Speaker. We'll be doing that um, close to the time and it will depend on where each of the infrastructure projects is up to in its program. Uh, and that may differ often on a daily basis around uh, which roads are closed and, and so forth. So we're getting on with that work and it would be extraordinary if it was the position of the opposition Liberal Party that we should delay and not build these projects, we're getting on with the job. Point of order. 
Minister is both debating and has still not answered the question, which goes to relevance as well as debating, the question being, why is he telling people to use the Monaro when it will be congested at the same time? Uh, I think he's covered his response to that. It certainly has not. Uh, no need for a chat back, Mrs Jones. It is indeed. Thank you. Minister, will the works on the Monaro Highway be taking place at the same time as the upgrades to Stage 2A? Mr Steele. Yes, Madam Speaker. We'll be getting on uh -huh. with making sure that the yes. Monero Highway yes. is safer and will be and reduce travel times on that important connection, not only for uh, Tuggerong residents, for, for, but for the whole of the region, Madam Speaker, including uh, Jerobombra, South Charlie, uh, Queanbeyan, uh, our a major freight route um, to the southern part um, of New South Wales. We're getting on with that work and we're going to get on with all of the other infrastructure projects that we've committed to, uh, because that's what our Labor and Greens government does. We've committed to these in our infrastructure plan, which clearly outlined all of the major infrastructure projects that we, would, uh, that we will be doing over the coming years, and we're getting on with the job. And that is in stark contrast to what the Liberal Party has done, which is to put in jeopardy every step of the way major infrastructure projects the question like is to with the Campbell, it was the Minister is debating. He's not, Mrs Jones. Supplementary, Dr Patterson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Minister, I was wondering how um, the Disruption Task Force will work to inform commuters of all these roadworks. Mr Steele. I thank the, Dr Patterson for her supplementary and we'll be communicating through a range of different channels about, uh, as, the, as the build uh, commences, about how people can best get into the city, uh, what the progress is on the project. Uh, it'll be through radio, uh, it'll be through anyone that wants to sign up for updates through the light rail website. We've of course established, Members. We've established a community reference panel that I met with the other day that has representatives from the entire, uh, from a range of different stakeholders in the community. We've established an accessibility reference group, Madam Speaker, in Transport, Care and City Services, and we'll be consulting with them on the accessibility aspects of the project. And we'll be providing uh, information through stakeholders that often have quite a large membership um, so that they can disseminate information to their members that might be pertinent to them, how they can get into the city on a bike uh, during the construction um, period if they'd like to, how they can use public transport. The Public Transport Association will no doubt be very helpful there. How we can work with business to make sure that they can accommodate more flexible arrangements so their employees can get into work uh, and not be held up in traffic. Uh, we'll be working with the entire Canberra community, and that's why we have established the, the Disruption Task Force, to get on with that preparation and planning now, well ahead of this major infrastructure bill commencing. Members, questions without notice? Mr Hanson. My question is to the Chief Minister. No, I'll give it to the <laughs> Minister for Transport and City Services. He deserves one, but not today. <laughs> Minister, you were recently quoted as saying that light rail stage 2A would cause traffic congestion never before experienced in Canberra. Given survivability in life-threatening situations is directly linked to emergency vehicle response times, Minister, what contingency plans have you made for emergency service vehicles attempting to access life-threatening situations during this period of traffic congestion? Mr. Well, I thank the member for his question. And as I've uh, stated to the Assembly today, we are undertaking a significant amount of preparation and planning as we uh, undertake preparations ahead of the light rail stage 2A project occurring, which will start with utility works in just a few months' um, time as we seek, uh, seek to build a very large infrastructure project which will keep people moving around our city and hopefully reduce congestion uh, on our roads. That's the premise of this project. And we'll work with agencies, including emergency services, to make sure that they have all the information that they need, that they're working with us to around the uh, planning for the project. And once we've got a delivery partner on board, Madam Speaker, for the major elements of the uh, construction build, we'll of course work with the delivery partners to uh, make sure that there are measures in place to ensure that people can appropriately move around, including emergency services vehicles, through uh, areas where the construction is affecting uh, the city. But we expect that the major impacts of this construction will occur during peak times. 
So in the morning in particular, in the AM peak, uh, and in the and in the evening. And so um, they are the, the times that we're focusing on. Um, we don't expect there to be as much traffic disruption in the other times. But all of the work that the Disruption Task Force is doing around infrastructure improvements that we can put in place on roads to ensure that we've got good movement of traffic. Behaviour change to reduce uh, the demand on our road network during, during the peak by spreading it out. And all of the work that we're doing around public transport options and active travel options will all help to keep our city moving during this major infrastructure build. Supplementary. What traffic simulation modelling have you done specifically on emergency vehicle prioritisation during the light rail project and will you table any modelling in the Assembly if you've done some? Mr. I think Steele. the member for his question and we've already uh, released the, uh, some of the outcomes of the traffic modelling that we've uh, undertaken on what the traffic would look like if we didn't take any interventions at the moment. At the moment we're looking at the interventions uh, and of course a significant amount of traffic modelling is ongoing uh, that will look at those interventions, what impact they can have across the, the road traffic network in Canberra. So we'll continue that work and we'll continue to liaise with the other agencies Final going order. forward. I'll resume your seat. Just on relevance, Madam Speaker, the question was specifically on emergency vehicle prioritisation, the traffic s simulation modelling referring to emergency vehicle prioritisation. And I um, would just ask that the Minister be relevant to that question. Well, he's relevant to modelling and he's made mention of Thank the uh, activity. The question, Thank you, Mr Hanson. You have a supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, what smart technologies has the government investigated to prevent emergency service vehicles from being stuck in traffic congestions caused by this light rail project? Mr Steele. Well, we've, I've already said that we wouldn't rule out any options in terms of how we can help to manage uh, the disruption during the, the build. Uh, and we'll work with emergency services around what their requirements are in terms of uh, access around the road network uh, and make sure that we reduce the amount of disruption overall in the city to make sure that we can keep all uh, traffic moving uh, throughout the city during a very, uh, what is going to be a very challenging time for the city, but will provide long-term benefits for our city and for Canberrans for generations to come. Questions without notice? Mr Pedersen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. Minister, there are many changes underway at the Canberra Hospital campus. Can you please update the Assembly on the work that is being undertaken as part of the Canberra Hospital expansion? Ms Stephen Smith. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Mr Pedersen for the question. Well, as members would be aware, the contract with Multiplex to deliver the new critical services building as part of the Canberra Hospital expansion was signed on the 29th of June. And with today's announcement of the development application being approved, this important work continues for the future of our health system. Another milestone day for this project, Madam Speaker, that would not have been achieved if the Canberra Liberals had been elected last year. Main works on the project have, com have commenced. Relocation of, if you were about to being elected last year, you would have already built it. Uh, relocation of in-ground utilities have been completed and Multiplex are continuing their investigative works. Internal demolition to Building 5 commenced in July, with complete demolition of Building 5 and 24 scheduled to be finished by the end of 2021. Quite different from the hole in the ground we would have gone into the pandemic with if the Canberra Liberals had had any say in the matter. Big hole in the middle of Canberra Hospital we would have had going into the pandemic if the Canberra Liberals had been in charge. This comes on top of a range of early works, of course, Madam Speaker, that have already transformed the campus. The new Building 8 was completed in July 2021 and provides upgraded facilities for the Canberra Sexual Health Centre and, of course, staff training. In addition, 12 apartments were refurbished in Building 9 for short-term accommodation at the Canberra Hospital for interstate outpatients and carers. And of course, at the former CIT site in Woden, we've provided 750 car parking spaces for hospital staff and contractors, freeing up spaces on the campus and, and will deliver 1,100 parking spaces in total. Construction of the temporary prototype shed and the contractor compound also commenced in June with the prototype shed scheduled for completion early next year and that will allow staff and consumers to test out the functionality of proposed spaces for the new building to ensure those designs are fit for purpose. Mr Pedersen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, what does the opening of Building 8 at Canberra Hospital bring to the Canberra community and the staff who work there? Ms Stephen Smith. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Mr Pedersen for the supplementary. Well, the opening of Building 8 has been an important milestone in the modernisation of the Canberra Hospital campus through the expansion project, providing new facilities for the Canberra community and health services staff. Uh, the much-loved Canberra Sexual Health Centre, eh, maybe that's not the right term for it, has been relocated <laughs> to a modern purpose-built clinic on level four. But I know that Ms Chain is a big fan of Canberra Sexual Health Centre. Uh, the relocation of the Canberra Sexual Health Centre supports the work of providing um, sexual health services pro for priority populations with a focus on prevention, screening, early diagnosis and the treatment of sexual tra sexually transmissible infections and HIV. The Sexual Health Centre continues to offer an important COVID safe services with shorter uh, in-clinic waiting times. Light and spacious, this new space in Building 8 has been warmly welcomed by staff and consumers. Canberra Health Services also has a new, new purpose-built teaching and training facilities for all staff located on Level 2 and Level 3 of Building 8. The new teaching spaces provide a modern environment to attend essential education. The education spaces include four flexible training rooms for large and small groups, computer access, a specific space for occupational violence and manual handling training, and a simulation space for clinical skills training, which I know that Mrs Jones will be pleased to hear. The new Surgical Skills Centre is a purpose-designed and built facility aimed at the skills training requirements of our Canberra Health Services health workers. The area encompasses private study space, tutorial rooms, and two clinical skills laboratories, one of which is equipped to handle wet specimens and tissue. Building 8 also houses important research units to bring education and research together on the one floor, encouraging increased collaboration. The co-location of education and research means we can measure training effectiveness and provide the community with the assurance that CHS staff are accessing the best evidence-based education possible. Ms Hall. Ms Hall. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, how will planning for the Canberra Hospital ensure an accessible and integrated approach is taken to future-proof the campus for the Canberra community? Ms Stephen Smith. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Ms Orr for the supplementary question. Well, the ACT Government is, of course, currently working with stakeholders and community to develop the Canberra Hospital Master Plan. The Master Plan work provides a roadmap for the next 20 years of development of our largest hospital. The Master Plan looks at how all elements of the campus can fit together, including through the Canberra Hospital expansion, to improve experiences for everyone. Phase two of the Canberra Hospital Master Plan is currently out for consultation is currently occurring after opening on the 23rd of July 2021. Major themes heard in the first phase of consultation included access, accessibility and connectivity. Incorporating this feedback, Madam Speaker, we've developed a precinct-based approach to the campus with two draft options of how the campus could potentially develop over the next 20 years to get people's feedback on those specifics. We encourage all Canberrans to visit the Canberra Hospital Master Plan Your Say page or attend one of the pop-ups at your local shops. The team has also been out and, about, out and about at all community council meetings and I was pleased to attend Woden Valley Community Council last night to see their presentation there and hear the questions from the community. We want to hear what the community uh, has to say and about how we can improve the Master Plan options as we go work towards finalising it. Through the master plan, we've identified opportunities for improved access for vehicles and pedestrians, integration of active travel and public transport, upgraded wayfinding, and increased and improved open spaces, including green spaces across the Canberra Hospital campus. Parking, of course, Madam Speaker, is also a very important issue for the community, and the master plan options demonstrate increased parking supply can be provided more evenly across the campus. This includes providing parking under the new buildings as redevelopment occurs, and allowing the community to directly access areas of building in an efficient and safe matter, manner. The master plan is about identifying potential redevelopment and ensuring progress on the campus has the guidance and flexibility it needs to support the best model of care and service delivery. Your time delivery. has expired. Questions without notice. Mr Parton. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Chief Minister. <laughs> Chief Minister, yesterday in question time, when the opposition asked you about correcting your false statements about thousands of warning notices being issued following speeding limit or speed limit changes in Civic, you said that doing so is not the top issue. You also confirmed that no one from your office or directorate informed you that your statements were false. Chief Minister, since these revelations, have you instructed your office or directorate to audit your appearances on Chief Minister's talkback for any other false or misleading statements? 
Andrew Barr. No, whilst uh, obviously uh, Chief Minister's talk back will uh, throw up the widest variety of issues, I think from last week's uh, episode, everything from our relations with China uh, to speed limits uh, on Northbourne Avenue uh, to the usual uh, municipal service issues, uh, vaccination programs. Uh, it was a very wide ranging uh, forum, as it normally is. Uh, so we make every endeavour to answer every possible question that we can on the spot. There are times uh, when I just do not have the information in front of me uh, or in my head, Madam Speaker, uh, and so I will take things on notice. Uh, and there are other times, clearly, when it is possible uh, that human error can occur, and that was the case last week. I've apologised for that. Uh, and you know, from time to time, we all make a mistake or two, Mr. Parton, and you, of all people, <laughs> today, <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Chief Minister, have you received any other briefs or advice from your office or directorate about false or incorrect statements that you have previously made during media appearances? Mr. Barr. Uh, well, in my entire career. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, from, I, I, I recall, uh, yes, over more than 15 years that there have been times I have misspoken, Madam Speaker, uh, occasionally in this, occasionally in this, occasionally in this place, and uh, and sometimes in media interviews. Uh, uh, you you identify an error, Madam Speaker. I think the appropriate thing to do is to apologise and correct the record, which is which is. Uh, what uh, I have done on multiple occasions when, uh, when something has been drawn to my attention, Madam Speaker. Mrs Kickett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Chief Minister, why is it not a top issue for you when to many of the 18,000 who received a $300 fine, it is a big issue of affordability? Mr. Barr. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Ms. Kickett, for the question. Uh, as I outlined uh, in my response yesterday, uh, we are in the midst of a global pandemic. Uh, there are hundreds of people in hospital just a couple of hundred kilometres up the road from us. The virus has spread uh, outside of the Greater Sydney area. Uh, this is my number one priority at the moment, responding to the pandemic addressing the vaccination rollout, ensuring uh, that we deliver our budget at the end uh, of this month, Madam Speaker, continuing the ACT government's engagement in the national cabinet process. Uh, we are continuing to focus, Madam Speaker, the, 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 the national cabinet process is of course broader than just the response uh, to the initial uh, and impending issues associated, uh, associated with the pandemic. We continue to respond to climate change, Madam Speaker, which is an urgent priority. We continue to respond to the need uh, to build more houses uh, in this city, which is another urgent priority. We continue to provide support to the tourism and hospitality sector, uh, Madam Speaker. We continue uh, we continue our focus uh, on emergency services, on police, ambulance. Uh, we continue to deliver healthcare services in the community, Madam Speaker. We focus on the rollout of new infrastructure uh, across the city, Madam Speaker, including public transport projects. Uh, we, are, we are, of course, Madam Speaker, Mrs. continuing, Jones, Mr. Hanson. Uh, continuing to deliver on our election commitments. Uh, and, Madam Speaker, uh, we remain focused on the number one priority that faces this community and this nation at this time, responding time to the pandemic. We'll go to more questions without notice. Ms Clay. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Planning. Minister, the expansion of Kipax Fair has been of great interest to the Belconnen community. My recent visit with the Umbagong Landcare Group raised flood risk due to climate change as a particular concern. To what extent does the 2020 Kipax flood report take into consideration data based on the new climate change risk environment and the impacts of flooding we're likely to see over the next 100 years? Mr Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Ms Clay for the question. Uh, I'll go to the Kipax study first and just advise that we took under uh, substantial 
consultation in developing both the Kipax Group Centre Master Plan and the Associated Territory Plan Variation. The flood study done in 2015 informed the processes for the Master Plan and the Territory Plan uh, for Kipax as well. And we did an updated flood study from 2020, providing additional information to government. Uh, so that study took in uh, into account the changes we've seen most recently, some, of course, which have been uh, uh, associated with climate change, were taken into account as well. Now, that revised study considered a number of uh, change conditions, more recent survey and updated parameters and methods uh, as contained in the recently revised National Flood Guideline, uh, which is the Australian Rainfall and Runoff uh, Guideline 2019. And the 2020 flood study found that the land uh, is suitable for development. Supplementary. Minister, has a strategic environmental assessment been conducted in the last 10 years to look at flood risks and flood mitigation at Kipax, given our changing climate? Mr Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Ms Clay for the supplementary. Well, the, the flood study that we did uh, is publicly available, all, all parties seeking to express interest in the site uh, through that uh, recent expression of interest can go and have a look at that too, and of course members of the, the public can have a look at that. Uh, I'm confident that they've, they've taken into account, uh, as I mentioned earlier, changes that are occurring. And indeed, we're looking at this uh, uh, situation in whole of government circumstances too. I can say with ESA, they're looking at changing uh, conditions and are moving to an all hazards approach when it comes to uh, emergency services responses uh, across the ACT. We have seen changes in weather. Uh, we've seen it personally um, as citizens across the ACT in the last couple of years, Madam Speaker. Uh, so we'll certainly keep an eye on uh, those predictions and ensure that they're well embedded into our future planning. Sup Mr Braddock, supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, our strategic environmental assessments conducted for all major urban developments to help future-proof us in the context of the changing climate. Mr. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, yes, assessments are taken into account for uh, the future of developments. Indeed, uh, uh, some of the work that we do around our bushfire operational plans and bushfire abatement zones are a key way of expressing that commitment. Uh, we need to make sure that, of course, our city is safe as we grow into the future. And it was certainly one of the considerations that we took into account uh, when we looked at the uh, strategic uh, planning for the ACT and the announcement of our 7030 change to the way that we will develop Canberra into the future, Madam Speaker. Questions without notice? Mr Davis? Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for the Environment. Minister, throughout the colder months, many Canberrans have been lighting up their wood fire heaters to stay warm. But I've been contacted by several of my constituents who are concerned about the adverse health effects of wood smoke, particularly in Tuggeranong. What is the government doing to manage the nexus between the needs of Canberrans to heat our homes while also protecting Canberrans from the adverse health effects of wood smoke? Ms Bazzarotti. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Mr Davis, for the question. Um, yes, it is the case with winter coming on, people are using a, a range of ways to heat the, their homes, including wood fire smoke. And, um, Members of this House might have noted that we did release the 2020 um, air quality um, report um, quite recently, which did identify um, that particularly in the winter months that, that while we have really good air quality, wood fire smoke does create some issues for um, both in terms of environmental impacts as well as health impacts. So the ACT government does um, take this issue really seriously and we are looking as part of the um, smoke and air quality strategy that we are developing um, in consultation with um, ACT Health and other parts of government to really look at whether or not we've got all of the measures in place. So at the moment we certainly do monitoring and um, I'm really also pleased to um, let the House know that um, in April this year, environment ministers came together and made a variation to the ambient air quality national environment protection measure to actually ensure that we had strengthened air quality standards for ozone, nitro dioxide and sulphur dioxide to ensure that what we were monitoring was, in, it was, um, was of, the highest, of the highest standard. We also provide an, um, a wood heater um, replacement program for people who are interested in, um, in, in replacing the wood fire heaters and we offer financial incentives for the removal and disposal of wood fire um, wood burning heaters. 
um, and particularly additional incentives if that they if they are putting um, more efficient electric electric systems in place. We also look at, at some areas because of typology. We know that they are particular risks, and in those areas, particularly in um, in places such as the Malongo, they are. There are some service, suburbs that they're unable to um, put, put fire Supplementary, in. Mr Davis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, what specific government programs or subsidies exist for Canberrans who currently own and operate a wood fire here, heater, but they would like to transition to an electric heater? Ms Pazzarotti. Thank, thanks, um, the member, for the question. Look, there's two key things. Um, we talk, I, I did, in my previous question, talk about the Axmart wood fire heater replacement program. And so that provides a range of rebates. Um, if you're removing a wood fire heater, um, an additional re, um, rebate if you're removing a wood fire heater and putting a reverse cycle air system in. And, um, and, and, and those, um, depending on what you, do, what you put in, you'll get a different rebate. Also, the, um, the recently announced sustainable household scheme, which will will offer zero interest loans of between 2,000 and 15,000 to support eligible households with living more co comfortably will also provide mechanisms for people to replace their wood fire heaters. Mr Parton. Is the demand for wood fire heaters steadily increasing despite the measures that you've outlined? Ms. Bersarotti. Yeah, thank, um, thank the minister for the uh, thank, thank the member for the question. <laughs> Sorry, I almost gave you a promotion there. Yeah, uh, thank you for thank you for the question. Um, it, we have heard some reports that there is an increase in wood fire in wood fire heaters, and 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 certainly there might be a, a number of things driving this. The really good news is in relation to particularly new wood fire heaters, in terms of very string, stringent regulations, um, that there, this, there is a much more reduced um, impact on the environment and health if people are, are putting in a new wood fire heater. Um, but we will continue to work through a range of our um, education programs in terms of encouraging people to really look at more um, other, other forms of heating that are better for the environment and don't have the impact on health. Questions without notice? Mr Milligan. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Transport and City Services. Minister, in relation to light rail stage 2A construction, you said that it's going to mean a significant amount of congestion that our city probably hasn't, haven't seen before in its history. In another statement, you suggested that much of the traffic would be diverted from Commonwealth Avenue to Kings Avenue and Parks Way. Minister, how can you tell the public to use these roads when they are already particularly at a standstill in peak times already? Mr Steele. For his question, uh, well, Commonwealth Avenue, we've been very clear, will probably see a 80 per cent reduction in its use, and that's because people will choose to use other roads to get more quickly into the city. Uh, and Parks Way will be a major uh, one of those, as well as um, Kings Avenue as well. Uh, we're looking very closely at what uh, improvements could be made to Parks Way uh, as part of the work of the Disruption Task Force, as well as other uh, road improvements in the network to make sure that we can reduce um, travel times, uh, deal with the capacity issues. And we do expect there to be more vehicles uh, in peak times on those roads, and that's why we're looking at behaviour change as well. So spreading out the peaks, spreading out the volume of traffic using those roads so that we're not seeing everyone using them at exactly the same time. So as I've outlined uh, very comprehensively to this place, uh, that work is ongoing. We'll make further announcements uh, down the track, but in the longer term, we are looking at, at Parks Way very closely, and of course, with the federal government um, funding 50-50, um, we are looking at what future improvements need to be made to Parks Way generally as our city grows. It is a major east-west corridor in our city, and we want to make sure that it uh, can make sure that it has the capacity that is needed to carry a city of 500,000 plus in the future. Mr Milligan, you Thank have a you, Madam Speaker. Minister, what analysis led you to believe that Kings Avenue and Parks Way have the capacity to carry their share of 4,100 vehicles per hour that will be diverted from Commonwealth Avenue in peak times. Mr Steele. The traffic modelling that we've undertaken, a mesoscopic operational traffic model of the city and inner north uh, that we have looked very closely at 
uh, the volume of traffic that is likely to be on those roads. And now we're looking at what interventions and what measures we can put in place to help mitigate and minimise the disruptive effect on the traffic uh, network. And that is the work that is underway now. And I'll be announcing further measures about uh, what that will mean for the traffic network over the, coming work, over the coming months as we undertake the preparation and planning that is needed for this major infrastructure project which you have fought against now at two elections and have now tried to put it in jeopardy again over the last month. Members, can we stop the chit-chatter across the room? Mrs Jones. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'll change it better. Uh, Minister Steele, will you table the mesoscopic study that you referred to? I thank the member for her question. In the mesoscopic model, I have tabled the, uh, the results of that, that study, Madam Speaker, and uh, I table it again. Here it is. <laughs> On point of order, Madam Speaker, point of order, the Minister was asked if he would table the study in its entirety. He has not actually answered the question. Um, um, I'm giving Ms All the call for her question without notice. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education. Having just celebrated Early Learning Matters Week, can the Minister please outline the impact that early learning has on child development? Ms Berry. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I think I can speak for every parent who has uh, their children attending an early childhood centre. The impact that it has on every child uh, is outstanding. and. The early years of a, of a child's life are just so exciting. Every day learning something new, experiencing something new, imagining something new. And around 90% of brain development occurs in those first five years of life. Child development is driven by interactions with other people. High quality early childhood education plays a critical role in supporting children to learn. For children experiencing vulnerabilities or disadvantage, this education plays an even more significant role turning the curve on inequality. High quality early childhood education can have a substantial and sustained impact on a whole range of skills that are important for children's future, including improved social and emotional skills and a head start in developing literacy and numeracy skills. That's why, Madam Speaker, it was so important to spread the word during Early Learning Matters Week, which was last week, and to thank Baringa Early Learning Centre in my electorate of Ginandera for inviting me to celebrate this important week with them. Supplementary, Ms Orr. Minister, what is the ACT government doing to support early childhood education and care? Ms Berry. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Last year, I launched the ACT government's early childhood strategy, Set Up for Success. Set Up for Success was developed based on overwhelming international and national evidence on the importance of quality early childhood education, particularly for children experiencing vulnerability or disadvantage. The keystone initiative in Set Up for Success is the government's commitment to provide every three-year-old in Canberra access to one week, one day a week of free early learning by the end of this term of government. This will be a major step forwards to our goal of providing 15 hours a week of free quality early learning for three-year-olds. Already every four-year-old in Canberra has access to 15 hours a week of early childhood education under the National Partnership Agreement. And the ACT government has now funded 15 hours, it continues to fund 15 hours a week of early learning, which will be targeted to the three year olds who need it most. Supplementary, Dr. Patterson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, how is the government supporting early childhood educators? Ms. Berry. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, this is the most important part. We know that educators are absolute key to the high quality early learning provided in early childhood settings. This is recognised in the National Quality Framework, which acknowledges the importance of staffing arrangements in the provision of high quality early childhood education. The ACT Government's Early Childhood Degree Scholarship Program provides people working in early childhood education and care with financial assistance to get their degree qualification. The program provides up to 25,000 per scholarship, plus funding for providers to backfill the staff member. As part of the Set Up for Success strategy, the ACT government has established 16 communities of practice between ACT public schools and early childhood education and care services. These communities of practice are an opportunity for early childhood educators 
to share their expertise with public school teachers and improve outcomes for young people. The ACT government is also providing training for early childhood educators to support children who have experienced trauma through online modules and webinars. I look forward to continuing to implement the setup for success and I support every early childhood educator who gives every ch Canberra child in those services the best start in life. Questions without notice? Mrs Kickett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Transport and City Services. Minister, TCCS recently announced the imminent closure of two major parking areas in Civic, one on the corner of London Circuit and Constitution Avenue and another on Marcus Clark Street. We are told these will be lost for several years, further exacerbating the chaos you will soon impose on people who work in or who need access to Civic. Minister, how many parking spaces will be lost to Canberrans dependent on these for their livelihoods? Mr. Steele. Thank the member for her question. I'll take the um, exact detail on notice, but what I can say is that as we undertake this major infrastructure build, which is so important for the future of our city, there will be some disruption in relation to parking as we um, set up um, sites to site compounds um, ahead of the construction, starting uh, firstly with the utilities works, the early works, and then later with all of the other uh, bills. And there will be further site compounds uh, needed in the future on various parts of the route down to Woden uh, as well. The, the site compounds that are um, that you have particularly focused on on Marcus Clark Street and in the southwest corner uh, of the car park on London Circuit are only a, the one in the southwest corner is only part of the broader uh, surface car park. Um, over recent years, we have seen a significant number of um, car parks come online in Civic, and that actually has resulted, together with other circumstances like people working from home, in there being actually quite a large number of car parks in Civic at this present time. So we think that the current number of car parks that we have in Civic, both public and private, uh, can manage um, the demand for parking uh, appropriately while we undertake uh, this major work. But of course, we'll be continuing to monitor uh, the effects on parking. Uh, and these two site compounds are critical for us being able to get on and, we build, and build this important project. Mrs Kickett, supplementary. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, given that parking in Civic is already full, where are you expecting people to park after these closures and will you table the whole mesoscopic study you have referred to earlier? Mr Steele. I thank the member for her multiple questions. Uh, in relation to the, the, um, the, the parking issues, I reject the premise of the question I've just said. We expect that there is capacity um, for parking in Civic, uh, regardless of what is taken in relation to the site um, compounds, uh, and so people can find other parking uh, else, elsewhere may mean they have to park in a slightly uh, different location, uh, for example. And I've already just tabled the outcomes of the mesoscopic model that I mentioned, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, why will you not table the entire mesoscopic study referred to earlier in question time? Mr. Steele. Well, I thank the member for his question, and um, of course, we'll continue to be undertaking various different modelling throughout the process that Disruption Task Force is in, engaged in and looking at how we can best minimise the disruption as we build this incredibly important infrastructure project for our city to better connect uh, Canberra's yeah. south uh, with the city the centre yes. uh, to deliver yeah. better. Yeah. Please, Mr. On relevance, the minister was asked a very simple question, and he has not at all answered it at all yet. And it was whether he would, why would he not table, not what other work is going to be undertaken or is currently being undertaken. What is, what, what is the reason why he will not table it? Madam no, Speaker, I've already, un, already tabled the outcome of that model. No, yes. Thank you. On relevance and on the Minister's response, this is absolutely disgraceful that he will yes. treat the Chamber like this. Yes. We have asked a very straightforward question and he refuses to even entertain the question. That is not what the standing orders ask him to do. Madam Speaker, on the point of, but I, I'm happy to continue answering the question if, if you like, rather than just sitting down. Um, this is a complex operational traffic model. And to, to, to the points of order, um, I believe he's on track. And if you're going to raise behaviour of members in this chamber, I'd look to your colleagues very closely, Mrs Jones, to talk about what's acceptable and what's not. Madam Speaker, on your feedback, thank you very much for it. 
Nonetheless, commentary across the chamber is one thing, but I actually think it's a really serious matter if he will not answer the question in any way, refuses to actually make the explanation of why. Okay. Well, the, minute, the speaker can also pause well, the Madam clock. Speaker, in closing, with 16 seconds to go, um, this is a complex operational traffic model and uh, it does change depending on what the inputs are and the, and the assumptions around the model, but I have tabled the, um, the modelling that we've undertaken uh, based on the assumptions that we've um, provided, but there will be ongoing work, Madam Speaker. Questions without notice. Ms Kessley. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Transport and City Services. Minister, in relation to light rail stage 2A construction impacts, you recently said the disruption task force would, among other things, focus on minimising the impact of construction on business. Minister, what risk assessments did you undertake in relation to the impact of four years of construction activity on businesses in affected areas of civic, and will you table those assessments? Mr Steele. I thank the member for her question, and we're continuing to uh, work with business to um, understand uh, what their needs are during the build, and of course we'll work with them as we get a better understanding of the uh, construction program once we've got a, a delivery partner on board for the various um, parts of the project. We, of course, started to engage early, and it was one of the learnings from stage one of uh, the light rail project to engage uh, at a much earlier time to understand the extent of the businesses and other organisations that go beyond business uh, on the light rail stage two a alignment, uh, who they were, um, and to start engaging with them through a variety of different channels, uh, regular updates um, provided by email, uh, engagement face-to-face. -face. We've had several pop-up sessions, including um, just in the past um, month. Um, with them, I've been meeting with the business representatives, um, uh, including the, uh, the chamber, as well as um, women in business. Procedures. And they are represented also on the, um, the stakeholder reference group for the um, project, which will feed into the project as we go through the construction period. Uh, we undertook an assessment of light rail stage uh, one, which looked at the learnings um, for business. And what we heard from business is that they want early and clear communication so that they have certainty to plan for um, what's going to happen during the construction um, period. Um, it is going to be a disruptive um, process for businesses, particularly on the western side of London Circuit, that operate there. Uh, but the, of course the flow-on effects with the traffic disruption um, could affect broader sets of business, so we're engaging more broadly with the community and the business community uh, on those, um, and we'll have more to say on that as we progress with the project. Uh, and the Project um, Disruption Task Force work. So we know that this is a critical part of work and the partnerships that will need to uh, be formed going through this process are going to be critical so that uh, business has the information that they need to be able to get through this challenging period. Time has expired and you get your supplementary, Ms Kathleen. Madam Speaker, why have you only engaged with the business community rather than engage in detailed risk assessments early? Mr Steele. Well, I think the member for her question, in fact, we are actually, we are actually taking a range of different assessments in, in relation to this project uh, and how we engage uh, with business and we'll be uh, conducting survey work with business. We've been talking with them face to face about uh, what they'd like to see uh, during the project and we'll be taking that on board as we uh, go through this uh, project build and it's something that will benefit the businesses along the route as well, Madam Speaker, and that's um, very clear. Um, this is going to be a project that will provide better public transport access to the western side of London Circuit, where predominantly the businesses operate. Um, it probably won't have as great an impact in some senses as the Gungarland project, which um, was right in the middle of the, the business centre. Um, but it is going to provide a significant benefit for uh, business in the long term, and we want to make sure that they can actually harness those benefits as part of this process as well. Uh, Mr Kane. Uh, Minister, what compensation will you provide for businesses that are forced to close and for people losing their jobs as a consequence of several years' disruption? Mr Steele. I thank the member for his question. and um, it, It's pretty unusual to provide direct compensation for uh, businesses to, while we're undertaking major public infrastructure work that is going to benefit the city and benefit businesses. Uh, we're getting on uh, with the work that we need to to engage with businesses and what we've heard from them is that they want clear information early so that they can make better decisions and that was a key learning from stage one and that's what we'll be doing, engaging uh, with them over the coming uh, weeks and months, Madam Speaker. 
Mr Kane. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Transport and City Services. Minister, you recently announced that during the construction of light rail stage 2A, there will be considerable disruption to traffic flow around Civic due to works to raise London Circuit. Minister, when did your government first become aware of the extent of traffic disruption that stage 2A would cause in Civic and its approaches? Mr Steele. Well, I thank the member for his question. And of course, we are aware that a major infrastructure project is going to create a disruption. I mean, we've just built light rail stage one, a significant infrastructure project that had some quite significant disruptive effects. Uh, it involved a building in, in the middle of Gungahl and CBD. It involved major intersection uh, track being laid across major intersections along Northbourne Avenue. Um, but this is the first time we knew this when we made the decision that... Uh, Resume we'll be seat, Mr Steele, your point of order. My question, Madam Speaker, was specifically when did the government first become aware of the extent of traffic disruption? Well, I think the right. Minister's going to that detail, the, Mr Cain. There's no I've been clear that we always knew that this is going to be a disruptive process because you can't build a major infrastructure project without having some sort of impact on, um, on the road traffic network in, in case of light rail that runs on the road Harry, reserve. Um, so this of course is part of the planning and the work that we're doing um, around looking at the traffic modelling uh, has of course provided more specific um, numbers around that and, and we'll, it is ongoing in terms of what it will uh, look like once we put in place the interventions to minimise that the extent of disruption as well. But the reason that we're raising London Circuit and it's pretty obvious that this, this project would have a, have a major effect is because we want to raise London Circuit up to the same level of Commonwealth Avenue, not only to provide an access point from London Circuit onto Commonwealth Avenue for light rail so that it can get down to Woden, but also to provide much better access from the city to the southern part of the CBD and to the lake for pedestrians and cyclists so that there isn't a six metre high wall in the way that blocks access um, between key parts of the CBD. So, it, that is going to be a very disruptive part of the project, but it's a decision that we've made for the long-term benefit of the city, so that we've got a city that is walkable. Mr Kane. Uh, Minister, given the monumental scale of disruption to traffic flow, why did you not mention this until after the election? I mean, Mr Steele. Madam Speaker, it is very clear that these major infrastructure projects have uh, impacts, but the community also knows that they have very long-term benefits for the future of the city. And we've now brought this to two elections, two elections that you opposed it. And now it seems that the Liberals want to oppose it again, based on an obvious premise that this is going to have a disruptive effect. But at every stage, we'll try and minimise and mitigate that disruption uh, during the infrastructure bill. We'll work with the, the infrastructure delivery partners to make sure that the way that they design their program mitigates as much as possible the impact on our a traffic network. We don't want to see people uh, sitting in gridlock and that's why we're undertaking the measures that I've announced around infrastructure improvements, around behaviour change, better public transport and active travel options so that we can give Canberrans choices and opportunities to get into work as fast as possible and keep the city moving while we build this important infrastructure project that will benefit Canberrans for generations to come. Ms Casterly. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, why are you imposing years of massive disruptions all for the sake of making commuter times from Woden almost 50 per cent slower? I Mr. reject the, the premise of the question, Madam Speaker. And it's, it's really disappointing, Madam Speaker, um, to hear this from Ms Casterly, because this is a project that is going to benefit Gungahlin residents. It is a Gungahlin to Deakin project. It is a Dixon to Deakin project, Madam Speaker. Dixon to Woden, whichever way you cut it, this is an extension of the line from the north to the south. It's going to provide a mass transit line. Four times the number of people can fit on a light rail vehicle compared to a bus. And this, for the first time, will open up public transport stops between Woden and the city that do not exist up until Albert Hall. There is no way to get on a bus between, between those points or to get in. Uh, on State Circle to access the Parliamentary Triangle and the employment hubs there, to access the Deakin 
Employment Hub. This will provide a mass transit system for our growing city, an integrated tr transit system with our bus system uh, serving the suburbs. This is the significant future-focused investment that our government has taken to the last two elections and has been backed in by the community. Bitterly fought elections where you fought every step of the way against these projects and they rejected your view of the world because you don't stand up for your own communities in Gungahlin, in Woden, Mrs Jones. We're getting on with the job of providing better public transport, more environmentally friendly transport, a more vibrant city. We're going to build light rail and create over 6,000 jobs that you would not do if you were in government, Madam Speaker. Members, Mr Braddock, question without notice. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is for the Minister for Justice Health. Minister, with the recent lockdown of Goldwyn Prison, I'd be interested in what the ACT government has doing to ensure that the people in high-risk environments such as the Alexander McConaughey Centre are protected from COVID. Ms Davidson. Uh, I thank Mr Braddock for the question. Uh, Justice Health Services has been working quite closely with Canberra Health Services vaccination coordination team and also with ACT Corrective Services to facilitate a rollout of vaccinations at the AMC. So it's very important that we make sure that people who are most at risk in our community have access to vaccines. Uh, the vaccines uh, rollout at the AMC commenced on the 1st of June of this year. Um, as part of stage 1B of the COVID-19 vaccination rollout. Um, and as of the 27th of July, 55% of people in the AMC are fully vaccinated against COVID-19 and a slightly higher percentage have had their first dose. Um, ongoing COVID-19 vaccination clinics are being conducted each fortnight to vaccinate uh, new people who are coming into the AMC. Uh, and uh, when people are released, if that happens prior to receiving their second dose, they're being provided with information about where they can get their second dose of the vaccine. Um, so we can make sure that they are able to uh, make sure that their health needs are covered. Um, people who are in the AMC are invited to uh, have a vaccine. They can choose not to have it. Uh, but so far, people uh, in the AMC have been very appreciative of having the ability to be vaccinated. Mr Brodick. Minister, could you please provide an update on the vaccinations for First Nations people who are detained in the AMC? Ms Davidson. Uh, yes. So people in the AMC who access their primary health services through Winunga Nimitija Aboriginal Health Service are also included in the vaccine rollout and they're able to access their vaccination uh, while they're at the AMC through Winunga. Um, having personally uh, talked to the clinical uh, staff at both Justice Health and Winunga, uh, the staff there have really appreciated being able to provide this level of care to people who are in the AMC. Uh, they're very, uh, very appreciative of being able to get access to the vaccines and make sure that people at risk are protected. Uh, and I want to thank Justice Health and Winunga for doing all that they can to make sure that people are offered the opportunity to be vaccinated while they're there. Mr Davis. Minister, when will the vaccine rollout in the AMC be completed? Ah, Mr Davidson. <coughs> yes. Uh, so the initial rollout was completed, uh, the first round was completed on the 9th of June, uh, which was only eight days after it started. Um, and the second round of vaccinations commenced on the 29th of June. Because people do come and go from the AMC, people are released and, and new people come in, that's why it's important that Justice Health are able to run those fortnightly clinics so that new people coming in are able to receive their first vaccination. And also why it's so important that if people are released before they have time to have a second vaccination, that they're connected up with health services in the community. Um, and one of the great things about Winunga is that people who are in the AMC can continue to see Winunga for their ongoing health care after they're released, which is great for continuity of care and something quite special within Australia that we have that service available to people in Canberra's AMC. Questions without notice. Dr Patterson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Transport and City Services. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Minister, how is the ACT government providing community space for Malonglo Valley's growing population? 
Mr Steele. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Dr Patterson for a question. I'm pleased to outline how our government is continuing to invest in new community facilities across our city. And community facilities do provide essential social infrastructure for new suburbs and regions and ensure that these places grow to become strong and connected communities. And this is precisely why we are focusing investment in Canberra's newest region, the Belonglo Valley. As I outlined in a response to the ministerial statement earlier this week, the Mongolo Valley has grown from around 27 residents in 2011 at uh, the census to 4,500 residents in the 2016 census and approximately 10,000 residents today. And we'll get a better number hopefully next year once the census uh, is released. Our government is making the essential investments now that are needed in anticipation of future population growth. And Recently, I was very pleased to announce that the government will provide 300 metres squared of space at the Coombs Community Activity Centre for use by residents of the Molonglo Valley in Wright, Coombs and Denman Prospect, as well as the future Molonglo suburbs. Located on Woodbury Avenue, this space will be a hub for recreational, educational, artistic, social and cultural activities and will be one of the main community spaces in Molonglo while other facilities become established. We're pleased to have identified this opportunity to provide a temporary facility ahead of construction of purpose-built facilities in the future. Madam Speaker. Supplementary. Minister, what are the next steps to make this space available to the community? Mr Steele. As I alluded to in my previous answer, the space will be adaptable to cater for a wide range of community activities and services. And as the government became aware of the possibility of leasing this facility, we engaged with the Mongolo Community Forum. And as it was then known, uh, before it became a community council, to gauge what community groups would like to, uh, how they'd like to use the new centre, when they'd like to use the centre, the types of programs and activities uh, they'd like to use it for. And I thank the forum for running that expression of interest process, which received feedback from a large number and variety of groups. And it's good news for those community groups because the Community Activity Centre will allow for up to 100 people to meet in a flexible space. And over the coming months, the ACT government will undertake a fit out of the space to make it ready for community use in early 2022. And while this fit out is occurring, the government will be, express will be seeking expressions of interest for a community organisation to act as the venue manager and organise bookings for the new space as well. I look forward to keeping the Assembly updated as this important community facility progresses, which will be available over the next five years for the community to use. Mr Pedersen. Uh, Minister, what other plans are there for community spaces in the Mwanglu Valley? Mr Steele. Mr Pedersen for his supplementary. And in addition to the two local public schools, which are available for community use, um, there are five community centres that have either been built or under construction or being planned for Canberra's newest region. In addition to the Coombs Community Activity Centre, our government has just proposed that a new community centre be built and handed back as part of the Coombs and Wright Village on Fred Daly Avenue. This would be a government-owned facility that can be made available to the community once construction is complete. In Denman Prospect, the Denman Village Community Centre is well under construction and will soon be complete, I understand, it, sometime around March next year. This centre will provide a purpose-built space for community groups to be managed by communities at work and will include an early childhood education and care service as well. And as ACT Labor promised at the election, we'll also build a new library and community centre at the future Malongolo Commercial Centre and we'll undertake a community co-design process to get an understanding of what they'd like to see as part of that facility. And lastly, Madam Speaker, Stromlo Cottage has played an important role as a local hub for the Valley's first residents currently undergoing some maintenance works and so that it can accommodate even more community groups, which is the fifth community centre that I've uh, listed. So there's going to be certainly lots of spaces in the future for the residents of the Molonglo Valley as they seek to build a vibrant community in their new homes. Mr Barr. Pay more attention, Madam Speaker. During the end of question time, I'm happy to ask that all further questions be placed on the notice paper. Thank you, Mr Barr. So are there matters arising from question time? Mr Hanson? Uh, Madam Speaker, in accordance with Standing Order 213A, I seek leave to move a motion ordering that Mr Steele table the full mesoscopic study by close of business today. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, for those who are unaware of this Standing Order 213A, uh, if there is a document that is uh, referred to in the Assembly, 
and as it has been by Mr Steele, which is the mesoscopic transport study, uh, there's an ability for a process whereby a motion is moved. Uh, now, have I moved the motion, Madam Speaker? Do I need to do that, or have I just got to leave? You I'll move the motion. I move the motion uh, in accordance with 213A, seeking uh, that uh, Mr Steele table the full mesoscopic study by close of business today. And I would ask that that is circulated to members as well, but we'll take it as moved at the moment, sure. members. And so the question is that that motion be agreed. Mr Hanson, I think he's still on his feet. Mr Hanson? Yeah, I've moved the motion. I'm, okay, yep. you're finished. Uh, so, uh, as members, uh, if they refer to the standing orders, there is a, um, a process whereby if the Assembly uh, supports a motion that a document be tabled, that that be tabled uh, to, the, to the clerk, uh, should the Chief Minister believe that there is privilege attached to that document, uh, it'd be cabinet and conference and so on. He can uh, make that case. Uh, and there's a process that then unfolds where that can be contested and an independent legal arbiter be uh, appointed by the clerk to make that assessment. So there is a process that follows. Uh, the reason that I'm asking for this document is that this is a very important issue for our community, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, the government touts this as the uh, most significant infrastructure project in the history of the ACT. It'll be many billions of dollars to do this. Uh, and as the government has outlined already, uh, there are going to be some significant disruptions caused by this project in terms of closed car parks uh, and then a significantly constrained uh, routes. Could I seek uh, your uh, guidance. If Mr Hanson's motion is in accordance with the standing orders, particularly listing the time for production, given that Standing Order 213A6 provides 14 days to claim privilege? Yes, but I think what we're doing is moving the motion. Descend depends on the Assembly's response to the motion. What actions then follows? If yeah, that's correct, Madam Speaker, my understanding is that if my motion is supported, uh, then Mr Steele uh, could put that document forward. But if the Chief Minister believes that there is uh, privilege attached, he would then make that case and then there's a process that unfolds. So the first decision is for this Assembly either to support the motion or not. If it does, then that process follows where the Chief Minister would say there's privilege or not, it's up to him. Uh, and if a member would dispute that, then, then that, at that point there's an arbiter uh, appointed. So the question is whether we think we should see the document first, I suppose, is, is the point, and then we would look at whether there is privilege and so on. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I've said the end of business today, uh, but members, I'm, I'm, I just want the document, and if, if you're saying we'll give you the document if you give us a specific period, I'd be very happy for that to be delayed. The, by the end of business today is less important to me. but. The reason that we want it is this is an issue of great significance and you've told us that. We all understand that. And this isn't just short term. This is going to go on for many, many years. Uh, and when we asked for it in question time today, Mr Steele tabled what he said was the summary, which from what I could see was a single piece of A4 paper, half of which was a picture. Uh, now, if we're talking about detailed transport studies, uh, I think it's reasonable if the opposition is going to be able to do its job and if the people in the community who have great interest are able to look at this, uh, that they, um, they can do so with all the information for them. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, I don't think there should be anything to hide. There shouldn't be anything to hide, but should the Chief Minister think at some stage that there are privilege, there is privilege attached to this document, there is a process that unfolds. So I won't, I won't go further than that, other than I, I, I think it's in the interest of the government to be as open as it can in these matters. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, look, there's obviously a number of issues that have been raised that are problematic with the wording of Mr Hanson's motion in terms of the uh, claim of privilege and otherwise. So I would suggest, and I will move that we adjourn to a later hour this day so that a correctly worded motion could be put before the Assembly. The government will then consider, uh, but it's quite likely that would, would, 
uh, that we claim privilege on this matter, but I will uh, I will need to take some advice on that. And in accordance with the standing order that was written for this very reason, there is a time frame. So. Uh, I think the uh, a, a preferential approach for Mr. Hansen would be to uh, to remove the by close of business today element and simply call for the tabling. That would then uh, trigger the standing order in its uh, in its entirety because it will not be tabled today. Uh, given I will take advice uh, and and would would then seek uh, most likely seek to claim that executive privilege uh, as has been the case before. But in order to ensure that this can be dealt with in a uh, uh, in a more appropriate manner, that's not making it up on the run with handwritten motions. Uh, I move. I move. I move that the debate. I move that the debate be adjourned to a later hour this day, Madam Speaker. So the question is that the debate be adjourned until a later hour this day. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. So it will come back at a later hour today. Are there other matters arising from question time, members? No, we'll move through to papers. And Mrs Jones, I'm calling Mr Gentleman. Mr Speaker, pursuant to Standing Order 211, I present papers in accordance with the schedule circulated. Thank you. Mr Gentleman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Pursuant to Standing Order 211, I move that the Assembly take note of the Government's response to the Auditor General's Report No. 4, 2021, entitled AC Government's Vehicle Emissions Reduction Activities. The question is that that motion be agreed, and I'll call Mr Rattenbury. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm pleased to table the Government's response to the Auditor General's Report on Vehicle Emissions Reduction Activities. I can confirm today that the Government has accepted all five recommendations in this audit report. I would like to thank the Auditor General for the in-depth review of the progress of these policies, and I am grateful for the opportunity to respond to the findings and recommendations of this report. This audit report has come at a critical point where transport is overtaking electricity as the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the Territory. The transport sector currently represents around 60 per cent of total ACT emissions. As we know, climate change is one of the greatest challenges that our community faces. That's why we're prioritising the shift to zero emissions transport, including active travel and zero emissions vehicles. The audit report highlights government actions to address emissions reduction in the transport sector, including the, transport of, sorry, the transition of government fleets to zero emissions technologies, noting the complexity of this technology transition, the introduction of hydrogen vehicles into the ACT government fleet, the establishment of effective governance arrangements and collaboration between different functions of government to deliver zero emissions transport actions, and the adoption of e-scooter and e-bike schemes in Canberra. The audit report notes the significant progress to date and provides five recommendations to improve and accelerate the ACT's transition to a zero emissions transport sector. I would like to take this opportunity to outline our achievements, detail the recommendations, and highlight the work that government is undertaking to address them. When it comes to the achievements, the government for government fleet, since 2018, we have made great progress in transitioning our government passenger vehicle fleet to zero emission vehicles. We now have one of the largest passenger zero emission vehicle fleets in Australia, with 165 vehicles, which is 28 per cent of our total fleet of 597 vehicles. To power these cars, we have 108 charging stations at government sites, and we are also now looking at how to shift to zero emissions heavy vehicles, including emergency vehicles and waste collection trucks. When it comes to incentives, we have among the most generous incentives for zero emission vehicles in Australia. We have introduced two years of free registration, as well as continuing the stamp duty exemption for zero emission vehicles. We will soon introduce zero interest $15,000 loans for zero emission vehicle purchases through phase two of the sustainable household scheme. We now have over 1,200 battery electric vehicles registered in the ACT, a 25 per cent increase since the free registration came into effect just a few months ago on the 24th of May. It's great to see so many Canberrans embracing the electric vehicle future. With regards to charging stations, we have allocated $2.7 million to install 50 public charging stations across Canberra. Work is underway to develop a public charging master plan to support a strategic rollout of charging infrastructure. 
This will inform the location of the 50 publicly accessible charging stations, as well as future locations for public charging stations. The recommendations of the Audit Report provide useful strategic input to help us build on these successes to improve and continue to lead. The Government has agreed to all the recommendations and work is underway to implement measures in response. Recommendation 1. Firstly, the Audit Report recommends that program design and delivery be improved by reviewing the program logic for each action, defining expectations of future uptake of zero emission vehicles, and ensuring good monitoring and evaluation of progress. The Government is currently reviewing the program logic and outcomes of our actions to date. The results of this review will be integrated into my annual report under the Climate Change and Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act 2010, which I will provide to the Assembly at the end of this calendar year. The second re recommendation in the audit report highlights the importance of cross-agency collaboration and recommends strengthening processes around securing senior management authorisation, maintaining version control and sharing plans with relevant stakeholders. With the creation of the Office for Climate Action, we now have high-level, agreed whole-of-government coordinating mechanism to support effective implementation of a range of activities, including uptake of zero emissions vehicles. These processes include cross-directorate working groups, as well as ministerial processes to promote information sharing and joint achievement of objectives. The third recommendation of the audit report is to review government vehicle fleet usage patterns, key barriers to uptake, and identify the lessons learned from the Dixon and Civic Charging Infrastructure Projects. In response to the recommendations, the government is establishing a monitoring and evaluation framework for current and future zero emissions vehicle measures. A review of the fleet transition will be included in this framework. As I have outlined, government has achieved a rapid adoption of zero emissions vehicles in its own fleet. The rollout of both vehicles and charging infrastructure is progressing, and we will continue to explore zero emissions alternatives for a range of vehicle types. Our experience in this fleet transition, including challenges in installing supporting infrastructure, have provided important insights. Being a leader is not always easy, but it is always instructive. We are sharing this knowledge with other governments and with businesses through our fleet advisory service so that others can learn from our experience for a smoother community-wide transmission. With regard to recommendation four, the report also sought further information on the ongoing progress of fleet transition. In response, work is underway to develop an online dashboard that will publish up-to-date information on the ACT government and ACT-wide fleet transition. The dashboard will be published by the, on the Environment, Planning and Sustainable Development Directorate website. As part of our parliamentary and governing agreement, the Government is also already pursuing important new steps in zero emissions vehicle uptake. These include the development of a public charging master plan and a 2030 zero emission vehicle sales target. The Government will identify the next opportunities to target in our future policy based on evaluation of the experience to date and analysis of the impact of these measures. The final recommendation, number five, recommends improving adherence to fleet policy across the directorates. Adherence across government is critical for ensuring that we continue to demonstrate leadership in our community through the rapid uptake of zero emissions te vehicle technology. In response to this recommendation, we are developing an agreed authorisation process that will be applied across directorates. The new process will require Director General authorisation for leases of internal combustion engine passenger vehicles where a zero emissions vehicle model is available and is fit for purpose. I am happy to confirm today that many vehicles from the government's fleet first generation of zero emission vehicles have now moved into the second hand market and have been purchased by members of our community. The leadership of government in adopting zero emissions vehicle fleet will play an important role in developing a second hand market for all zero emissions vehicles in the Territory. Lower cost second hand vehicles will open the opportunity to save on fuel bills to more members of our community. Government is further supporting the development of a second hand zero emissions vehicle market by extending the registration waiver scheme to these vehicles. Uh, Mr Assistant Speaker, the transition to a zero emissions transport system is a massive task. Uptake of zero emission vehicles will be a vital element to achieve our net zero emissions target. In releasing its audit report, the ACT Audit Office stated that ACT government agencies have, for the most part, effectively implemented the government's zero emissions vehicle commitments. We have achieved a lot, 
But of course, there is always room for improvement and we welcome the audit officer's recommendations on how we can continuously improve. We continue to demonstrate leadership to the rest of Australia and indeed the world. The learnings from our journey, even where we might have done better, mean we are better prepared for the future. I look forward to the next phase in our journey to decarbonise the transport sector and am confident that the opportunities highlighted by the audit report set us up for strong future vehicle emissions reduction policy. Uh, Mr Assistant Speaker, I commend the Government response to the ACT audit report on vehicles emission reduction activities to the Assembly. Thank you, Minister Rattenbury. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I declare the ayes have it. I call Minister Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. Pursuant to Standing Order 211, I move that the Assembly take note of the um, exercise of call-in powers, development application 202138534, Block 1, Section 58, Garan. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Minister Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. Uh, on the 23rd of June 2021, in my capacity as Minister for Planning and Land Management, and using my powers under Section 158 of the Planning and Development Act 2007, I directed the Planning and Land Authority to refer development application number 202138534 to me. The development application sought approval for construction of a new nine-storey critical health services building, closure and reconfiguration of Hospital Road, reconfiguration of the existing emergency drop-off, construction of an at-grade car parking, uh, bridge and tunnel connections to the existing hospital building, erection of signage, basement loading dock, satellite port and plant room, driveways, new helipad facilities on roof, landscaping and associated works at Block 1, Section 58, Garan. On the 5th of August 2021, or today, I approved the application with conditions under Section 162 of the Planning and Development Act 2007, using my ministerial call-in powers. In deciding the application, I gave careful consideration to the requirements of the Territory <coughs> Plan, advice of the Transport, Canberra and City Services, Icon Water, Evo Energy, the Environment Protection Authority, the Conservator of Flora and Fauna, the ACT Emergency Services Agency and other entities and agencies as required by the legislation and the Planning and Land Authority. I also gave consideration to the representations received by the Planning and Land Authority during the public notification period for the development application that occurred between 5 May 2021 and 18 June 2021. I've imposed firm conditions on the approval of the development application that require, among other things, revision of the Hospital Road North, public and staff car parking, environmental assessment, lighting, wayfinding and signage. Mr Assistant Speaker, the Planning and Development Act 2007 provides specific criteria in relation to the exercise of my calling powers. And I've used my calling powers in this instance because I consider the proposal to provide a substantial public health benefit, particularly by delivering additional critical health care services and supporting the delivery of high quality clinical services to Canberra and the surrounding regions. In particular, this development will deliver more operating rooms, treatment spaces, intensive care beds and significant expansion uh, of the capacity of the Canberra Hospital. The extension will provide state-of-the-art facilities for medical practices, teaching, training and research, and improve safety, health outcomes and operational efficiency. The provision of this development will enable an increased capacity across Canberra Hospital's adult intensive care, paediatric care, coronary care, surgical and emergency services. The new building has been carefully planned to ensure health services can be delivered to a contemporary world-class standards. The well-considered design of this development will also improve wayfinding, arrival experiences and has allowed for the building to be adapted and expanded into the future. The architecture, landscape and interior design of the expansion aims to create an environment which nurtures and fosters a wellness culture and community. The use of my ability to call in this development application will help ensure the delivery of the Canberra Hospital expansion stays on schedule. Section 1612 of the Planning and Development Act 2007 specifies that if I decide an application, I must table a statement in the Legislative Assembly no later than three sitting days after the day of the decision. So, Mr Assistant Speaker, as required by the Act and for the benefit of the members, I table a statement providing a description of the development, details of the land on where the development is proposed to take place, 
the name of the applicant, details of my decision for the application, reasons for the decision and community consultation undertaken by the proponent. Uh, the statement also includes a copy of the notice of decision. Thank you, Minister. Gentlemen, the question is that the motion be agreed to. Minister Stephen Smith. Thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. And I just want to speak briefly on the Canberra Hospital expansion as well, which of course is on track and on budget for delivery in 2024. And this approval of the project today ensures that Canberrans will indeed get access to these new facilities uh, and more capacity as soon as possible. The Canberra Hospital expansion, of course, is the result of careful planning and extensive consultation with the Canberra community over many, many months. There have been ongoing design discussions with consumers, with local residents, and, and the third round of clinical user group consultations has already commenced, and that builds on more than 250 separate user group workshops with clinicians that have already been completed. Between December 2020 and March 2021, design, de uh, detailed designs on the new building were released as part of the pre-DA consultation process, and those were in themselves the culmination of more than 12 months of consultation with hospital staff, consumers, users, hospital users, families, carers, and the general public, including the local community uh, around Garen, um, including the Garen Primary School. Mr Assistant Speaker, this is truly a project for all Canberrans and indeed those in the surrounding region as well. And over the coming months, we will continue to consult with hospital staff, with consumers and with the local community on the further details of the design, which I look forward to sharing with the community and with the members of the Assembly. The increased capacity and fit-for-purpose facilities this project will deliver will really genuinely transform critical health care for Canberrans and for patients coming in from the surrounding regions. Uh, as I've said earlier today, early works to prepare the site are underway and many of those works across the campus have been completed with the construction and ref new buildings and refurbishment of wards and spaces across the campus. So while the, uh, critical care, the critical services building forms the centrepiece of the Canberra Hospital expansion and modernisation program, the work to modernise the facilities across the campus uh, will continue uh, and we will continue to consult consumers uh, and clinicians and the broader community about that, as we are also doing through the Canberra Hospital Master Plan. So, Mr Assistant Speaker, this is another important milestone in the biggest investment in health infrastructure since self-government. I welcome Minister Gentleman's announcement and I look forward to continuing to get on with this project. Thank you, Minister Stephen Smith. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. Private members business notice number one. I call Mr Hanson. Uh, thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. And I present the bail amendment bill uh, 2021 together with its explanatory statement. And I move that this bill be agreed to in principle. The question now is that this bill be agreed to in my mistake, the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Bail Act 1992. The question now is that this bill be agreed no, to no, in no. principle. No. Of course he does. Mr Hanson. Uh, Mr and Speaker, I move that this bill be agreed to in principle. Third time's a charm. The question now is that the bill be agreed to in principle. Mr Hanson. Thanks, Mr Assistant Speaker. And let me start uh, today with a quote. The quote is, I'd like to raise my concerns as the Shadow Minister for Police about the difficult job our police force have to do. They are the ones who have to enforce the law. They are the ones who have to go out there and do the hard graft to keep us safe. They feel enormous frustration. I know this from anecdotal conversations with our police, with this government and the revolving door of bail. They do the hard work, they arrest the criminals, they put them before the courts, and they get flicked out again on bail repeatedly, and they find themselves again committing a crime. Now, Mr Assistant Speaker, those words, ones that I uttered in this place nearly a decade ago during a debate on bail. And that motion in 2012 from the opposition called on the government of the time, this Labor government, to report on the number of people who were remanded in custody and subsequently acquitted, granted bail and failed to comply with their bail conditions, 
and granted bail who committed further offence whilst on bail. I also called on the government to show how they were going to protect the public from those who further reoffended whilst on bail. And from that day until this, this government has not been able to answer those questions. They are perfectly reasonable questions that a government, any government, should know. For years, Mr Assistant Speaker, we have been asking, through motions in this place, through estimate committee hearings, through assembly committee inquiries, we have been asking over and over again to address this issue. Over and again, we have been told, oh, it can't be done, that it's too difficult, the system isn't ready yet. And it's not good enough that this government can't tell us who has committed offences whilst on bail or the nature of those offences. In 2016, an assembly committee was established that looked at bail laws in the ACT, and its conclusions were, and I quote, that the ACT government conduct a review of the arrangement for bail in the ACT and introduce in the Legislative Assembly amendments to the Bail Act 1992, which, if passed, would introduce a focus on risk management with reasonable and proportionate bail conditions. Recommendation 43 of that inquiry called for a review into bail laws, and the government did not agree to conduct that review. This was, to say the least, frustrating. And as we say from time at the time, this is not a knee-jerk reaction in terms of one incident. This is not political point scoring. And I hate to think that we will be back in this place in six months' time, six years' time, whenever it may be, doing something following a tragic incident when some crime has been committed by someone on bail that could have otherwise been prevented. If that is the case, then we can reflect well on today and see what action we took as an assembly to keep the people of the ACT safe. That's what I said years ago. And here we are, years later, as predicted, and we should reflect on the failure of this place to act on that day. We should reflect on what has occurred and what may have been prevented, Mr Assistant Speaker. We should consider whether we've done everything that is possible to achieve what Bill Shorten once called the most important job of any government, the safety of our people. And it's clear that this government has not, but today the Canberra Liberals will do something. I present today the Bail Amendment Bill and explanatory statement. And whilst this bill is not a complete review of the bail system that is needed, uh, and the reform that we've been calling for, it does do an important thing. It helps protect our frontline community service workers. It offers some protection to our first responders, especially our police, but also the AMBOs, the FIREs, corrections officers, emergency services workers, and the protection that if a person is charged with assaulting one of our frontline workers, they'll not automatically get bail, Mr Assistant Speaker. The bill achieves this with one line. It adds the crime of assaulting frontline community service providers to the list of offences where there is no presumption for bail. It's a simple change, but with a serious consequence. Bail is not guaranteed if you commit that crime. It also sends a profound and important message to our essential workers. If someone attacks you, we've got your back. I accept the fact that as this bill extends the list of offences to which the presumption for bail does not apply, it does have human rights implications, but I've addressed those in the explanatory statement accompanying the bill. The amendment, amendment does not remove the ability to be granted bail completely, but it does remove the presumption that bail will be granted. It does not go so far as to place the offence in the category where there is a presumption against bail, such as the case for murder, or very serious drugs charges in section 9C of the Bail Act. Most importantly, this amendment recognises that just as there are rights of liberty for the accused, there is a right for our frontline workers and our police to be safe. And that is why we are tabling this bill today. It's a right that we've staunchly argued over many years. It's a right that our police are now demanding to be protected, and it's a right recognised by this quote. The most important job of every government is the safety of our people. I know that bail laws are different in every state, but what Australians in every state cannot understand is that when offenders have done horrific things, when the red light should be flashing, they are out and they are on bail. And that was from Bill Shorten, when he was leader of the Federal Labor Party, 
in a speech that he gave as part of the condolence motion for the tragic events in Bourke Street in Melbourne some years ago. The AFPA uh, have recently asked a series of questions in a public statement. Should bail procedures better protect first responders in the ACT? Should the commission of alleged violent crimes preclude bail being granted? Does the ACT government have more of an obligation to protect the employees it contracts from the AFP to police in Canberra? We think so, and have already started calling on Australia's elected representatives to pick up their feet with regards to looking after police. We agree with the AFPA, and today we are acting. And I recognise Mr Troy Roberts from the AFPA, who's here in the gallery today, and I also recognise the work that the AFPA does as an organisation in representing its members and the advocacy that it provides on their behalf uh, to governments and to oppositions, and I commend them for it. And at this point, I'd also like to acknowledge the presence in the gallery today of Jason Taylor. Uh, Jason's story makes these points from lived experience, and I'd like to share some of his own words. I'm an ordinary person. I used to be an Australian Federal Police Officer and ACT Policing Officer. I graduated from the AFP College in 2007 and commenced with ACT Policing, where I've spent my entire 13-year career serving the Canberra community in several roles. Whilst it was a difficult job at times, I loved what I did. I've been lucky to have an amazing career as a police officer. I was a designated detective and I was a sergeant. My life changed on the 31st of January 2020, when I was cowardly and viciously assaulted whilst on duty. I've relived that incident and that terrifying moment when I knew I wasn't going to get off the ground again, over and over again for 14 months. It won't leave me. It hurt me then, physically, but it hurts now so much more psychologically. Thankfully, my colleagues acted swiftly, with courage. They did what they needed to do to get the offender off me and save my life. Since the 31st of January 2020, my life has been horrendous at times. I'm no longer a police officer, and I never will be again. I've been in mental health facilities. I've contemplated suicide. I was assaulted for doing my job, a job I swore on oath to uphold. This job involves dealing with the worst humanity has to offer without letting it harden us too much, so we can continue to care for and empathise with those who need us, who are trying to help and protect, who we are trying to help and protect. We do not deserve to be treated as punching bags for members of the public who don't like it when we do our jobs. If you assault a police officer doing their job, you deserve to go to prison. You should go to prison. My life has changed as a result of this incident. I won't lay all the blame at the feet of the offender. 13 plus years of operational policing and dealing with people's worst day in, day in, day out, and the worst humanity will inflict upon each other takes its tolls. What I will say is that I have denied any opportunity to deal with the issues created by a career in law enforcement on my terms due to the actions of one man. Instead, he burst the damn wall and with so, bringing my life crashing down around me, I deserve better from this. Jason, they're very brave words and I commend you for it. And I commend you for the, uh, the publicity that you have brought to this issue uh, on behalf, as I know, of other members still serving. Jason then asked for a series of reforms in the uh, message he sent to me and I believe others, which uh, we are currently considering. But he concludes, you are a member of the ACT Legislative Assembly. You have been and will continue to be involved in the creation of laws that people put people in police and emergency service roles in harm's way. You have an obligation to us when this harm becomes too much to deal with. Please do the right thing. Uh, and Jason, I can say that we might not be doing everything that you ask for today, uh, and nothing can undo what has happened to you, but I think at least we can make some important progress with this legislation today. Uh, Mr Assistant Speaker, I've had a chance to converse with the AFPA uh, on these reforms and let uh, them know our position, and I know that they have been advocating for this reform. In fact, they're the ones that came to me and I believe other members of this place with these reforms. Uh, and in response to the bill as it's been drafted, uh, the response is that your amendment is comprehensive and will provide our members with the safety we and the community expect. Thank you for your diligence with this. Uh, and I'd like to thank them again. Mr. Assistant Speaker, I thank police officers like Jason 
and his colleagues who are asked to run towards danger to keep the rest of us safe. I thank the AFPA for their support in drafting this amendment and thank all of our frontline workers for the jobs that they do day in, day out, in often very difficult circumstances. And I'd like this government uh, to help us work with us to address this gap in our bail system. Uh, we together should be doing everything that we can to support and protect workers like Jason and others. Uh, today I'm asking for this support for this simple change, but I believe it will have significant ramifications. And if one simple change can save in the life of even one sir, frontline service provider, it is well worth doing. We will send, send our frontline staff, our police, our ambos, our fireys, a message that we will do everything that we can to keep you safe, that we've got your back. And I commend this bill to the Assembly. Thank you, Mr Hanson. Minister Rattenbury. The question is that the debate be adjourned. All of those that, uh, that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question now is the resumption of debate be made in order of the day of the next sitting. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. Private member's business, notice number two. Ms Orr. Thank you. I move the motion standing uh, in my name on the notice paper relating to the National Disability Insurance Scheme. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Ms Orr. Thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. I rise today to speak to the motion moved in my name. My motion notes there are over 8,000 ACT residents who have a National Disability Insurance Scheme plan. My motion notes also that the principles that the NDIS was founded on were to provide person-centred support with choice and control given to those living with disability. It also notes that the recent shift in policy by the Commonwealth, in particular regarding independent assessments, moves further away from these principles than the existing policies and administration constraints on the agency already have. Fundamentally, my motion notes that it is important that the Territory and other states and territories push back on this and calls on the Minister and this place to do just that. When the concept of the National Disability Insurance Scheme was introduced by a Productivity Commission report in 2011, many in the disability community were extremely optimistic about the future. Indeed, with the actual introduction of the scheme in 2013, there were lots of reasons to be optimistic. The National Disability Insurance Scheme, administered by the National Disability Insurance Agency, was founded on the purpose of both harmonising the system of government disability support across jurisdictions under the umbrella of a national insurance scheme, which wouldn't leave those in need behind, and providing person-centred support with choice and control around support provided to those living with disability. Prior to the introduction of the scheme in 2013, disability care was distributed across state-based schemes. This means that each scheme in each state or territory was different. There were different levels of funding for care and different models of delivering care and associated difficulties dealing with different systems for those moving interstate or interacting with different state governments or for border residents like those in Queanbeyan or Albury Redonga, for example, or seeking care in Broken Hill from South Australia. This system was described by the 2011 Productivity Commission report, which uh, preceded the introduction of the scheme in 2013, as underfunded, unfair, fragmented and inefficient. This decentralised model clearly presented issues for those seeking support and for harmonisation of regulation and funding at a federal level. The funding issues which were presented by the old decentralised model were to be centralised to provide more consistency and just generally more funding across the board. This funding is provided by state, territory and the federal government. This money is then administered by the National Disability Insurance Agency, which forms part of the Federal Department of Social Services on an individual basis. When it comes to how this money is supposed to be administered on, on an individual basis, the model of the new NDIS was designed to provide more choice and control to those receiving support. This means choice of provider and control of the support received. 
This is supposed to be done through the development of treatment plans which are mutually agreed and developed between the person receiving support or the participant to use the language of the agency and the NDI staff, NDIA staff responsible for each individual's plan. Part of this ability to provide more choice and control to those living with disability receiving support is through the funding model. And each participant's needs are supposed to be assessed holistically by relevant health professionals along with the participant. Then a pool of money is allocated to be used to receive the support needed by the participant. This model was lauded by a large part of the community who were really hopeful that the autonomy and collaborative approach would result in greater outcomes. Unfortunately, this has not been the story for many participants. There isn't just one practical reason for this, but the attitude of the federal government and subsequent policy decisions have fundamentally underlined all these shortcomings. At the last meeting of ministers responsible for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, the Commonwealth Minister brought forward a proposal to introduce a system known as independent assessments. Under the model proposed, independent assessments were essentially designed to review those plans that were developed in a collaborative, person-centred way. These reviews were to be done in a way that was not collaborative, nor in the spirit with which the NDIS was created. The independent assessment was to be conducted by an allied health professional who had never actually met the participant. The process was to invoke working with a checklist to verify that the plans were appropriately funded over a period of up to three hours. Mr Assistant Speaker, my office has had a front row seat to the devastating consequences of these sorts of cost-cutting measures by the federal government. Any money saved by undertaking this kind of cost-cutting policy has come at an enormous cost to NDIS recipients, mental, physical and fiscal health. I can't tell you how many times I have received calls from deeply distressed ACT residents who have just been informed that their plan no longer covers a critical service. This being after a short meeting with an often unqualified and inexperienced assessor they've never met nor heard from before. And many times the meeting would be a quick phone conversation with a subcontracted employee in a different state who did not even have access to all the relevant information. These occurrences clearly did not happen under the independence assessment scheme as it never got off the ground. However, policies of this ilk have already existed to a lesser extent within, within the NDIS for a long time. The process of appealing uh, decisions made by assessors becomes an even greater bureaucratic nightmare than navigating the scheme as it is, butchered by the federal Liberal government. People, and, uh, people are often made to wait months for notice of outcome support without which people cannot survive. Participants in the NDIS should not have to routinely approach their state or territory government just to get a notice of receipt when they attempt to lodge an appeal. And the unfortunate state of affairs, Mr Assistant Speaker, is that one of the most vulnerable demographics in the nation are routinely being traumatised by their experience with the NDIS as a direct result of the Commonwealth's decision to penny pinch resources for the Australian disability community. This penny-pinching attitude also has significant impact on NDIA staff and those who are contracted are mostly via labour hire enterprises to do NDIA work administering NDIS plans. The understaffing at the NDIA is at a critical level. The agency's staffing cap sits well below the actual need of the agency. And this is not conductive to the complex work that the agency does. Administering this kind of scheme should not be taken lightly and undercut by the federal government's wish to claim that they have reduced the number of public servants in the APS. This is exceedingly evident, Mr Assistant Speaker, by the cohorts of labour hire employees who do NDIA work. They've often been paid below their directly employed counterparts and have little to no job security, nor anything like sick or annual leave. Due to both the insecure work and experience of overwork due to staff shortages, Turnover of staff is very high, and this is bad for the workers and subsequently bad for participants. There are too many inexperienced staff, and staff often turn over too quickly to be properly trained. This does not lead to a well-functioning administration. This is, the very large, uh, this is to the very large detriment of the principles outlined in my motion, and makes it even more difficult for the agency to actually operate with those principles front of mind. What's more, Mr Assistant Speaker, uh, is the manner by which these employees are engaged to do this work provides a nice profit margin for some people, uh, mostly labour hire companies, at the expense of the employees and the participants. 
Indeed, before the plan for full-blown independent assessments was opposed at the last minister's meeting, it was reported that the federal government had already struck deals worth up to more than $300 million before either the legislation had been introduced or the state and territory ministers had agreed. This manner of getting work completed uh, is an administrative choice made by the federal government and the NDIA, and the federal government could, in fact, save money by directly employing their workers uh, rather than outsourcing, as outsourcing work will never lead to the institutional knowledge needed to administer the scheme properly with a highly skilled and deeply experienced workforce. Mr Assistant Speaker, the NDIS was founded to be a mechanism to provide a person-centred support model, which gave choice and control to those in need of support. There was and remains so much potential for this to genuinely occur. What needs to happen is for the Commonwealth to stick to this, this principle and to stop trying to shortchange the people of the ACT and Australia when it comes to the support they're entitled to when they need it. The motion in my name calls on the ACT government and the minister responsible to continue to champion an NDIS where person-centred support that gives choice and control to people with disability is a core principle. Mr Assistant Speaker, it is currently up to progressive state and territory governments and disability ministers to push back on regressive changes moved by the federal government and the federal minister. This is what Minister Davison did at the July 2021 meeting. The final call to action in my motion is that this Assembly call on the Commonwealth to honour the commitment given at that July 2021 meeting to co-design any changes to the NDIS with people with disability and their supporters. This is a core feature of what the NDIS was meant to do, and, the, and for the benefit of the 8,000 ACT NDIS support recipients, I commend this motion and the message it sends to both Minister Davidson and the Minister for Disability uh, in the Commonwealth uh, uh, and support people being able to have uh, their own choice and control over their lives. Thank you, Ms All. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Minister Davidson. Thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. I would like to thank Ms Orr for raising this important matter for discussion today. The ACT's National Disability Insurance Scheme journey commenced as the first jurisdiction to sign up for the NDIS in 2013. It was also the first jurisdiction to transition all eligible participants into the scheme in 2016-17. The ACT Government was and is proud to lead the nation in delivering this important reform. The NDIS has since continued to grow and gather momentum and has transcended political boundaries. The vision of the NDIS was to deliver a person-centred, rights-based approach to disability supports that puts funding for disability services in the hands of people with disability rather than service providers, placing them at the centre of the decision-making process and granting greater choice and control over the services they receive. At its centre, the scheme was meant to uphold the Convention on the Rights persons of Persons with Disabilities from 2006. As with the introduction of any national reform, there have been significant achievements and milestones and significant challenges along the way. However, the ACT has a proud tradition of raising, escalating and advocating for improvements and the creation of partnerships in a solution to ensure that the scheme delivers on its promise. I thank the ACT's strong community of disability activists who have been a key part of this journey. We know here in the ACT how important it is that we continue to be motivated to ensure that we collectively shape pathways and supports for Canberrans to fully participate in all aspects of life. Since the former Minister for the NDIS, the Honourable Stuart Roberts MP's decision in 2020 to introduce the previous proposal of mandatory independent assessments, we have heard firsthand the significant and collective concerns from people with disability and the sector. The approach put forward by the NDIA, I believe, was one of the most profound changes and threats to the NDIS since the scheme was introduced. Mr Assistant Speaker, the Commonwealth's handling of their proposal to introduce mandatory independent assessments has resulted in an erosion of trust and fear and significant concerns from people with disability and the sector due to their lack of transparency, consultation and meaningful opportunities for co-design. This was also noted by the NDIS Independent Advisory Council, who noted in their report, which was presented to disability ministers, that people with disability had lost trust in the NDIA. Trust is one of the most valuable things we have in this world, and once it is lost, it costs a lot to rebuild. A true co-design process may go some way to rebuilding the trust and confidence of people with disability. Mr Assistant Speaker, the Joint Standing Committee's inquiry into independent assessments under the NDIS presented a vital opportunity for everyone to raise collective concerns regarding the Commonwealth's 
previous proposed model of mandatory independent assessments. The impact of the evidence presented at the Joint Standing Committee cannot be underestimated. Several ACT individuals and organisations also contributed to this process, including uh, in the ACT we had the National Disability Services, Advocacy for Inclusion, Mental Health Community Coalition ACT, Atticus, Carers ACT and Mr Doogie Heard on behalf of the Disability Reference Group. And on 20 May 2021, along with the former chair of the Disability Reference Group, I provided evidence at the hearing for the inquiry, and I would particularly like to acknowledge the invaluable contributions and compelling evidence of Mr Doogie Heard, who demonstrated real leadership in that room. On the 9th of July 2021, the Disability Reform Minister's meeting was held, which allowed for members to have a focused discussion on scheme sustainability, NDIS legislative reform and independent assessments. Now, although the deliberations from the meeting are confidential, I, along with many people in the disability uh, community, were ecstatic when the Commonwealth announced in the Disability Reform Minister's communique from that meeting that ministers agreed independent assessments would not proceed. Ministers agreed to work in partnership with those with lived experience of disability through the Independent Advisory Council and Disability Representatives on the co-design of a new person-centred model that delivers consistency and equity in access and planning outcomes, consistent with the legislative requirements for assessments as set out under the NDIS uh, Act. The scrapping of independent assessments was a massive win for people with disability and shows the power of their activism. I was proud to advocate for their asks at the Disability Reform Minister's meeting, and I am pleased that a more person-centred approach will now be taken. I was pleased that the disability ministers recognised that any changes to the scheme need to be co-designed. However, this needs to be genuine community co-design and not the rushed tokenistic consultation we have seen to date. There are three keys to successful genuine co-design. The first is trust. All involved must be able to come to the process in good faith, ready to work with an open mind and heart. Anything worth having never comes easy. It takes courage. When it comes to the redesign of the NDIS, it will be imperative that people with disability can explore both problems and solutions collaboratively. We have until recently seen little transparency from the Commonwealth. This lack of transparency has contributed to the significant erosion of trust. The second key to true co-design is that there must be agreement on the problem to be solved before participants can begin working through possible solutions. Given the Commonwealth's lack of transparency and failure to fully share the financial details of the NDIS with their state and territory partners so far, it has not been possible for the ACT to agree with the Commonwealth on the problem to be solved. I am hopeful that the Commonwealth will be more willing to share with us a level of financial detail that enables us to better understand the cost drivers in the scheme so far, as well as the underlying actuarial assumptions for cost projections into the future. And finally, true co-design requires that people are involved as active participants with meaningful input throughout the process. All participants in co-design are seen as experts and their input, their time, their knowledge and their other contributions are valued and have equal standing. True co-design requires radical compassion to respond at an emotional level to the experience of others in a completely inclusive way. I remain committed to working in partnership with my ministerial counterparts through the Disability Reform Minister's meeting to ensure that people with disability are acknowledged, listened to and learned from, and ensuring that the Commonwealth keeps to its commitment to co-design. Mr Assistant Speaker, the outcomes from 9 July 2021 and the Independent Advisory Council paper should signal a commencement rather than a conclusion of the future work required. I look forward to a productive and collaborative discussion at the upcoming Disability Reform Minister's meeting scheduled for the 13th of August 2021 and working with the sector during the Commonwealth's future consultations. Additionally, Mr Assistant Speaker, as a joint shareholder in the scheme, I have raised the ACT significant concerns that any legislative changes to the NDIS Act and to NDIS rules may reduce the role of state and territory governments in defining and clarifying what constitutes reasonable and necessary supports under the Category A rules, particularly in regard to the Commonwealth's proposed changes in 2019 for the preclusion of sex therapy, sex work or services aimed at sexual release, which they propose to be authorised through Category D rules. Any changes to the services and supports covered by the NDIS, such as these, should be pursuant to a Category A rule change and require agreement from all state and territory governments. In conclusion, I wish to reassure the ACT community that we are listening, learning and being informed by the voices of people with disability, their families, carers, supporters and broader disability sector, and we will continue to do so.
Thank you. Thank you, Minister Davidson. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Mr Milligan. Thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. Once again, this Labor Greens government is trying to punch above its own weight and grandstand about issues rather than focusing on achieving good outcomes. The Assembly should be aware that the latest disability reform ministers meeting was on the 9th of July 2021. The disability reform ministers meeting is a body chaired and driven by the Commonwealth Government. So it is totally unnecessary for this motion to call on the Commonwealth Government to honour a commitment made at their own meeting. I also need to remind Ms Orr that at this meeting, ministers welcomed the NDIS Independent Advisory Council's advice to the NDIS board on strengthening the NDIS reforms to access and planning and noted the council's recommendations. In fact, at this meeting, all ministers, including Commonwealth ministers, agreed that the independent assessments would not proceed. Ministers also agreed to work in partnership with, all, with those who live with lived experience disability through the independent advisory councils and disability representatives. This means there will be a focus on the co-design of a new person-centred model that delivers consistency and equity in access and planning outcomes. Mr Deputy Speaker, this is consistent with the legislative requirements for assessments as set out under the National Disabilities Insurance Scheme 2013 Act and also meets the original intent of the scheme. Please note that this all happened under the leadership of a Liberal National Coalition Federal Government. At the next meeting in August, I'm sure there will be further developments on this front. It must be noted that ministers and governments of all persuasions have already put on the record their commitment. Again, Mr Deputy Speaker, this motion is simply pointless and it feels like we are all wasting valuable time and focus when there are so many other issues we could be discussing relating to people with disability in the ACT. First, it merely calls on the ACT government to continue to do something they are already doing. Second, it calls on the Commonwealth Government to do something that the Disability Reforms Minister meeting has already agreed to do so in July. Now, there are over 8,500 people on the NDIS scheme here in the ACT and 449,998 people nationally supporting people with disability to have the care and support they need is vital. But so is finding ways to making this scheme more sustainable. This means not only being financially sustainable, but also seeking positive outcomes across areas such as housing, education and employment. So whilst I am grateful that Ms Orr's motion provides us the opportunity to celebrate the NDIS, I do not see the value in grandstanding on issues which have already been agreed to and are being driven at the Commonwealth level. I suggest the ACT government focus on their energies on getting better outcomes at the local level. This includes more ACT funding for advocacy groups and for the many mainstream and community services that support people with a disability. Recipients of NDIS programs need specialist help to navigate the range of services available. They need assistance from advocacy groups to ensure that the crossover from program funding to program delivery is efficient and accurately reflects their needs. Perhaps, dare I say, Ms Orr should try to influence her own government to improve outcomes in the health system so that all Canberrans are supported to reach their full potential. There might be over 8,500 people on the NDIS in the ACT, but this does not mean that there aren't many other people who don't qualify for the scheme but still require support. There are people that need health, appoint health appointments, specialists in Canberra, reasonable adjustments so they can participate in education or employment, better housing choices, early interventions and community programs. But really, Mr Deputy Speaker, there are so many areas in which this government should focus on its own performance and stop virtue signalling for the sake of just making noise. In an earlier speech, I indicated that, there, that we have disability organisations in the ACT who have not received any funding increases for the last decade. These groups have had to cut down on their staffing, 
despite increasing demand for support to services for our local community. The ACT government is playing the blame game again and targeting the federal government to divert attention from their own shortcomings. Whilst all levels of government have a role, there is a significant responsibility at the territory level to deliver services to our community. And I really don't think this government is living up to that responsibility. In conclusion, I request that the ACT government concentrate on areas of disability support at a local level to make sure the Commonwealth funded NDIS program is more successful for ACT residents. Thank you, Mr Milligan. The question is that the motion be agreed to. In closing, Ms Orr. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, look, I'd like to thank Minister Davison for her very good uh, comments, very constructive comments to the debate, uh, particularly noting uh, that uh, we are in partnership, the ACT government, all state and territory governments are in partnership with the federal government on the NDIS. And as a partner of the NDIS, have a large role to play, not only in contributing funds, uh, but in also representing the wishes of the people within their constituencies, that is the ACT, uh, to make sure that the NDIS does actually reflect uh, the services and the needs of the people they represent. Uh, I was... Um, I was actually quite taken aback by Mr Milligan's comments uh, because I don't believe it is grandstanding to actually stand up and say, let's keep what has been one of the biggest social reforms of our generation true to its core principles and looking after the people who need the care that is provided by the NDIS. Uh, if you want to call that grandstanding, Mr Milligan, go for your life. I just don't think that it actually sits right to say that at all. It's never grandstanding to come in and say in, within this place to assert our values and to say we support looking after those in our community who need support. Uh, we know that through uh, the last few months, in particular with the independent assessments, there was a significant drive by the federal minister to bring those in. Uh, and while ministers may have said no at the meeting, it was clearly a case of the federal minister having to be backed down by what has been one of the largest campaigns we've seen from the disability community uh, getting out there and advocating for themselves to make sure that these weren't brought in because of the fear they had for the impact this would have on their lives. Again, it's not grandstanding to support that and to provide reassurance that at an ACT level, as a partner within the NDIS, uh, that we remain committed to those core principles and will not walk away from them, no matter how much pressure is applied in the future. Um, and I'd also go to the point of co-designing. Um, Minister David made the very good point in her speech uh, that once trust is broken, it actually takes a long time to rebuild. And through what we've seen through, through uh, smaller, smaller decisions within the NDIS, building up to the Indian, uh, independent assessments, it is fair to say that there is significant distrust in the approach and the way that the that the scheme will be handed on behalf of the federal government, uh, that we really do need to start rebuilding that trust and showing at our level within the ACT that we're committed to that, that we want code um, design, that we want to make sure that this is a person-centred uh, scheme that puts uh, decision and control within those who are, part who are participants in it. Again, there is nothing grandstanding about that. <laughs> so, Mr Milligan, I encourage you to uh, reread the debates uh, that have happened here today, and I hope you can uh, walk away from that, uh, that nice bit of reading with, with a slightly more enlightened view than what you brought to the debate today. Um, but I would like to thank Minister Davidson for her comments uh, and also for the advocacy that she has done up to this point in time, and I, I believe she will continue to do. And I am very happy, uh, as a local member, to stand here and move this motion today, calling on this place to support uh, not only Minister Davidson uh, to, in her work to stay true to the, uh, the core principles of the NDIS, but to make sure that everyone in Canberra who is a participant in the NDIS and a supporter of those people know that the ACT will be staying true to that core founding principle. Thank you, Ms Orr. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I declare that the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Private members' business. Notice number three. Mrs. Kickett. I motion standing in my name on the notice paper relating to AMC on site counselling services. So the question is that the motion be agreed to. Mrs. Kickett. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I am pleased to bring this motion before the Assembly today. I do so at the urging of some who have worked their entire careers on the front line of corrections. These people are dedicated brave and incredibly loyal to their colleagues. They do what they do for the people of Canberra, they do it for our city's most troubled, 
And they do it for a government that frequently does not act like it respects the work that they do. I speak, of course, of our often unsung corrections officers and the staff at the AMC. A typical shift for a corrections officer or a CEO is 12 hours. For many Canberrans, this would be an exceptionally long day. And for most of us, our days do not look anything like theirs. Corrections officers must be alert and observant the entire time they are on shift. Every interaction with detainees, either unspoken or spoken, could be significant and must be remembered. Officers face potential threats from violent detainees and frequently find themselves threatened and in physical danger. All these can result in constant and substantial mental and emotional strain. The constant tension of the work environment is punctuated by actual incidences of verbal and physical assault that can lead to long-term mental health issues, such as post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, long-term anxiety, depression, and risk of suicide. Corrections officers work in a very demanding, high-stress environment. They face situations that the majority of us could not. We salute and we respect them. This motion is designed to address the mental health risks associated with the realities of working in a correctional facility. The essential but often overlooked work of corrections officers is reflected in the scant attention they have received in academic research. There have been comparatively few studies on the mental health of corrections officers, but the ones that do exist conducted in several nations all point toward a high level of formal mental illness among their ranks. I will share some worrying statistics from these studies. In a 2007 Australian study, corrections officers reported higher rates of formal psychological stress claims than any other occupational group, including emergency services. International studies conducted between 2007 and 2019 confirmed the findings of this Australian research. Regardless of where they live, corrections officers experience higher than usual psychological distress. In one study, 55% screened positive for mental disorder. To put this into perspective, the ABS recently reported that 25% of Australians had a mental or behavioral condition. Even more worrying are statistics of, of corrections officers' suicide rates. In one overseas corrections organization, the suicide rate was 105 in 100,000, or seven times higher than the national suicide rate of that country. This data corresponds with findings in Australia that also show that corrections officers are at increased risk of suicide. Bringing the focus back to Canberra, the ACT Inspector of Correctional Services conducted a survey of AMC staff in 2019. This survey asked several questions about employee well-being. Responses provide further evidence that this motion is needed. 82% of correspondents stated that they would like increased access to staff stress management training. 77% said they would like increased access to training for how to deal with PTSD or trauma. 62% wished for confidential links to counsellors or therapist, and 52% wanted better online or digital resources related to health and well-being. 31% of respondents um, reported that they had access to the Employee Assistance Program, or EAP. This is a good program. For corrections officers, however, the EAP is not as well placed as they would like. Corrections officers at the AMC have expressed to me their desire to have on-site counselling that can be accessed shortly after a distressing incident such as a shift being drawn on them or receiving a death threat. These examples highlight the unique sort of danger present in this working environment. Research conducted in 2012 suggested 
that early intervention and counselling can significantly reduce the development of PTSD and depression symptoms. Individuals in the study who experienced physical trauma were given counselling within hours of the incident and showed significantly lower post-traumatic stress reactions than individuals who did not receive counselling. Interestingly, these studies on the mental health of corrections officers distinguish between the causes of PTSD and depression. PTSD is most strongly associated with physical danger on the job. Depression and anxiety are most strongly associated with low levels of perceived support from the organization and with low job satisfaction. In the past nine months, there has been numerous examples of the serious physical danger faced by corrections officers in Canberra. The mental distress that this causes can be further exacerbated when corrections officers feel that they should be armed but not allowed to be. A former corrections officer recently shared with me the fear that he experiences while going about his uh, daily routines. This officer is afraid to enter the cell of a dangerous detainee who has a history of possessing weapons while in prison. The former officer's fear is amplified by the fact that he has not had adequate training and he is not allowed to be armed or even wear body armor. This experience must be terrifying and the pressure it puts on this person's mental health is immense. The motion further calls for a review on the policy that governs how staff in the court transport unit are armed during escorts. <coughs> Video of the recent incident where a detainee escaped custody shows how few options corrections officers have to restrain detainees and prevent escape. It should be emphasized that this dangerous escape occurred during broad daylight in a busy part of Canberra. It was near embassies, a playground, and a school. Arming these corrections officers on escort duty is not purely for their safety, but for the safety of Canberra community. For they take their job seriously and know the safety of Canberrans is on their shoulders as they try to keep a prisoner in their custody. And when a prisoner escapes, I cannot imagine their mental well-being when this happens. The report of a recent vote of no confidence against a member of senior management staff shows that corrections officers feel that they are not supported at work. Again, such feelings are strongly associated in the academic literature with feelings of anxiety and depression. Given that corrections officers are calling for on-site counselling and that a high percentage of staff at the AMC report a need for more personal mental health training, it would be of great benefit to all these essential public servants to employ and add a psychologist within the AMC as well as providing counselling after distressing incidents, a mental health professional would also be able to provide training on positive mental health exercises for managing PTSD and depression. The introduction of on-site counselling services for AMC staff would not be a difficult task, and the outcome could be massive, including a, dec a decrease in general stress levels among staff and an increase in mental health resilience. This would have long-term benefits for the working environment of the prison and for individual staff members in all aspects of their lives. In summary, we have evidence that indicates that mental health issues are much higher amongst corrections officers than any other occupational groups. We know that the risk of physical and verbal abuse is more prevalent in a prison environment than most other workplaces. Our corrections officers at the AMC face physical danger on a daily basis, which can contribute to PTSD, and many feel unsupported by senior management, which can contribute to anxiety and depression. We know through a survey that a high percentage of AMC staff desire personal mental health training. I truly believe that there is a need to take better care of our staff at the AMC. It is hard for us here in this chamber 
to really know what they go through on a daily basis. So it is imperative that we listen to them when they tell us what they need. And what they need are on-site mental health professionals who can counsel them and provide the training that these essential workers have been calling for a while. Mr. Assistant Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, my apologies, I commend this motion to the Assembly. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Kickett. The question <laughs> is that Mrs. Kickett's motion be agreed to. Um, Mr. Gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I rise to speak today on Ms Kickett's motion. Supporting our corrections officers has been a priority of mine since taking over the corrections portfolio. The role of a corrections officer is often extremely challenging and stressful, and as, as a result is a role that requires a higher level of support. Much like first responders, corrections officers face mentally and physically challenging conditions on a daily basis. And much like emergency services agencies, ACT Corrective Service cannot completely remove the risk of exposure to traumatic events. What can be changed and improved, however, is the supports in place for staff, workplace practices and culture. It's essential that staff are able to access uh, easy mental health support at all times and that they're able to look after themselves both physically and mentally following a challenging day on the job. As a government, we're committed to doing everything possible to provide these supports. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is for those reasons that the government is supportive of this motion. And I appreciate Mrs Kickett's efforts in working with my office in relation to the motion and being able to achieve a consensus. A consensus that will ensure we can continue supporting the health and wellbeing of corrections officers and staff right across ACT Corrective Services. I'm pleased that the scope of Mrs Kickett's motion is broad and allows for the exploration of options such as on-site counselling and specialised PTSD counselling. Recent events have highlighted the need to talk to corrections officers about what extra supports they need and explore which options are going to be the best to help them uh, particularly access services conveniently and quickly when they need to. Wellbeing and mental health support should be enhanced for both correctional officers and all other ACT Corrective Service staff. As I've mentioned, this has been a key focus for me since taking on the corrections portfolio. While there is still work to be done to improve services, I wish to assure the Assembly that ACT CS already has a variety of initiatives in place in development. These include the ACT CS Peer Support Program, which has been uh, made approximately 27 trained peer support officers available across ACT CS. These officers provide support to their colleagues in coping with employment related or personal difficulties or during times of potentially high emotional impact, such as after incidents. The implementation of this program also continues to be supportive and positive, uh, helps towards a work culture that fosters inclusiveness. The Stand Tall program, which encourages staff to overcome stigma and barriers that they may face when coming forward and seeking support for their mental health wellbeing. The Road to Mental Readiness uh, Managers Training, uh, which was recently delivered to ACTCS senior management to promote mental health wellbeing, reduce the stigma of mental illness in workplace settings, and better equip <coughs> managers to support staff who may be experiencing mental health problems. The Road to Mental Readiness First Responders Training is the first program which is being delivered and aims to improve long-term mental health outcomes and encourage early access to care. And there's the Access to Employee Assistance Program, uh, which we heard Mrs Kickett mention earlier on. Now that offers a choice of counselling and support services to all staff. As members are aware, I've appointed Ms Christine Nixon as the independent chair of the Blueprint for Change Oversight Committee. An urgent focus uh, of the committee has included training to ensure staff are adequately equipped for all of their duties. In addition, ACTCS welcomed 22 recruits earlier this year, which is alleviating staffing pressures and is currently advertising for correctional officers to commence their training course in October. A further 10 court transport unit recruits recently started their 12-week training course and are scheduled to uh, graduate in October. Finally, ACTCS are exploring a number of avenues to provide additional support for corrections officers, 
including engaging with a professional service provider for ongoing programs for staff. I understand that meaningful conversations are taking place on these issues, and I thank our new Commissioner Ray Johnson for his good work. Mr Deputy Speaker, the health and safety of every ACTCS employee is one of the most uh, important things that I uh, uh, have been striving for, and I acknowledge there's more work to do to ensure ACTCS staff are well supported. I'm sure the Assembly would agree that the range of initiatives I've outlined to enhance the wellbeing and mental health support for ACT correction staff, as well as initiatives currently being explored and developed, put the ACTS, uh, CS in a great position for continued change and refinement of their approach to enhance mental health support for staff. Mr Deputy Speaker, managing correctional centres in any jurisdiction in Australia is challenging, and the AMC is no different. As I mentioned before, it's unfortunately not possible to remove all risk associated with a correctional environment and uh, detainee escorts. However, ACTCS has a range of prevention and response strategies in place, including de-escalation training, which is part of the custodial recruit training, to give staff tools to detect anger and deal with behaviour in a manner that keeps aggression at bay. Use of force training, which is a mandatory component of CO training and equips officers with a range of techniques to employ as required while taking into account the ACT's human rights principles. And policies and procedures which detail various measures to minimise risks associated with escorts. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd like to reiterate my utmost respect and admiration for the way corrections officers have dealt with many challenging incidents over recent times and continue to do so in their roles every day. As a former PSO, I understand how challenging a role can be when you face potentially dangerous and unexpected situations each day. Our staff are dedicated and experienced, and I'm very proud of them. The incident during the hospital escort on 9 July this year was concerning and terrifying for officers involved. I commend the bravery of the corrections officers who were involved in the incident on the day. In response to this incident, the Inspector of Correction Services is conducting a critical incident review. ACTCS is committed to working with the Inspector to review the arrangements for detainee escorts to provide safety for correctional officers and support for their mental wellbeing. This work will form the government response to the Inspector's report. And this will include consideration of any additional measures or means necessary to increase the safety during detainee escorts, as well as an appropriate risk assessment for each of the options identified. I'm confident that the implementation of further supports will contribute to the continuous improvement of the safety and wellbeing of all ACTCS staff. I commend the motion to the Assembly. Thank you, Mr Gentleman. The question is that Mrs Kickett's motion be agreed to. I call Mr Braddock. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I'd also like to thank Mrs Kickett for bringing this motion about the importance of the safety and wellbeing of Canberra's correctional officers to the Assembly's attention. As already noted, correctional officers experience serious and multiple adverse effects on their wellbeing due to their work in a complex and difficult environment. I, for one, on behalf of the Greens, extend my gratitude to the correctional officers for doing this difficult job, doing it well, and thank them for their work. Correctional officers play an essential role in the safe custody and rehabilitation of some of Canberra's most vulnerable populations. Having easy access to professional counselling, debriefing and ongoing comprehensive mental health support is absolutely essential for our correctional officers, and I implored and support all necessary steps to fill the gaps in this area. I am, however, concerned that the motion proposes counselling and further arming of the correctional officers as band-aid solutions, whereas we need to take an evidence-based approach to a better safety culture within our correction system. Firstly, starting with counselling. Research suggests that psychological interventions like counselling and wellbeing programs have negligible effect <coughs> on correctional officers' stress. This does not mean that counselling is not important. It is important, but that organisational safety culture is so much more important to overall outcomes from mental health of correctional officers. This means taking a holistic look at the workplace environment, and not just merely parking the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. 
In this case, the safety and well-being of correctional officers is inseparable from the safety and well-being of detainees. It is interesting to me that Mrs Kickett implies that detainees have adequate on-site counselling. When a recent review states, and I quote, there is only one psychologist position at AMC to provide general, as opposed to forensic psychological services to some 500 detainees. The staffing level is grossly inadequate and must be addressed as a matter of urgency. End quote. Detainees also need on-site counselling by virtue of the fact they are detained there. They can't nip out and go and see their counsellor's office. It may be more appropriate, effective and efficient for staff to actually access off-site counselling, notably for privacy reasons. We must ensure we are supporting workers in this extremely challenging environment. But what an opportunity is lost to call on the government to review the mental health services for all those who live and work at AMC. Further, we have lost the opportunity to really get to the crux of why correctional officers are reporting rep increased psychological stress. We need to follow the evidence. A meta-review published just last year made it clear once again that the organisational structure and climate had the most consistent relationship with correctional officer job stress and burnout. Our correctional officers need and deserve a strong safety culture. This means going so much further than just counselling, which is an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff approach, as I mentioned earlier. Weapons, or the lack of weapons, seems to be another theme of Mrs Kickett's motion. The implication seems to be that the lack of weapons, particularly in escort scenarios, <coughs> may be related to correctional officer wellbeing and safety. It may surprise the members of this chamber that in three recent wide-ranging reviews of what increases safety in prisons, Army officers does not appear to be once. As Mrs Kickett recently stated, and I quote, Indigenous Australians worry not just about how many of their community members are locked up, but about what happens to them once they are inside. But as I mentioned above, a prison is no ordinary place. It is a place where detainees are placed in an unnatural state of dependence and therefore vulnerability." End quote. Is, it is a curious indeed that the more weapons are the answer. When in the 2019 review of the Alexander McConaughey Centre, none of the 73 recommendations called for a review of the arms policy. I look forward to reading the inspector's report in relation to this when it is released in due course. Of course, correctional officers should have the capability to respond to violent situations appropriately while ensuring the safety of themselves and their detainees. This should be non-controversial and have the support of all parties here, but it does seem that consensus eludes us. We should also acknowledge the close relationship between detainee safety and the safety of the jail staff. And now I want to get to the bottom of the reason, which is here we have a chance to live up to the initial promise of a human rights compliant prison. What would be an effective and meaningful intervention to prove the lives of both correctional officers and detainees? Community stakeholders unanimously agree that the problems in the prison are most strongly related to boredom lack of meaningful rehabilitation, training, employment and engagement activities, combined with extended periods of lockdown. We now have a once in a generation opportunity to turn around the foundational issues of AMC through the planned reintegration centre. Not adequately funding the vision of the prison in the first place has led to many of the systemic shortfalls that I mentioned earlier and we have seen. The history of the AMC was built too small, it was built with no industries, and we have been playing catch up ever since in trying to overcome some of those issues that relate to the original design and the intentions of the facility. With the reintegration centre and other suite of justice reinvestment packages committed to in the PAGA, we have the opportunity to turn AMC around. The vision of the justice reintegration, sorry, reinvestment is one where detainees and correctional officers are like a safe, well, respected and connected with their communities. The new reintegration centre would deliver up to 80 beds 
and increase the range of rehabilitation programs available to detainees. Delivered in partnership with non-government and government organisations, enhanced programs will include trauma and relationship counselling, alcohol, tobacco and other drug rehabilitation, and other training including job skills to support detainees to stay out of the justice system. Overall, the Justice Reinvestment Package would deliver the Greens' focus on bringing together strengths-based supports and inclusive pathways that lead to a be better life outcomes for people cycling in and out of prison. This is a smarter, more cost-effective approach to our justice system that helps keep families together, reduces crime, and builds a safer and more secure Canberra for all of us. And happily, creating a rehabilitation focus in the prison, both structurally and organisationally, will almost definitely lead back to the outcomes that are sought by this very motion. Better mental health and wellbeing for correctional officers. Research shows that the officers who possess a human service or rehabilitation orientation experience considerably less job stress than those who did not endorse such a position. And in this way, everybody can win. Thank you, Mr. Braddock. The question is that uh, Mrs. Kickett's motion be agreed to. Um, you're closing, Mrs. Kickett. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I am heartened uh, that this motion has passed. While the prison has always been a workplace of higher stress than others, recent events have increased this level and made the need for increased mental health supports essential. During an information session for the recruitment of additional officers, the session conveners uh, described for candidates the characteristics that ACT Corrective Services was looking for. They said they needed hard workers with integrity and emphasised the importance of having a thick skin. Having a thick skin does not necessarily mean that threatening words and physical altercations do not affect a person and just bounce right off, as the phrase may have one envision. It means that when these negative experiences happen, a person is able to react appropriately, process them in a healthy way, and grow stronger and more resilient because of them. The session conveners further said that officers need to be people whom the detainees would look up to and see themselves in. If our officers are mentally healthy and positive, this is something that is incredibly important for the detainees to see. As I referenced in my opening remarks, there is strong demand for personal mental health training among AMC staff. In the past months, the Minister has begun recruiting additional corrections officers. These new and existing officers would be well served by having access to preventative mental health training to ensure they have positive mental health exercises to depend on when they are faced with distressing situations. This motion also addresses the need to review the policy that governs escort procedures when transporting detainees to places outside the prison. As we saw from video footage of the escape of a detainee in early July, corrections officers had little in the way of protective equipment. A detailed look at the policy is needed. The incident has been referred to in the Inspector of Corrections, Correctional Services, and I eagerly await this expertise and his expertise and recommendations. More broadly, work as a corrections officer can be dangerous. As I have said earlier, a former corrections officer recently shared with me his experience at the AMC. He was afraid of entering a cell that may contain dangerous weapons when he himself has no self-protective equipment, such as a stab-proof vest. His fear is warranted. An analysis of contraband found at the prison last year showed that many weapons and weapon-like instruments were confiscated. 31 weapons. 21 razor blades and 32 syringes were found. These are just the ones that were found. We know that despite the best efforts of our corrections officers, detainees can covertly uh, create weapons. 
arm themselves and use them as we saw in November last year when a detainee was stabbed with a shiv. It is a dangerous place and I hope that the Greens are actually taking it seriously. I feel optimistic that the exploration of innovative well-being and mental health supports at the prison, such as an on-site counsellor specialising in PTSD and trauma, will have long-lasting beneficial effects for the staff at the AMC. Over the long term, the ACT will reap the rewards that cascade from a more positive, confident and enthusiastic workforce. I extend my thanks to the government for taking seriously the concerns from the AMC staff that I have presented and for supporting my motion. The Greens talk about the human rights of the detainees. That is fine and I support that. But let's also remember the human rights of the corrections officers who are dealing with dangerous situations on a daily basis. We don't know what they go through, and so it's important for us to listen to them. I took a tour of AMC twice this year, actually, and we walked past the psychological unit that detainees go into to receive counselling, and there were three rooms in there and two or three psychologists. So I'm not sure where Mr. Braddock talked about having one psychologist per 500 when there's um, about 300 and something, 21 something detainees at AMC. Um, so let's remember the human rights of the corrections officers as well as the human <coughs> rights of the detainees and I thank you for that. Question is that the motion be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I understand I'm calling the clerk. Assembly business, order of the day, order for the production of documents, presumption of debate on the motion of Mr Hanson that the motion be agreed to. Mr Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I move the amendment circulated my name. So you move the amendment. The question now is that the amendment be agreed. Mr Gentleman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, with this amendment, government will be agreeing to the motion. So the question is that the amendment, Mr Rattenbury. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Greens will be supporting Mr Hanson's motion today and also Minister Gentleman's amendment. Uh, Standing Order 213A was put in place for exactly these circumstances where there is a contest about whether a document should be revealed uh, or supplied. Uh, and there may be a claim of privilege and the like. Uh, it takes it out of the political arena and puts it into a more objective arena. Uh, it's only been used, I think, probably about four or five times since it was brought into place in around 2010. But on each occasion, I think it's, it's provided an opportunity to resolve a dispute about a document. Uh, I think Mr Gentleman's amendment just speaks to the practicality and I understand there's support for that amendment across the chamber as well. But the question is that the amendment be agreed to, Mr Parton. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just wanted to rise briefly just to say that I'm most pleased that we're going to arrive at this position, but that I can't really believe that we've had to go down this path to get to this point when, <laughs> you know, it, the, the minister could well have taken the question seriously in the chamber. Now, the minister took the question to mean simply the outcomes of that study when very, very clearly, we were calling for a much more substantive document. And, you know, I think that at its core, this little debate, Madam Speaker, is about transparency, but it's also about democracy. The minister doesn't own that data. The people of the ACT own it. Now, the minister comes in here often, Madam Speaker, and suggests that he says, we, we're getting on with the job of building this and the Liberals, they're not building anything. Well, I would remind the Minister that he's in government and we're in opposition. And so from opposition, we can't build anything. From opposition, I don't have access to the staff that the Minister has in his office. I don't have access to the directorate. I can't throw around a million dollars on a consultancy. I can't get a study of the nature that we're talking about in this chamber. Now, it's very clear based on the way that this has played out that the Minister would much rather that we don't have that information or indeed that the Canberra public doesn't have that information. And I just think that at its core,
core, this is about transparency and democracy. I'm most pleased that we found a sensible outcome, but I still can't quite believe that this is the path that we had to go down to get it. The question is that Mr Gentleman's amendment be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Therefore, the original motion from Mr Hanson as amended is agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Ms Chain. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the Assembly do now adjourn. Question is, the Assembly do now adjourn. Ms Orr. Madam Speaker. I rise to provide another Yerriby Yap to the Assembly. Since our last sitting, the ACT has banned single-use plastics on the 1st of July. Great work by everyone here in the Assembly and out in the community. This is something I am extremely passionate about, and I am proud of the collective work in the Chamber and the community to make it happen. It was perfectly timed too, with the month of July being Plastic Free July. To celebrate our ban on single-use plastics and Plastic Free July, I posted daily on my Facebook page many ways that Canberrans can minimise their individual reliance on unnecessary plastics. This, includes, uh, this included things like uh, picking unwrapped fresh produce rather than the plastic wrapped alternatives, promoting the soft plastic recycling programs, uh, reminding Canberrans of the plastic recycling numbers on packets that are able to be recycled here in Canberra, and so many more. I encourage everyone to have a look um, at those suggestions and implement one of the suggestions into your lives. Uh, it is important to remember that recycling isn't always the answer and currently less than 10% of plastic in Australia is recycled. We need to reduce our use and reliance on plastics instead and I encourage everyone to consider how they can reduce their plastic consumption. Madam Speaker, despite the chilly and wet days that have plagued the month of July, I remained busy with my electoral work in Yerribee. I met with a number of community groups, held our street stalls and helped get my steps up with some letterboxing around Yerribee. I'm looking forward to the coming months when some of these activities do not require the use of my thickest and warmest clothes. Uh, even though the sun goes down early and the days and nights are chilly, the weather will never deter me from engaging with my wonderful constituents. It's always a joy to chat with people and engage with them on the work myself and the rest of the ACT government is doing for the people of Yerribee. Now, on July 22, I had the pleasure of attending the launch of the East Lake Football Club Pride Game match. This took place at the Rainbow Roundabout in Braddon and uh, it contained the, a jumper which I got to unveil specifically for the game. Despite the actual game being postponed uh, because of, of the uh, weather, it was an absolute honour to see the East Lake Demons and the Ainsley Football Club come together to celebrate and support LGBTIQ players. An initiative like this benefits both LGBTIQ it's players and the broader community, as it harnesses the power of sport to help ensure every Canberran feels welcome and a sense of belonging. Uh, I did take the opportunity to point out to Eastlake and Ainsley that they aren't in my electorate, and while I did very much appreciate what they were doing and supported it, I still am the number one ticket holder of the Gungahlin Jets. Uh, and I was very uh, pleased to join the Jets for their high flyer ball on the 31st of July. Uh, so the high flyer ball happens every year uh, where the club gets together and celebrates the season. Now the highlight of the night this year though uh, was something that's never happened in Jets history before and that was a proposal between two Gungahlin Jets players. I'd like to give a big congratulations to Josh and Shay on their engagement uh, okay. and the engagement only added to the enjoyment of the night with the great food, drinks and wonderful company. Uh, Shay was particularly surprised and the whole club managed to keep it a secret from her, uh, even though all the women's football teams were invited up the front to have a photo uh, with Shay, who is usually uh, in the back because she's taller, called to the front to make sure that Josh had a place to propose. Uh, it was a wonderful moment for the club uh, and we look forward to wishing them all the best in the future. Lastly, I'd like to give a shout out to Katie, who during our last sitting week was in my office doing work experience. Uh, throughout the whole week, Katie was diligent, kind and determined to learn about the whip duties that arose during the sitting week. She completed her work with exceptional quality and showed genuine interest into how the Assembly works. Katie, I hope you had a wonderful time and learned heaps. Uh, it was an honour to have such a hard-working and passionate young woman uh, work alongside us here in the Assembly. My advice to any young woman who is contemplating pursuing a career in this industry, go for it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. The question is the Assembly do now adjourn. Mr Davis. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise frustrated. In the midst of a global pandemic where the Australian federal government should be focused solely on rolling out the vaccine and protecting Australians from a deadly virus, they're instead more focused on tax cuts for the wealthy. 
and a complete abdication of the progressive tax system that Australians have built on the principle that a fair contribution from each person according to their income will enable us to build a more equitable and just society. It is disappointing that the two old parties think that tax cuts for the rich serve any public benefit. Tax cuts ultimately mean a cut to services, a cut to our schools, a cut to our hospitals, and a cut to our public service. It's something we cannot afford. In 2019, the federal government introduced a three-stage tax bill to the federal parliament. The third stage of those tax cuts, known as stage three, will see someone who earns $45,000 per year pay the same 30% tax rate as those earning $200,000 a year. The stage three tax cuts is, to quote the shadow treasurer, Jim Chalmers, the least affordable, it's the least responsible, it's the least fair, and it's the least likely to get a good return in the economy because high income earners are less likely to spend money in the economy." End quote. So you can imagine my surprise when the Federal Australian Labor Party decided to back in the Morrison government stage three tax cuts. The regressive position on this issue by the ALP was confirmed to the Australian community last week when the shadow cabinet decided to drop their commitments to a fair and progressive tax system. Canberrans do not fall for this political posturing. We saw that in last year's election when the Canberra Liberals astonishingly promised to lower taxes while at the same time increasing services. And Madam Speaker, we know how that fallacy ended. According to the Australia Institute, stage three will overwhelmingly benefit high income earners like you and I, Madam Speaker, with almost one third of the benefit going to the top 10% of taxpayers and over half the benefit flowing to the top 20%. These tax cuts are for people who need them the least. These tax cuts will inevitably rip revenue from the budget that should be going to schools and hospitals, to essential services in our community, not to the pockets of high income earners. Both of the two old parties have now clearly shown that when it comes to power, it's politics over people. But here at the ACT level, these decisions have a very real impact. While Canberra is often held up by the rest of Australia as a shining example of social and economic leadership, we're also a wealthy city that can risk leaving people behind. Many of us might not stop to think about the difficulties someone on a low income faces in an affluent city like ours. Some might even think that in a wealth that wealthy lift the rest of us of our population up, that trickle down furphy. But the fact is the opposite is true. Being poor in a rich town means that the cost of living is astronomical for someone on, say, new start allowance of $545 per fortnight. Canberra continues to record the highest median incomes, along with the highest cost of medical care and the most expensive rents in the country. At a local level, the ACT Labor Party has benefited from a power sharing agreement with the Greens for the last 12 years and has been held up as the most socially progressive government in the country. I do not believe these two things are a coincidence. Having Greens at the table has resulted in us having the most progressive government in the country. My Greens counterparts and I took a comprehensive policy platform to the last election which will improve the lives of all Canberrans, particularly our most vulnerable. But the lost revenue from these unnecessary federal tax cuts means that there will be less funds available for badly needed services. It will increase inequality and here in Canberra, our low income earners will suffer the greatest. With higher revenue base arising from a fairer taxation policy federally, we could put dental care into Medicare, finally fund high speed rail along our eastern seaboard, build even more social housing, more community sh uh, sports facilities and fully resource public schools. It's a shame that those representing Canberra at a federal level from both the two old parties have decided that cash in the pockets of high income earners is more important than the public that they seek to represent. Madam Speaker, in closing, you make more than $200,000 a year. I make more than $200,000 a year. We don't need a tax cut. Question is, the Assembly do now adjourn, Mr Kane. It is a fortunate and regular occurrence that I connect with Invaluable Community Initiative, and I'd like to speak of one of those this afternoon. Recently I visited the site for the proposed Holt Microforest near Holt Shops, which the community group kicked off in March this year. This is an innovative use of neglected community green space, with plans to plant over 1,500 native trees shrubs, grasses and ground covers in the vicinity of Holt Shops. This initiative will provide significant ecological and bi biological value and invigorate the local community. The generosity behind the microforest is also encouraging. 
financial support, donations, helpful green thumbs, academics and community advocates. It's a testament to how much the community backs this initiative. I found it particularly enjoyable hearing about how much energy and positivity these community volunteers have when speaking about their vision for the microforest. The intentions for this space are ambitious. In particular, the volunteers are excited about the environmental aspect. A huge variety of flora will be planted and there will be significant consideration for soil health, water harvesting <clears throat> and general environmental betterment in the surrounding neighbourhood. Others are excited for the opportunity for children to play and learn in nature. There will also be a permanent orienteering course. The project will integrate a First Nations perspective, knowledge and traditions on land management, planting and the properties of vegetation are being incorporated into the design of the Holt Microforest. It is fantastic to see this innovative environmental community space can, that will also be educational. Madam Speaker, Gin and Deera locals want to be able to make the most of their green spaces. They want to invigorate local space. They want to help enhance community physical and mental well-being. And I'm grateful to represent a community that is so dedicated to consistently improving their local environment. I'd like to especially acknowledge the efforts of Ms Jennifer Bardsley, the convener of the Holt Microforest Initiative. Her and others like her show a grassroots effort that can only contribute to our community and send messages, valuable messages to government. Madam Speaker, I am looking forward to seeing this wonderful initiative become a reality. Thank you. Question is the Assembly adjourned. Ms Clay. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, one, of, one of the things I like most about this job is the opportunity it gives me to meet so many different people and to learn about so many different things that are going on in Canberra that I just didn't realise. Um, I've lived here my whole life, but there is such a rich layer of life going on here. Um, I enjoyed quite a few things this last month during uh, in between our sittings. I was visited by Paul Summerfield, who is one of our great artists. Paul's done a really fantastic wrap on my car that just is this glorious vision of a steampunk future for Canberra. Um, and he came and visited me in the Assembly and had a little look at how politics works, so that was interesting for both of us. Um, I also enjoyed an article written by Gary Humphreys in which Gary accidentally confirmed the myth of the meritocracy and uh, my Greens colleague Emma and I had a, a, a good time uh, busting down some of those myths. Um, I went and saw a girl's rock at Karma Kitchen and I was uh, pretty impressed, frankly, with the uh, level of talent you can see from um, some of these really young women, 15 and 16 year olds, who are performing so eloquently and so well. Um, I like to get out and about in nature a lot. I think most of you have probably heard me talk about uh, my various adventures in land care. Um, I've had a lot of uh, good walks and good uh, chats to people in the Umbergong Land Care Group uh, about the Jindera Creek in Holt, which I think is really in need of uh, some improved waterways down there. Um, I learned a lot more about Lawson grasslands from the Lawson Land Care Group and had a really interesting walk through the suburbs in which I learned a lot about some of the micro habitats we have just scattered all around us. I visited Blewett's Block with Friends of Blewett's Block and the Canberra Ornithologists Group. Um, and I visited the Emu Creek Land Care Group down in Belconnen, and that's another really great site that could do with a little bit more love. Um, I also was pleased to see the yarn bombing at the Singapore High Commission, and it's great when you get this chance to combine art and nature all in one. It's really fun. And I was really pleased to support the Holt Microforest crowdfunder. It was great to hear my colleague talk about that. It's another of these really great locally based, locally promoted microforest, and I think it's really the way forward for Canberra. We'll, we'll be doing a bit more work on that in my office soon. Um, I was really happy to show a few people around at the EV Experience Day at Questacon and let them see how EVs really do work and they don't kill the weekend after all. Um, and I've been talking a lot to cyclists about road safety. A huge number of people have come forward and had a chat to me about the accidents and the near misses they've had given uh, the legislation that I've introduced and that the Transport Minister's introduced. So I'll be really pleased to see that we'll get some action on that soon, I hope. 
Um, I've also been talking to some of the academics at UC and ANU about how we can build some really better connections between government and our environmental science programs and our academics, and I think there's actually a lot of scope there. And it's also really fun having a chat to some of these experts about their fields. Um, and I was really pleased to catch up with the Clean Energy Council about our circular economy and about how we can improve our recycling here. I also, of course, chat a lot to community. I tend to do a coffee club every Friday and I do weekend stalls. And that's actually really good because you chat to people from all different walks of life and they just come up to you and tell you exactly what's on their mind. And it makes sure that you really keep in touch with what's happening in people's lives from day to day. Um, some of the people that I've met in addition to the individuals, I've met quite a lot of community groups, the Bell Connery Community Council, uh, the Australian College of Midwives, who had a lot of very sensible, practical suggestions that I'd love to help them take forward. Um, I went to a fantastic winter ball with the East African Association, and I'd really like to say thank you to Bossy and all of the women who just made us so welcome at that. And I met the Scouts, which was a lot of fun. I like the Scouts. They have this amazingly rich membership base. They've got a really big presence in Bell Connery in particular. And they do a lot of really interesting programs. They also sent me the link for a photograph of uh, Shane Rattenbury at the age of 10 in a scout uniform. So I, uh, I really scored on that meeting. That was uh, quite fun all round. So it's been really good fun. I just want to remind everybody out in Canberra that you should come up to an MLA whenever you see them. We're, we're here to listen to your concerns. The more you tell us what's going on, the better we will be able to do our work in the Assembly. The question is the Assembly adjourned. Mr Braddock. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wish to draw attention to the excellent work of the Australian Islamic Medical Association. This is a national organisation founded a few years ago, but really took off in 2020, with Canberra as its founding office. It's formed with diverse community members from a wide range of health professionals. and They have held events across Canberra, including the Gungala Mosque, which is in my electorate. And I had the chance to meet and talk with Labna Siddiq, apologies Labna, about the group and I was struck with how the group exemplified the strong community spirit and how they wanted to contribute through liaising and communicating in a culturally sensitive way to the Australian community. This community is a strong pillar of how Australia should be and is to be applauded. Some examples of their work includes their blood donation drive, which they did in partnership with the Red Cross, where they ran us through the mosque with the support of religious leaders there, and they were able to attract 500 new blood donors, an effort for which they are quite rightly awarded the Trophy of the Year from Red Cross. In addition, they run training in CPR, basic first aid courses, use of defibrillators. They've also held mental health webinars, particularly in light of COVID, and having question and answer sessions with psychologists providing wellbeing tips. They also have held Vaccine Health Forum, where there's lots of questions that were very similar to the broader community, but it was delivered in a culturally sensitive way. It's through this engagement they were able to get a lot of positive engagement from their community. Of course, their challenges are similar to those of the ACT government in helping people in their community to obtain trusted health information in a culturally sensitive way. And I, for one, am grateful for their service to the community. The question is, the Assembly now adjourn. Ms Chang. Madam Speaker, uh, I wanted to just take the opportunity this afternoon to touch on a few different things in and out of my portfolios and indeed uh, what some of my colleagues have touched on today as well, um, but are no less important. Um, first, a very huge congratulations to Lisa Fuller, uh, our winner of the ACT 2020 Book of the Year. Lisa is a Murray woman, originally from Queensland, who has lived in Canberra for many years. Ghost Bird is her first novel. The judging panel described Ghost Bird as a complex and ambitious novel that uses young adult supernatural fiction to drive a harrowing analysis into colonial trauma. We wish Lisa 
all the best with her future writing. She has won many awards uh, and been published um, uh, many times before she became a first-time novelist. And uh, this is not Ghost Bird's uh, first award, uh, but it was incredibly well-deserved. Uh, and that was certainly the thoughts of the entire judging panel. And of course, I commend uh, the other uh, two highly commended authors and those uh, other two who were shortlisted as well. As members may have noticed, uh, I am speaking about the 2020 Book of the Year because it was necessarily delayed due to COVID. Nominations for the 2021 Book of the Year have now just closed, and I very much look forward to hearing from the judging panel in the coming months. In July, we celebrated the ACT Multicultural Awards. Madam Speaker, as you well know, our diversity is our strength, and I was pleased that the awards were highly competitive with nominations received from right across the community. Again, warm congratulations to individual champion, Dr. Mawa Ahmadzai, uh, the community organisation champion, uh, known to many of us, Initiatives for Women in Need, or IWIN, uh, the winner of the Outstanding Excellence for, uh, the winner of the Outstanding Excellence Award for Diversity and Inclusion, uh, Sandy Mitra, again, known to many, many of us, uh, and Jackie Malins of uh, Mother Tongue Multilingual Poetry, uh, who took out the award for arts, media, or culture. And this, uh, as many of us will know, um, multilingual poetry has been a feature of the National Multicultural Festival. I'm looking forward to even more nominations received next year and warmly congratulate the winners who are not only role models but integral to encouraging inclusion and ensuring that we remain the welcoming community that we have such a strong reputation for. Throughout the electorate, I've been pleased to support the efforts of the Holt Microforest team, which recently successfully raised tens of thousands of dollars for its project, and I look forward to a tour of the site later this month. On Sunday, I dropped in to the Lake Ginandera Sea Scouts, who were able to bring together all of their scout groups together to celebrate World Scout Day for the first time since the pandemic began. While the Sea Scouts have been very active throughout the last 18 months, they've not been able to bring everyone together until now. It was wonderful to come together with 150 other people around a bonfire on Sunday night on which chicken, beef, pork, potatoes and pumpkins were cooked beautifully to share the meal and to catch up with two Joey mobs, two cub packs, two scout groups, a venture unit, an amazing leader team and a group support committee. And Madam Speaker, while it's not in the electorate, it's an issue personally close to my heart. I was very pleased to be able to visit Leo's Place two weeks ago. Leo's Place is an initiative of palliative care ACT, and it directly responds to a recommendation that was made in the 2019 End of Life Choices Select Committee report from this assembly, which I was proud to be part of uh, during the last term. We hear repeatedly that people with a life-limiting illness wish to remain at home for as long as possible, but the proportion of those who want to but actually do is much lower. Recently opened, Leo's Place aims to change that by offering overnight respite, day respite, providing that support and care for people with a life-limiting illness and to allow carers to have a short break, and also carer support, access to advice, information and self-care activities. This proof of concept respite hub has been partially funded by the ACT government as part of the February budget. And I commend Minister Stephen Smith for her leadership in this. And my thanks to all those at Leo's Place and Palliative Care for the opportunity to visit and to understand more about this important facility. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Chain. So the question is, the Assembly do now adjourn. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The Assembly stands adjourned until Tuesday the 31st of August at 10am.